Ward by J.C. McRae. A production by Parahuman Audio. Performed by a cast of fans and volunteers. Please visit parahumanaudio.com to learn more. Thank you and enjoy. Arc 11, Blinding, Chapter 1 I could remember conversations that Gilpatrick and I had had back with the patrol group. Gilpatrick had worked as a PRT squad leader, and he'd had his fair share of bad days. I'd had my bad days, too. Even ignoring the obvious, I'd grown up in Brockton Bay. Gilpatrick had wanted to root out all of the powers-are-cool types— to reduce the roster for his school peripheral program down to a minimum to the people who had to be there. Not every school had done the same. A dozen men and women and three dogs now rippled with enough muscle that their skin had split in places and they couldn't move in straight lines. Their eyes were bloodshot and their throats produced noises like they were trying to scream while being strangled and they hurled themselves against doors and windows. Inside, the members of the area's patrol block were all gathered together trying to barricade doors and windows. Lights moved wildly because some were using flashlights and others were doing the work and the way those lights didn't hold steady told me everything about how they were coping. Gilpatrick had tried to train his squaddies for a crisis, to paint pictures and mix up the drudge work with some degree of strategy. He'd run over the basics, had talked about chains of command, and had drilled the other students on worst-case scenarios. A squad of twenty trying to hold out against nine monsters that had once been ordinary people and animals, when any one of those monsters could rend all twenty individuals limb from limb? It worked as an example. One of the smaller dogs fought to get past the others and get a piece of the action. Black froth at the corners of its mouth as it lunged, tried to climb over and was hit with one elbow, flying ten feet. It stopped making its strangled scream sounds as it recovered from the hit, then resumed its strangled scream sounds. I could see the jerky full-body contractions and expansions as it worked at breathing. It didn't try going back at the main wall of people and animals who were battering at the front of the building and threatening to pummel their way through the concrete. Instead, it circled around. The smaller dog leaped through a window that wasn't sufficiently barricaded, got halfway through, and scrabbled to get the rest of the way through. Putting my mask on, I flew after it. People shot at the animal, and the shooting did nothing to slow it. I collided with it, smashing it down into the floor, my forward momentum driving it across the floor. The wretch hit it once before the force field flickered off. I flew up to the ceiling back flat against the painted surface as the dog scrabbled to get its limbs under it. The muscles hampered more than anything in the moment. I used my aura, but it agitated the room more than it bothered the dog. Don't shoot, I called out. Don't waste your bullets. And you'll hit me. What the hell are we supposed to do? A young woman shrieked at me. One guy in the background was audibly sobbing in his panic. Fuck me. Do you have an empty cell? This was supposed to be a jail. I didn't get a decisive answer, only a muddle of ten voices talking at once. The dog was back on its feet now, and the wretch was active. I'd fought mutant dogs before. Those had been a bit bigger, armor-plated, with sharper edges, hooks, and decorations— This was... denser. It was the only way I could put it. I flew at its legs, expanding the wretch out to knock its legs out from under it, then punted it across the floor. Which way are the cells? I barked the question like an order. A hand pointed. 
But they're full! Get over there, move people to another cell, and get yourselves into that same cell if there isn't an escape route. Leave me a door open. Some people headed in that direction. You have thirty seconds, I told them. The dog didn't even have all four legs under it when it hurled itself to one side. The wall partially caved in with the impact, and the dog fell to the ground, slick body sliding on laminated flooring. It was on its feet again before it finished sliding. I could see in the background that the patrol block members that hadn't headed off to the cells were now backing up or trying to hide behind cover. They'd been paralyzed by fear, and now they were being punished for their fear by being stuck in the main room of the ground floor with me and a beast that I was barely keeping under control. To my left, at the front door of the building, the drumming of fists against the door was causing the metal door to curve inward. It wouldn't break, I was pretty sure. By the spider webbing of cracks around the frame, the pressure and the pounding would see the frame come out of the wall first. To my right, the patrol students were down the hall, presumably at the cells, and from the sounds of it, they weren't as organized as they could be. I was being really fucking generous giving them thirty seconds. The beast made its strangled squeal at me. It lunged, and I didn't retreat. Instead, I put my arm out for it to bite. The wretch expended out from me, starting at the skin and unfolding into its true shape shortly after. The mutated dog didn't catch me by the arm. My arm caught it by the inside of the mouth. I used my flight, raising it up so it only had its back legs, and those legs were only barely touching the ground. Here and there it scratched the surface with claws and found some traction, jerking at me. I used my flight to correct. Someone was aiming a gun at it while it was momentarily stuck in position. Don't fucking shoot it, I growled the words. They're bulletproof like this. You'll just draw its attention to you. I had very little experience having the wretch active and a living combatant who wouldn't be torn to shreds by it. I flipped myself around, arm and wretch still in its jaws, holding its mouth open enough that it couldn't muster the strength to close its jaws and break my force field, and I wrapped my legs around the dog's neck. It was about as tall at the shoulder as a pony, but it was muscular, and the loose skin that had torn around the expanding muscle made getting any leverage hard, but the placement of the wretch didn't obstruct my freedom of movement or my ability to get my legs into place. As it fought me, scrabbling and periodically losing its footing, I began to drag it into the hallway where the students had gone. Coming in! I hollered the words. The dog responded to the holler with more struggling, which seemed to shake it more. The jail cells were a dozen individual cages, each cage with a cot in the center and a cot against the wall, more bars and not walls separating one cell from the next. Most were so full that people were sitting on the ground, even in a time of crisis. Some hadn't risen to their feet, reacting only as I came into view. We're still moving, people. There's a nearly empty cell at the back, I retorted. They're capes. Get them out. Get the way clear now. They obeyed. The proximity of the snarling, struggling dog was a good motivator. People who had been moving between cells with armed people directing them were now backing into one cell or the other. I had a glimpse of the two capes, B-listers, Etna and Crested, moving into a cell with others. Both of them had shackles that encased their hands entirely, Crested's connected to his belt. Doors were shut with bangs. The length of the dog was an issue, because the door was too small for it, and as strong as I was, I didn't have the leverage when it was this lively. I felt the wretch's grip slip, saw how the head moved. I knew if the force field broke that I wouldn't get a good chance to use it again. The situation would be too chaotic. 
The wretch wasn't helping either. Hands and feet gripped and banged against bars in the floor. No, if I was going to lose control, I'd do it on my terms. I shucked off the wretch and pulled my arm free in the moment before the jaws shut. Feet on the ground, I struck out, activating the wretch in time to land hits, trying to pummel and push to work it into the doorway. Behind! Tristan. He came up behind me, gripping one of the dog's legs and threw his weight against it. Sveta went over our heads into the cell. She had an attachment on her suit, an arm with long slender fingers and a face shield. It made her lopsided, and landing was harder than it might otherwise be, but it did give her leverage as the hand gripped bars, tendrils gripped the cot, and the rest of her grabbed onto the dog, pulling it in while Tristan and I pushed. We got the dog into the cell. Sveta got out before the dog could recover, with me catching her and helping her to maintain balance as she landed. The door banged shut. The dog threw itself against the bars. I didn't see any bending or distortion in the bars. Everyone okay? I asked. Are you asking your team or... You, I said. Prisoners? Patrol? Pretty fucking freaked out, someone else said. What is this? That used to be one of the jail's dogs. They came after a team of heroes with the same setup and plan yesterday. I answered. I turned around, looking at Etna and Crested, who were being given a wider berth by their new cellmates. Past three days, things have been going a bit downhill. A bit, Tristan said. He rolled his shoulder like it was sore. You all right, Capricorn? You're not healed yet. Rain was asking from the doorway that separated the lobby of the station from the hallway with the rows of cells. Yeah. Tristan said, and it wasn't clear if he was saying he was all right or if he was agreeing he wasn't healed. We needed some muscle. We need you in one piece, Sveta said. Tristan pulled off his gauntlet and shrugged a bit to create a gap he could reach his hand inside between neck and armor. It came away rich with blood. Shit, he said. He immediately switched out to Byron. Could really have used his power, I said. We'll get you attention ASAP. Byron nodded. What's going on? A man asked. He approached the door of one cell. He had a goatee made more pronounced by a jutting chin, narrow eyes, and styled hair. By his outfit, which was a patrol combat uniform that had been stripped down enough for regular wear, I had to assume he was an instructor. You're Harris? I asked. Yeah. Were you here before, or were you called in? Called in. We arrived and it was chaos. The staff at this jail must have been exposed to the power effect somehow, I said. The food, Rain said. On the desks, everyone ate food from the same place. Good eye, Byron told him, head bowing a bit. He had to be anxious about his brother and the constant pounding of fists on the front door, and the dog that was still struggling, ineffectually, thankfully. They would have had to give food to the dogs. They probably did, another boy said. He seemed young to me, which was odd when he was probably older than Rain and definitely older than Lookout. There are four canines here, one for contraband, two for regular police work, and one for search and rescue. One of the regulars is pregnant with a litter. She wouldn't get food. You pay attention to that stuff, huh? Sveta asked. I come here regularly on my shifts. I nodded. A clearer picture now. We'd come in knowing the basics, though, and the basics hadn't changed. The basics were bad. I tried to compose my thoughts. Then they might have intercepted or impersonated the delivery person. They transformed the staff into those things. Bulletproof tough and strong for as long as the effect lasts. They must have felt unwell, called for an ambulance, I'm guessing, 
and got as far as the ambulance before they started changing. No other reason for them to already be outdoors. Is the ambulance staff okay? A boy asked. We saw them, but we couldn't get to them. They were alive inside the rolled vehicle. Light injuries. I evacuated them, Sveta said. Why? Instructor Harris asked, his eyebrows knit together. Why are they doing it like this? To show dominance, I answered. To achieve their goals, which is to hurt the local law enforcement and to break in. But the reason they're doing it this way in particular is that they want to show their power. On the topic of dominance, even with the main power out and the only power being provided by an emergency generator, I could see how the cells had been divided into prisoner and patrol. Instructor Harris seemed to notice, too. He pulled out his keys. No prisoners moved to take him hostage or fight for those same keys. They were very still, if wide-eyed with alarm. You might want to stay, I told him. This is a waiting game. While you're in those cells, you've got metal bars between you and the attackers. If we can wait out the transformations, things should settle down. Will the front doors hold? Instructor Harris asked. I glanced at Rain. Rain shook his head. No, I said. Harris put key to lock. Senior students, I'd really appreciate it if you were with me, but I'm not going to make you. Step forward. I'll help, whatever you need, a prisoner said. He was a guy with hair down to his shoulder blades and a tapered beard that touched collarbone. Sorry, Harris said. I don't know you. You get credit for courage, I said. Good man. Byron entered the open front area of the station, stepped up onto a desk, and with his arms folded, began to create his motes of light. How much property damage can we get away with? Rain asked. Construction is cheap. At the Lime Center, I drew the line at damaging people's cars. It's too personal, upsets people, sets them against capes. The power at the center, I uprooted the wiring, but even a threat of a brief blackout is not as personal? Speaking as someone who's dealt with having no power for long stretches at a time, it might be more personal than you're thinking. I became less convinced of what I was saying before I finished saying it, I said. I don't know, Precipice. If you've got to break stuff to save people, then that's fine. I think those things out there are dangerous, and I don't think people would hold it against us. Don't underestimate people's ability to blame others, Byron said. Yeah, I said. We're here right now, aren't we? You can put holes in the ceiling, Precipice. I think they'll accept it. He looked around. The smaller length of arm that was attached to his elbow touched a nearby table. I was thinking floor. Go for it, I told him. I picked up a desk, sliding it over to where the damage was worst. After a moment's consideration, I flipped it over so the legs and struts were pointing up. It crashed as it landed there. Sveta and others joined me. Why upside down? Someone asked. They're strong, but they aren't balanced or coordinated, I said. Tripping is better than putting something heavy in their way. What are these blue lights? A girl in a patrol uniform asked. A water gun, Byron said. Are they safe to walk through? They're safe. The pounding continued. I could see the spread of cracks. This was going to be bad. Do these guys have a fire hose, containment foam, nets, anything like that? I asked. No, Instructor Harris said. He sounded pretty grim and he looked anxious. More annoyingly, he wasn't really helping. You sound pretty sure for someone who doesn't work here, Rain said. It's the same building layout as the one we operate out of, Harris answered. Except instead of the cells, we have a shower room. Made sense. Many of the buildings were prefabricated, arriving on trucks and put together like assemble-it-yourself furniture. Besides, he said, 
water pressure here isn't all that. I wasn't asking for the water. I was asking because it'd be tough for them to tear and I could tie them up. I don't know what to tell you, he said. He was watching as the cracks expanded. Concrete was coming out of the widening cracks in dribbles and tufts. Where were you a squatty? I asked as I used a burst of my strength to send a desk skidding across the floor. I wasn't, he said. I was admin in a PRT office, Beartown. A paper pusher? The distinction between an office and a department was a pretty big one. The office would be the kind of place that serviced a town like the one Ashley had come from. The department was the kind of place that served Brockton Bay, New York, and any other cities that were large enough or in dire need. There had been sixty-five or so at the time the world had ended. So, not just a paper pusher, but a paper pusher in a workplace that had twenty employees at most. How many capes? Two of us, two of them. Correction, eight employees at most. Probably an office with three to five people in it. Fuck. I'm willing to follow orders if you want to lead, I said. Are you? he asked. He sounded slightly surprised. Yeah, but I really hope you want to and you're able, I said. No, he said. I don't and I'm not. Focus on your kids then. Keep them in one piece. Some are freaking out, I said. The pounding continued. The dribbles were now more like brief waterfalls, contiguous along the long horizontal crack above the door. It was ready to fall. Sveta used her modified arm, slender fingers on a feminine hand moving furniture to stack chairs in the cups formed by the struts and legs of desks. The arm was one piece of a greater project. She was strong, really, and her ability to pull and constrict was being leveraged into mechanical movement. The only difficulty was the lack of balance and how she had to brace most of the rest of her body. Still, she seemed more happy with having a human limb writ large than she'd been with the tentacles. Or content, if not quite happy. I looked around. Side windows had been blocked with rock, Tristan's work, before he'd joined me and helped at the cell. I could see the food wrappers and half-eaten dinners, the ones that were possibly laced. I added more chairs to the mix, kicked over some garbage bins, and then stepped back. The pounding was less sharp than before. The impacts were heavier. They'd sensed or seen the movement, and now they threw their bodies against the wall instead of punching or clawing at it. How long since you got the call? I asked. Thirty. The wall shifted, the scraping and crunching loud enough to drown out Harris's reply. The villains had attacked the shepherds earlier in the day, and the transformation had lasted for longer than thirty minutes. They'd estimated close to an hour after talking to the people who first sighted the changed people. If someone gets dosed somehow, we'd need to get them into a cell before they change, I said. Harris? We'll try. They're already sardines. Better a sardine than dog food, I answered him. It took a while to change, Byron said. I've been reading up on tinker transformations and the kinds of drugs they make, I replied. Again, there was an impact that shifted the whole wall. They can change it up, force a faster change but weaker or less predictable, or more side effects for the victim. Why are you reading up on tinker transformations? Sveta asked. A topic for another time, I told her. Right now we need to focus on this. It occurs to me, now that I'm thinking about side effects, if this does wear off, we need to make sure they have medical care. Another impact. I could see where the cracked segment of wall stood apart from the rest of the wall now. Nobody shoots, I ordered. Save your bullets. The wall came out. I thought it would fall, but it remained suspended. 
Everyone in the room tensed. There was so much floor space where the desks had been. Our arena. If they got past that open space, then civilians were in danger. I'm gonna, Rain said. Do it. Not the floor yet, Byron said. Rain created his blades. He flung them and they hit the door, crisscrossing it. It was a hulk of a man that came tearing through, stumbling when he broke through with more ease than expected. He was taller than normal, with arms like tree trunks, fingers lost in the mess of muscle, blood streaked his body and the rags he wore. His stumble carried him into the mess of desk and chair legs. They caught his legs and feet, and as easy as it was for him to get into it, it was hard to extract, hard to do it when barreling forward. He fell. Others were following after, and they ran into the same barrier. Byron didn't use his power. The dogs came through, over the bodies of their kin. A straggler, heavy around the middle with a grossly distorted abdomen, followed through. The dogs weren't as hampered. They stepped on the people and they leaped, one landing a few feet from the desk Byron stood on. What are you waiting for? Rain asked. The dog reared up, muscular club limbs raised high, ready to crush Byron. He used his power. A geyser of water that could have carried cars away aimed at the hole. Two remained catching on the tangle of furniture by accident or dumb effort. Sveta and I each went after one. Getting them back outside only bought us time. Byron was drawing out more lights, and now rain was slashing at the floor, the slashes forming X-shapes. It didn't take long for the attackers to bounce back. They're bleeding a lot, rain shouted as he backed up. I think the effect is softening. A damn good thing he spotted that. If I'd hit them when they weren't bulletproof tough, it could have been a disaster. Fucking irresponsible to do this like this. But it didn't feel like anyone was being responsible right now. They came for us, and the first three that came barreling through with feet pounding on the floor of the lobby hit Rain's trap. The ground shattered beneath their feet and they fell chests and collarbones slamming into the edge of the hole. I winced. I hoped they'd be okay. Too much strength without durability could be disastrous. Byron followed up. A torrent of water to slow them down, pushed them back, and to turn finer debris into mud. The air was frigid, with moisture heavy in it. This was a losing battle. They came at us so hard that there was really no way to even block a hit without causing them harm. We couldn't even really redirect them. Keep destroying their footing, Rain did. My focus was on flying, on short bursts of strength to hit them and make them stagger into one another. If I could keep them in place long enough, they could tumble into traps. Sveta wasn't fighting but she was managing the ones who'd fallen. If they started to climb out of the waist-deep holes, then she hauled on them or moved past them to push them back in. The water helped. Ambient moisture in the air clung to my mask, the parts of my face the mask didn't cover and my hair beating my costume. My breath fogged with the cold air that had flooded in. The others weren't much better. They didn't stop and the slow loss of their strength and durability was a really fucking slow one. Rain was using his power again, and I was at the point where I could have snapped at him, cussing him out for catching me in the effect, except I would have felt shitty. I knew he was trying, and he was finding his effectiveness now. I even felt bad that I was thinking about shouting at him, but I suspected that was the power. I think we should have called for backup anyway, Byron said. I panted for breath. It was painful, with the air being as cold as it was. I shook my head. We could have tried. They've got their hands full. It's all stuff as bad as this, I said. A dog that was feigning injury sprung to its feet, leaping. 
I flew to intercept and hurled it down into the thickest grouping of enemies. I could see the fight go out of them. Where they'd been incessant before, they paused, retreating. We were 100% willing to let them, just for a chance to recover a bit ourselves. They retreated further, then backed off, a third of them moving to one side, two-thirds to another. Past them, past the steaming air where the remaining warm air from indoors mingled with the winter air outside, I saw the culprits. Bitter pill, medical mask only barely visible behind a scarf, white coat, and a short stick with a caduceus. She wore one of those packs that looked like a fanny pack that was worn over one shoulder instead. Tinker stuff was attached to the strap. Bird brain, bird mask, black coat, and a handgun in each hand, another gun at her back. She stood with back straight, beak pointing up. No indication she was using her eyes to view her environment. I saw her gun hand move. As she moved it left and right, it moved as a hand normally would. Up and down, it was nigh instantaneous, with automatic tracking. Headshots every time. The way her head moved around like she was daydreaming or drugged and her hand moved with such precision was jarring. Foggy idea. He'd been in hollow point, but he'd ducked out of the worst of the fighting. He was a kid with Einstein hair dyed gray, and a mask that covered too much of the scalp behind the hairline, eyes too far down. It gave him a creepy, impish look, like he was emulating a baby's proportions. His namesake Fog seeped out from the collar and sleeves of his costume. Blue stocking. Elegant, her trademark indigo blue stockings and opaque blue lenses in glasses stood out amid an otherwise gray ensemble. A scent like really strong black licorice mixed with gasoline preceded their group. The mutated people and animals retreated further, heads down, bodies hunched over, subservient. Pill! I raised my voice to be heard. What the fuck do you think you're doing? I want my teammates. Etna and Crested, back in the cells. I didn't think Etna was yours, I replied. Close enough, Bitter Pill answered, her voice cool. Now fuck off and get out of our way. What are our odds? Rain murmured. He was situated where he could be heard by Sveta, Byron, and I. Bird brain is the big threat. The muscle is second to that. I'm flattered, I heard Bird brain's ethereal voice. She's halfway to being an all or nothing threat, like Swan Song with her blasts but with aim. I saw Blue Stocking turn her head, asking a question. Bird brain answered, no doubt passing on what we were saying. You're using that term wrong. Blue Stocking called out. All or nothing isn't right. Bitter Pill said something, annoyed, too far away to be heard. If she aims, she's guaranteed a hit if her gun's at the right point horizontally. Vertically doesn't matter. All or nothings are PRT terminology for anyone who's strong enough that you can't defend against their attacks unless you defend against anything. Can't dodge unless you can dodge everything. She's halfway there, and that makes her a good enough shot we can't afford to get in an engagement. Headshot every time. I'm a game shooter, Bird Brain said. Even these days, killing doesn't interest me. Game shooter? I heard Harris behind me. Guns are verboten if you're playing by the rules of cape fights, unless you use your power on a gun to augment it pack tinker guns, or you have a power that helps you not kill what you're shooting. Foil had been all three at one point. The term applies, Blue, at least in part. She shoots, she kills, I said, my voice pitched to carry. Or, I place the bullet to where it should take a month to heal, Birdbrain said. Don't mess with us. Give us what we want. 
I would have thought the brains of Hollow Point would have kept their noses out of this war that's unfolding, I said. All of the intel says the time is now, Blue Stocking said. Intel is one thing, respectability, common sense. Are you trying to stall because you hope our steroid soldiers are going to return to normal? Bitter Pill asked. Give us a second, I asked. We have to confer. Blue Stocking jumped in, asking, Leave us standing in the cold, too, why don't you? A bit irritable. Can we win this? Byron asked. Birdbrain is a massive threat. Pill has tricks up her sleeve. Foggy can distract and stupefy with his gas, and Blue Stocking is a thinker of some kind. In the background, I saw Birdbrain nod to herself. Was she aware she did that? The last couple of days have been back-to-back -back crisis management, Byron said. Yes, this is important. Keeping the bad guys locked up in jail, especially ones we locked up? All for that. But what does it mean tonight when there's another issue and we're all hurt or out of gas? I could see Rain nodding. Better to say that I could see Precipice nodding. His mask hid his expression, but his added hands allowed for more gestures, which hinted at the emotions in play. Fidgety, one hand raising, then dropping. Sveta wasn't moving nearly as much. Even her tendrils weren't that lively. She stared at the brains of Hollow Point, her expression hard. They were exhausted. We give them what they want? I asked. You sure? Rain asked. They want two capes, fine, but we can negotiate. In the background, Birdbrain nodded again, said something, reporting on what we were saying. What do you think, Mr. Harris? Byron asked. Mr. Harris stared at the villains much as Sveta did. In a way, it was like standing at the foot of a mountain and seeing just how daunting the ascent was going to be. There was such a gap to be closed, and getting there was going to be so hard. Worse, this mountain had no interest in making the process any easier. It was going to do whatever the fuck it wanted. I won't stop you, he said. If I get asked why I let it happen, I'll tell them it was the right thing to do. The way that gun moves unnerves me. If we say no to this, we need to take a few hours off, Sveta said. Otherwise, I feel like it's going to end up the same way next time. I nodded. I wasn't super happy about her mentioning that we were tired or taking a break to people who might pass that on to our enemies, but I wasn't going to get on her case about it. Can we talk? I called out. After they consulted, it was Blue Stocking who approached, stepping over rubble. She had nice boots. Her approach made the creatures back off. I floated closer. What would happen if I decked her and knocked her out right now? If I took a hostage and played as ugly and as dirty as they were playing right now? Bitter Pill approached too, maybe because she wanted to say something. I looked back and met Harris's eyes. Best to connect to the real authorities where possible. Blue Stocking and me, with Bitter Pill and Harris as our seconds, I guessed. I looked at Blue Stocking, and I saw something in the way she held herself, and what I could see of eyes behind mostly opaque lenses, and in her eyebrows. A familiar attitude. I wondered if I was comparing her to anyone I knew, but when I reached for it, I couldn't place it. It didn't help that they stank. The smell I'd noted before was emanating from them in wafts, worse when they moved. It was, presumably, what had kept the mutants docile. We'll give you the two capes you want from the jail, with stipulations. Which are? Bluestocking asked. She looked pissed by the way she set her mouth and folded her arms. Or was it resting bitch face? Oh. There had been a woman at my rehab who'd given me dirty looks. 
So that was the answer to my little mystery. That tiny bit of closure was a note of success in a day that had been hard, bloody, and miserable in large part. Nobody gets hurt. If you have the ability, you need to return these people to normal now with no injuries. You can't take them with you. They'll be 85% healed up, unless you've punctured a vital organ or something, Bitter Pill said. Not good enough. You can't go after civilians. Can and did, Bitter Pill said. Blue Stocking didn't agree, but argued the point instead. Cops. Cops are fair game. So are the anti cape soldiers. We're not anti cape, Harris said. And you can't take them with you. They're not your pawns. Couldn't if we wanted. They go dormant, that's all, Bitter Pill said. No need to worry your little head over that one. Fine. That's stipulation one. You fix them, I said. Stipulation two is you need to drop some money on this place, make amends, give them what they need to rebuild. Fuck that, Blue Stocking said. Stipulation three, take a fucking break. Back off, don't pick fights, don't go after heroes, take three days and stop being complete dicks for that long. We'd lose ground, Blue Stocking said. Numbers, social map, demos, territory, ratios? No. You'll lose ground if some of you get broken bones, I replied. This is a way to do this without fighting. We benefit, you benefit, civilians can mend and repair. You're asking for way too much, Blue Stocking said. Heal the people you hurt, make amends for what you broke, and back off for three days. If you want to negotiate down on any of those parts, you can give us some intel on the people who opened fire on us two days ago. Blue Stocking sniffed with amusement. That passed under my nose before I thought to pay attention. I know some things, but... You hand those two over, we'll give you the information, nothing else. Information, healing, and that's it she interrupted. Not good enough, I said. Fucking deal with it. I turned slowly, looking up at Harris. He gave me a slight shrug and shake of the head, resigned. Fuck no. I didn't want to let them win like this. Instructor Harris, stuff for Etna and Crested is on the captain's desk. Get them set up and bring them out? Yeah, he said voice terse. He jogged back. What's it going to take to heal them? I asked. I have the stuff, healing. It should get them to ninety, ninety-five percent. They'll be hungry. Good enough? Bitter Pill asked, a condescending note in her voice, her gaze too casual and distracted. Good enough, I told her. Blue Stocking added, Small expenditure of resources, the fixing of this building when you did half the damage? No. How do you know how much damage we did? I asked. She gave me a look, half glare, half disdain. I hated being ignored, patronized, and looked down on. I'd triggered because it had been so oppressive. Now here she was, just pressing that button. I consoled myself by telling myself that this was handled. Things were calm. We could still negotiate. Maybe Blue Stocking had some post-cognitive powers, past reading like the time camera had been able to do. In the back, Birdbrain perked up. She raised her voice, alarmed. Blue! Bitter! She was running now, catching up with our group. Blue Stocking raised a hand, motioning for her to stop and stay back. She might have been thinking that this was already a two-versus-one discussion, and a third person would make it lopsided enough to stop being civil. But then Birdbrain drew close enough that the alarm in her eyes was visible through the eye holes of her bird mask. "'What did you do?' Blue Stocking asked. 
bitter pill seemed to connect before Blue Stocking did, because she pushed past me, hurrying toward the building. I motioned for the others to back off and let her through. The others followed, with Foggy Idea trailing behind. Birdbrain held out her guns, threatening anyone who threatened to attack while the Thinker team was surrounded. I flew to keep up. I had to be ready to protect Harris if... He was already backing up, hands up, when the Thinkers arrived at the door to the hallway. He'd dragged Crested from the cell and shoved the food that had been left on the captain's desk into Crested's face. Are you stupid? Bitterpill asked. Did you eat it? Bluestocking asked. He ate enough, Bitterpill said, sounding pissed. Your call, I told her. You can travel with someone that's going to go monster and either wreck everything or refuse to budge, or you can let them stay in this cell here. We'll wait for our reinforcements, see if they come. Shut up. Blue Stocking said. Or you can accept my terms and we'll keep this easy for you. There was a long pause. My team was standing beside me. I could see Bitter Pill holding a bottle so the cap was between her index and middle fingers, ready to drop it. I wondered if Sveta would be able to catch it. She hadn't let herself be surrounded without a trick up her sleeve. The question was whether she'd throw all sense to the wind and go with that, or if she'd take the other route. It was Blue Stocking who responded. Reduced terms. Let's talk, I said. We give you passage with your prisoners, no fight, no hassle. We'll hold them and turn them over. You fix the wounded. You pay... Not the full price. Two thousand. Pretty paltry. Twenty thousand minimum. You're ridiculous. They're your teammates. You risked all of this for them, and now you're saying they aren't worth ten thousand each? We're not teammates, Etna said. You'll fucking do a few jobs with us if we break you out, okay? Blue Stocking snarled. Okay, Etna replied. Three day break from all activity, I said. One day, twenty thousand, we fix the injured, and you fucking pretend we don't exist while we wait for the steroid soldier drug to run its course. I didn't reply, letting the others take that in. Yeah, probably, Byron said. I saw Sveta and Rain nod. Then fucking leave us alone, and if you try anything, we'll bring hell down on your heads, Blue Stocking said. Bitter has stuff. I do, for a rainy day. It's a fucking rainy day when... We backed off, leaving them to bicker. Harris looked more resigned than victorious when he emerged. When I put out my hand, he gripped it firm. The hole in the wall meant that the snow and moisture were getting in. The water that Byron had created had frozen so the very top layer formed a paper-thin sheet. The members of the patrol squads emerged. We need help, I told the instructor. We need boots on the ground, not just heroes. It's bad right now. I'll get my grads on board, he said. We'll see what we can do. We might need seniors, too. School-age kids? Seventeen and eighteen-year-olds? Older than some of us, I said, indicating my group. The city needs all the help it can get. I'll talk to parents. I can't force anything. And other instructors. Any friends or superiors you have. I saw him nod. He put a hand on my shoulder as he walked by, going over to talk to the most unhappy and stressed of his patrol block. I grabbed a desk that had been tossed across the room and righted it before sitting on it. Sveta plunked herself down beside me, her giant arm around behind my back and resting on the corner of the desk to my left. I pulled out my phone, and immediately she pushed it down and away. No more, she said. I fought her, play wrestling just a bit, and finally got the phone unlocked. I closed the chat I'd had open, 
asking for intel on this specific situation so we knew what we were getting into, and brought up the map. The city, lit up by icons. Each icon had a brief bit of text describing the situation and the report. Incidents all over. Nine ongoing situations that didn't have a team working on them, where, as things were, was bad enough the police didn't have them under control, or where capes were involved, or both. The city was on fire, metaphorically speaking, and we didn't have what it took to put it out. When Kenzie had put the application together, she hadn't seemed to expect that things would get this bad, because a lot of the text was unreadable or off-screen, too much at once. This time, when Sveta pushed my hand and my phone down, I let her. We need a break, she said. You need one. I wanted to procrastinate, I said. I told myself that we'd wait until Swan Song and Lookout are out of the hospital. Then, Lookout ended up having to stay the extra day. She's out tonight. I know. But... I had something to bring up and talk to the group about, and I needed time to digest it. The files from Jean Wynne. You went to see Dragon, you got the files, and you found out something. Mostly right, I said. I gave the phone a shake, bringing it to her attention, the map still glowing with its bright yellow icons on a purple cityscape. This seemed easier. A relative distraction from that something. Arc 11, Blinding, Chapter 2 Rain and I worked together to remove Sveta's rigging. One attachment to her suit served as a mounting for two arms. She had the larger arm with the feminine hand on the end, and another arm with an elbow joint that had the fragment of mask, like a small shield that could pull close to the face or move away. There was a single second of danger where her tendrils were capable of reaching out into the world, but Sveta was concentrating and the situation was calm. The metal of her suit's arm and chest pulled together and she stood straighter. The weight of it, as odd as it was, wasn't a concern to her. The balance issue, however, was apparently a hassle. The headquarters felt dark, even with all of the lights on and monitors glowing. It might have had to do with the weather outside and the late hour, and it might have had to do with the fact that I was bracing myself to deliver hard news. I'd ridden with the others in an effort to stay connected and keep a thumb on the pulse of the group. Going from a dark car with only the light of the headlights on the road ahead of us to our headquarters, where the light felt insufficient, left me feeling like I was underwater and the surface was a ways off. The world beyond the headquarters and car gave me an ominous vibe. I don't know how long it's going to be before I have another good tinkering day, Rain said. I can try taking notes if you have immediate feedback. It works like this, Sveta said. If I had to bring up any issues... She didn't finish the sentence, and as Rain took off his mask and raised his eyebrows, motioning for her to continue, she remained quiet. Why are you trailing off? Rain asked. I want to know. Sorry. I'm already asking for a lot and saying no to ideas. It's stronger, but it doesn't feel as strong as I'd expect a hand of this size to feel, but I'm not sure if I'm using it at its full strength, so that might be bad feedback. When I use my regular body, I'm pretty strong if I want to be, but I end up holding back because I don't want to break it. I might be doing the same thing here. We can't know until you test its limits and break it, Rain said. Except I can't do that while I'm in the field. If I screw something up, I have a hundred pounds of dead weight to drag around. Can you do it here? I could see the hesitation on Sveta's face as she turned around, looking at the hand that was planted on the floor, 
the arm extending up and over to where the shoulder now rested on a table. I get it, I told her. My mom sent me to clinics for testing my powers. It's kind of rare that you ever get to get an exact reading on your power's strength, especially when it's durability. Yeah, Sveta told me. Except one of those things is Victoria talking about her flesh and blood body, Rain said. And I'm suddenly realizing I sound like an insensitive asshole. Sveta swatted his shoulder. You're fine. The arm can be fixed more easily, is what I wanted to say, he said. I don't know, she said. You're used to holding back, I observed. I could see the realization cross her face, the connecting of two dots. I could relate it to a lot of moments where I'd missed something that seemed objectively obvious. We weren't always obvious. That's true, she finally said. I could try putting together a gauge, Rain said. Something like a visual indicator or audio indicator that measures what you're putting in with a max limit if you get to the point that metal starts bending or snapping. That might work. What else? Rain asked. Well, um, this is a really obvious one, but I'd love it if it was more complete. I left them to the discussion. I stopped by the table by my whiteboard and collected my bag and some spare clothes. In the bathroom, I stripped down and rinsed off, aware of the blood that came away from my hair and skin. I hadn't been aware it was there. Not mine. There was smoke, there was sweat, and there was grime. My skin was still bruised from my fight with the arena man two days ago, and as much as adrenaline pushed pain into the background, the pain came back. I ached. All of that was secondary to the problem of figuring out how to deliver the bad news. I'd been focused enough on the present and the future that I hadn't been paying as many visits to memory lane. I felt unwelcome nostalgia welling now as I pulled on a t-shirt, faced myself in the mirror, and took on the rituals necessary to arm myself. Damp hair fixed and sorted, combed out and braided, Teeth brushed, some makeup to take the shine out of my skin, to minimize the dark circles under my eyes, and some tinted chapstick because the cold weather would shred my lips if I let it. Some of the nostalgia lay in how I was doing up my makeup at a late hour. The Victoria that had been Glory Girl had done that, knowing that in another few hours she would be taking it all off and going to bed. That Victoria had, just as I was doing, found injuries she hadn't been aware of while going through the routine. Hiding injuries had been important to cultivate the illusion of complete and total invulnerability. The Victoria of the present put a band-aid on a cut between jaw and ear. If I had cause to go out in costume any time soon, I'd remove the bandage and cover the injury up. There was another side to the nostalgia— darker. After being turned from wretch to a Victoria made of stray animals, of rats and dogs, I'd stumbled through the days. My skin hadn't felt like my own, and it hadn't really been my own. The layers I put over that skin were in my control, and even the most basic of makeup could be the outer layer that worked with the inner turmoil and found reconciliation with the skin and meat in between. It calmed me to have something I'd chosen at a store and pull that on over my t-shirt. In tonight's case, it was black jeans and then a sweater, light gray and ribbed, with white laces at the V of the collar pulled through gold-ringed eyelets. Whatever the crisis, whatever anxieties plagued me, it was important to me that I be able to tell myself that my appearance wasn't cause for further anxiety. It had been critical back in those dazed and lost days when I'd been recovering post-gold morning, but it had always been a thing for me. I could have called it a casualty of growing up with my mom, but even Aunt Sarah, as nice as she was, had made remarks to me as a child when I hadn't dressed for an occasion, or when I'd tried and failed to dye my hair, or when I'd been ten pounds overweight. Couched, hinting, 
even being nice about it or not saying it to my face, but remarking on it to my mom or dad with me overhearing by chance. My dad, my uncles, my teachers, my friends, everyone had at one point made remarks that reminded me it was a thing I was supposed to pay attention to. Even Dean. I'd thought he was safe, that he got me because he sensed my emotions in a limited way, and that he'd figured out things most others hadn't because he'd seen the hurt or embarrassment from the sidelines. Then he'd said something. I couldn't even remember what it was now, and I'd gone off on him. I'd even stopped talking to him for two weeks over a comment that would have probably passed without mention had he said it to a friend. Had I been asked then, I wouldn't have been able to put my finger on why. Poor Dean definitely wouldn't have. Easier to be bulletproof. To figure things out and take care of it. To make it as much a part of my routine as making sure I had my phone in my right pocket, keys in the little sub-pocket at my left, and wallet in the front pouch of my bag. Tonight, the anxieties I was wrestling with had little to do with the wretch. I could hear noise outside. I set my jaw, looked at myself in the mirror, and felt that pang of dark nostalgia once more as I forced my eyes away from the reflection, aware of how things weren't as they should be. I left the bathroom, collecting my things on the way. Sveta sat at Rain's table while Rain was at the window by the door. They're back from the hospital, he reported. I took a look for myself. There was a taxi below, and Ashley, Kenzie, Natalie, and Tristan were getting out. Kenzie shuffled more than she walked. I snatched up my gloves and hat, skipping my coat to be quicker, and stepped outside into the bluster of early winter. The taxi pulled away as I reached the bottom of the fire escape. Hi. Hi, Kenzie, I said. Hey, Natalie. It's been a while. I've missed a lot, Natalie admitted, a little bit on purpose. It's fine, I said. You read the emails? I did. That's completely different from being here, participating. Nah, Tristan said. It's not like we needed the legal know-how exactly. We haven't been arresting as much as we've been controlling the damage. Most jails aren't taking new people. That's only part of my job, isn't it? Natalie asked. I guess so, Tristan said. How's the neck? I asked him. I popped stitches is all. No arterial bleed. It looked like an arterial bleed. Doctors said it was probably bleeding for a minute before I realized. Glad you're okay, I told him. He smiled before heading to the fire escape. Kenzie and Natalie walked to the fire escape as well, Natalie supporting Kenzie. I offered a hand, but because the fire escape was only wide enough for two people, I flew at the side, my hand at Kenzie's armpit, to stabilize and support. How are you? I asked Ashley, looking back. I've been bored out of my skull. How has it been living with our roommate without me there? Surreal. Fine. We've been ignoring each other, except I brought food home a couple of times, and she brings me tea. Perfect, Ashley said. Speaking of, I said, are you hungry? I know. Yes, Tristan cut in from the top of the fire escape. It's late, but I figured you might be eager for something better than hospital food. Yes, he said again. I could eat, Ashley said. You two want to come with? There's something I want to bring up. Natalie, your input would be appreciated, too. That second role of yours you mentioned. I was going to stick with Kenzie and make sure she's okay. I don't know if I'm still a de facto guardian, because things are so hairy and she's at the children's place now, but nobody told me to stop. You should go, Kenzie told her. Catch up with the others. You need a break from me, and I'm going to sit down and spend 15 minutes getting caught up on my tech and all the data that's rolled in while I've been gone. I won't be doing anything. I don't want you bending over or crawling under the desk, Natalie warned. I won't. I'll make Rain do it. Be nice to Rain, Tristan said, sounding like a stern mom. I am. 
He enjoys helping as much as I do. Tristan put a hand on the back of Kenzie's head, steering her inside. She had two feathers stuck through the single ponytail at the back of her head, no hairpin either. I grabbed my coat, and we got ourselves sorted, with the others changing or organizing their things while I made sure I took down all orders on paper. Ashley was in for our walk, even though she still hadn't fully mended. S-P-I-N-E. A plan for going about this. I was pulling from lessons imparted by my family again. This particular lesson had been from Uncle Neil, and my heart was heavy with the memory of how he'd died and how it tied to the acronym. S stood for schedule, setting the context for the discussion. It was what I'd spent the most time wrestling over with the past few days. How to approach this? All at once? One at a time? What was the best venue for it? Schedule mattered the most because I could do everything else right and screw up here, and group dynamics, interruptions, or the tone of things could spoil it all. How was your vacation with your boy? Tristan asked. He was asking Natalie. He's not my boy. It was nice. Did you tour the sites? Tristan asked. I guess there aren't many sites with the city being new. We hung out, we drank, we completed a 1,000-piece puzzle. I hope you did more than that, Ashley remarked. I don't think I'm going to talk about that, thank you. It sure sounds to me like he's your boy, Tristan said. Victoria, Natalie said. Yeah, I asked, drawing my voice out in the same way. Did you ask me to go along just so you could throw me to the wolves? I'm not a wolf, Tristan said. A wolf in sheep's clothing, Ashley said. Goat, not sheep, and it's not clothing. Keep deluding yourself. I'm happy to admit to being a wolf. I'm under no illusions. The streets were empty, the snow coming down in drifts as the wind blew it from the rooftops. A dense sheet or collection here, then another there. You said you wanted me here for the other part of my job, Natalie said, cutting in while there was still room in the back and forth between Ashley and Tristan. Is it Kenzie? I was assuming it was, Ashley said, except you brought Tristan and he doesn't connect to Kenzie. I chime in for leadership decisions and things, Tristan replied. He looked annoyed. Kenzie and I don't not get along. But you haven't figured her out, Ashley said. It's not Kenzie, I said before things got any further. Not exactly. I had their full attention now. We still walked, but they were quiet, all of them watching me. Ashley had a reddish tint to her nose and cheekbones. Her only headwear was a pair of earmuffs. Tristan was better bundled up while Natalie was best prepared, wearing her puffy jacket that was primarily for function. "'Kenzie,' I said. "'If you're listening in, I'd really appreciate it if you stop. I'm going to talk with these guys, and if everything's good, I'll talk to the rest of you about it now.' There was a pause where nobody spoke. "'It's worrying that you have to do that,' Natalie said. "'What's going on?' Tristan asked. I got the files from Dragon. I got some other information, too. And it impacts the team, Tristan said. Kenzie in particular? Yeah, the team, I said. We talked about this before, back when we were all shopping, but I should go back to it. What do you know about Chris? Chris? Tristan said with a bit of surprise. P following the scheduling S, was perception. See where others were at, restate the known, and get them in the right frame of mind to think and talk about it. Forgetting P was to risk dropping something on someone right away. Nothing we didn't cover in the shopping trip, Ashley said. He wants to be close to powerful people. He's secretive to a fault. His power is destroying him. Kenzie defends him fiercely. I don't know much, Natalie said. I tried to give him some of the same kind of support and help we've been trying to give to Kenzie, and he refused it. 
He's an asshole, but he was our asshole, Tristan said. Then he wasn't, and it's getting to me that we don't know why. Did you figure out why? Yeah, I said. I figured out why. I think you guys need to know, and I guess the question is how you want to know. I can dish it all out here, or I can tell you enough that you can give some input on how we approach the others. Tristan asking like he had helped to shortcut things. I didn't have to figure out how to approach I in the acronym, INVITATION. Asking if they want the information, empowering them to handle the situation. This is serious? Natalie asked. Yeah, I said. This fills in a lot of the blanks, and it's not pretty. Tell us, Ashley said. Okay, I took a deep breath. My breath fogged as I exhaled. The file was Miss Yamada's. She wrote about Chris, a message for colleagues in case she couldn't carry on her duties. For Chris Elman, the very first line was a statement. Chris lies. No surprise there, Tristan said. I barely talked to him and I'm not exactly shocked, Natalie said. No response from Ashley. In the SPINE acronym, the N was for necessary information, the meat of things. Uncle Neil had told me to stick to the facts, to be blunt. I wasn't as blunt as I could have been, but I was still blunt. He's not a changer, I said, and he didn't trigger after gold morning. He has a long history. How long? Tristan asked. It goes back a decade, I said. He's thirteen, Tristan stated, voice firm, like he could say it with enough authority to make it so. Then, in a 180 in every respect, he said, He's not thirteen. No. If he's not a changer, then that thing about him being experimented on... Tristan trailed off. Natalie picked up where he left off. I never heard about him being experimented on. It was the story, Ashley said, and there was no positivity or humor visible on her face or in her body language. A sob story that ensured we wouldn't push too hard or ask too many questions. He lied about everything, Tristan spoke the realization aloud. I don't know. I said. Something happened, but it may have been self-inflicted in a way. I could get into the nitty-gritty of it, what we know, who he was, and the dots we can connect between the two of those, but I want to leave it up to you guys. Who was he? Ashley asked. Lab rat, I said. Oh no, Natalie said. That's a reason to be secretive if I've ever heard one. Ashley said. I looked at Tristan. He was frowning, not looking at any of us. If you need a refresher on who Labrat is, I could go over the bullet points, I said. Fucking asshole, Tristan said. He clenched his fist, shaking his head. Don't pop your stitches again, I warned him. Tristan shook his head, then winced, reaching up to touch the bandage at the side of his neck. Let me think on this. Bring me out when you have food and things have settled. You're not going to immediately unsettle things, are you? I asked. No, nah, he said. He switched, blurring with his eyes flashing. The blue of the eyes faded and Tristan became Byron. Byron's eyes turned down, looking at the ground as he walked. Is he dangerous? Natalie asked. Can't say anything for sure, I told her. But he disemboweled a tyrant, and as far as we can tell, he's taking over a portion of her world. If we go by past history, and if we assume nothing's changed, he's dangerous. Everyone's supposed to get a second chance, Ashley said. Yeah, I agreed. But if it was offered and he didn't take it, if he decided to hide and operate in secret, does he really get that benefit? I'd say it depends, Byron said, barely audible. Yeah, I said. The last letter in spine was E, empathize. Leave room for others to feel, to process. 
We weren't far from the dingy little restaurant, which had a rotund Japanese-style ogre at the side of the sign, a cow tucked under one arm, beside the stylized letters stating simply, Beef Bowl. Nobody went in, not right away. I'd taken two days to wrap my head around it, to equip myself with information, and decide on how to go about approaching the others. I could stand in the cold for five, ten, or twenty minutes while they digested the facts. I was prepared to answer their questions if they had any. This isn't easy, I said, to give them an excuse to express any feelings they were holding back. They didn't have questions, and they didn't want to express whatever it was they were so clearly feeling. Ashley had gone cold, distant. Natalie was thinking. There was only a single quiet comment from Byron. This is going to do a number on the others. He wasn't wrong. Uncle Neil had taught me about the SPINE acronym because, as heroes, we were often on the front line for tragedy. It was a tool for delivering the worst kind of news and for preparing people to grieve. The Chris we knew was gone. The chatter as we got back to the hideout was happy. I put the paper bag down on the table by the door. Victoria, hey! Kenzie greeted me. She'd shucked off all the outer clothing and was sitting in her chair, everything illuminated. She wore a new sweatshirt that was at least two sizes too big for her, purple, over a blue shirt with a monster on the front. Her skirt came down past her knees and she wore leggings beneath. She'd put on slippers rather than shoes. She'd also, I noted, put on her hairpin and tucked the two feathers into it so they swept along the side of her head. Hey, good news! Is everyone back? I cracked the door open to poke my head out and check. Yeah, they'll be here in a second. I got intel, she said, her eyes glittering. I can't name my source and the intel comes with stipulations. I looked at the feathers in her hair. What stipulations? Sveta answered me. We can't use the information against the undersiders and we need to be discreet. Is that so? I asked. I heard the others at the fire escape and opened the door. And I agreed to certain special favors, Kenzie said. Don't say it like that, Rain told her. They want to see your tech. Kind of like how the speedrunners showed Rain's cluster their tech, except not evil and... And not like that situation at all, really, he finished. I'm showing off my tech and people are interested. Kenzie said, legs kicking. He sent the information without even bargaining first, Sveta said. The pictures and the requests. It shows a lot of faith in you. Or he's an idiot, Ashley said. Kenzie spun her chair around, glaring. Let's hope it's the former, Ashley said. It is the former, Kenzie replied, trying to sound dangerous. The others came inside and the door mercifully shut. Space heaters were buzzing throughout the open space, producing the faint smell of burned dust. Byron changed out, allowing Tristan free. I saw Tristan's expression, the seriousness and what simmered beneath the surface. Do you want to see? Kenzie asked. I was counting the seconds until you guys got back. She wasn't, Rain clarified. But she is excited. You guys were gone for longer than usual. What were you talking about? Heavy stuff, Tristan said. He tore open the brown paper bag, taking a bowl of ginger beef and some chopsticks. I'm so glad we have food if we're going to discuss this. I skipped dinner and I'm running on empty. You have me worried now, Sveta said. I got other things out. I passed Sveta a bowl, then put Kenzie's request on the table next to her. Some peanut chicken, a small tray of salad with dressing in packets, and far too many fortune cookies. She reached for a fortune cookie and I grabbed her hand, moving it to the salad. Is this what you've been stewing on? Sveta asked me. Yeah, I answered. How bad, on a scale of one to ten? Rain asked. What's a ten? 
Tristan asked. He was already eating. Gold morning, Rain said, dead serious. Seven, then. I would have called the goddess situation a seven with what happened to the prison, Rain said. He was entirely serious now. I'd wanted to handle this better. I returned to the acronym. Where do you guys stand on the subject of Chris? I asked. Oh, Rain said. He looked a little crestfallen at the name. That's ominous. Is he okay? Kenzie asked. I don't know. We don't have any updates on what he's doing right now or how he is, but we do have information about him. I always had a bad feeling, Sveta said. It started as a small discomfort when he was in the group. I could sympathize, turning him into a monster, not having control, but... It was always a bad feeling, and the little things only added to it, never really making the feeling less intense. I really don't want to spoil a reuniting of the team with us dumping on Chris, Kenzie said. I'm not, Sveta said. You really kind of are, Kenzie said. And I understand why he left, and that sucks. It's easier to deal with if you get angry instead of sad. Kenzie... Sveta said, and her voice was lower. I understand you want to respect Chris and his feelings. And you should want to, too. But please respect me, and don't minimize my feelings to protect his. He's not here to defend himself, so if I'm being forced to take a side, then I'm going to take his. I'm sorry. Me too, Sveta said. I'm sorry, too. Ashley approached her, sitting on the desk beside Kenzie's keyboard, a bowl and chopsticks in hand. She didn't look like she was having an easy time with the chopsticks. We're not dumping, I said. At least that's not the intent. I respect that Sveta's instincts were to be uncomfortable around Chris. I don't like the word instincts, Sveta said. Fair. Feelings? I offered. Feelings, Sveta said. And I don't want to condemn him either, I said. But what I've found out looks pretty bad. It's up to you guys if you want to tackle this in one way or another. We could raise the subject tomorrow. I won't sleep all night if I'm busy imagining the worst outcomes, Rain said. I want to know, Kenzie said, looking stubborn. I'm not sure you do, Ashley told her. I do. I looked at Sveta. You told the others? Sveta asked. A little less loaded, easier to bring up, I replied. I'm trusting you on this. I'm going to be pretty stung if you didn't have good reasons. I nodded. What is it? she asked. That brought us to the eye of the spine this time around. He lied to us, Tristan said. My breath caught in my throat. Hold up. What did he lie about? Kenzie asked. Everything except his first name, apparently, Tristan said. Everything. Tristan, I said. Hold up, okay? Stop. He looked like he was going to say something, then stopped. He put the bowl down hard, chopsticks laid on top. Only about half was eaten. Sure, he said. Everything? Rain asked. I opened my mouth to try to formulate a reply, then closed it and nodded instead. No way to sum it up. Why? Sveta asked. Because he wanted to keep a secret that he's a villain with a lot of enemies. A lot? Kenzie asked. He was in the birdcage, Ashley said. What did he do? Sveta asked. What was so bad that he couldn't use his old identity when Bonesaw was walking around free? Semi-free, Ashley said. My point stands. Valkyrie used to be a dangerous villain, Sveta said. She looked at me, and the statement that didn't follow was telling. My sister, too. She was dangerous, I said. What did he do? Sveta asked. Can I ask that we gloss over that? We can get into the details tomorrow after we've absorbed the basic info tonight. You know where he is right now, don't you? How pressing is this? 
He's on an island in Earth's Shin, near their equivalent of New Zealand with other parahumans and people. I'm really sorry to bring this up, but your sister and her dad, they're on an island nearby. They're having all parahumans come to them. They're negotiating with governments. That's a lot of people potentially under his thumb. If he's dangerous... He's Chris, Kenzie said. She looked to me for her validation, which broke my heart a little. The smile on her face broke it a bit more. She wore an expression which would read to others like she thought this whole thing was a joke. Except he isn't, Rain said. He has a history. Who is he? He's Labrat, I said. I could see everything go out of Sveta as she heard that. I saw Kenzie's eyes widen just a bit. She recognized the name. Rain, by contrast, seemed baffled. He's a tinker? Kenzie asked. She laughed, a smile creeping across her face. That's hilarious! Who the hell is Labrat? Rain asked. Keep in mind, I spent half my life in places without radio and television. He went to the birdcage, so it sounds bad. He's a tinker, so that's a lot of options for bad, but that's all I've got. He made mutagenic serums. The transformations, Sveta said. He was dosing himself, or did his power change? Dosing himself. The medicine he kept with him. Kenzie banged the table. I feel so dumb! Easy, Ashley told her. I didn't even think! He asked me not to record him changing, and I didn't because he'd be naked at one part of it, and I'm absolutely not allowed to take those kinds of pictures, accidentally or on purpose. Easy, Ashley said again. Count to ten. That's your thing, not mine. Count. He experimented on a lot of people, Sveta said. He turned them into monsters, freaks. You've seen the kind of transformations he can manage, except the ones we saw were uglier. She met my eyes as she said it. I nodded. You've seen them? Natalie asked. At the hospital, Sveta said. The asylum. Parahumans who can't control their powers and victims of parahuman powers get sent there to be taken care of. You've talked about it, Tristan said, uncharacteristically gentle. I was there for a month and a half, so I could talk to a therapist every day without worrying about rotations or anything, Kenzie added. I didn't really see many others. We've all, most of us, have seen or been the victims of powers, Sveta said. I'm one. There were a few Case 53s there, um, people who lost their minds one way or another, or who were already struggling with something and who had powers that made it worse people who were hurt by tinker experiments in ways that conventional medicine couldn't help. Bad situations, I supplied. In the few years that Labrat was active, for every one person who went to the asylum for one reason or another, there was a Labrat victim. He tested his serums on people and not every single one changed all the way back. Did anyone ever ask him why? Kenzie asked. Kenzie! Sveta said, her voice hard. Don't. I'm just saying. Maybe there was a really important reason, or maybe he couldn't help it. Kenzie, I said, before Sveta could get riled up and say something regrettable. This is a no-fly zone. She giggled in a nervous, bewildered way. What does that even mean? I hear what you're saying, but we can't extend the benefit of a doubt. Not about this. Not until we have a reason to. If we have to have a reason, it's not the benefit of a doubt, Kenzie replied. It's too close to home, I said. I tried to keep my voice level. For me, for Sveta, you can't make apologies for his actions until we have more information, not when some of us here are unable to forgive people who did the exact same thing to us. But you guys, Kenzie started. Ashley put a hand on Kenzie's shoulder, and Kenzie slumped back into her seat. She pulled her feet up onto her seat and hugged her knees. Okay. Did they get better? Rain asked. 
I was already shaking my head when Sveta said, No. You know how his screaming anxiety form kept screaming? There was a woman like that. Her mind didn't exit that state, and she roared out cuss words nonstop. All day, every day, without ever sleeping. She had surges of strength that meant she couldn't be in a regular hospital. There was a man who boiled alive. The bubbles would swell. I don't... I don't need details, Rain said. They were still there when I arrived at the asylum, along with a few others that had survived, Sveta said. There was a hard edge to her voice, like she could have been angry or burst into tears in the same breath. When Victoria did, they were probably still there on gold morning. He was my friend, Rain said. Yeah, I said. I know he was younger, or he wasn't younger, I said, twice your age. Ah, Rain said, and he huffed out the word like it had hit him straight in the solar plexus. Sorry. It doesn't matter any to me, Kenzie said, stubborn. It doesn't change anything. In fact, I kind of feel validated, because it fits everything in super neat with my seating chart. It should matter, Ashley said. And let's just let the others talk a moment, no commentary, please. I didn't have many friends when I first came to group therapy, Rain said. I didn't even know Aaron properly then. Everyone at the compound had turned on me. He gave you games and comics, Tristan said. Rain nodded. And we talked online whenever I was online. He helped me research clusters and find details on Love Lost, Cradle, and Snag. And he's a complete and utter monster? Apparently, Sveta said. We can't know 100%, I said. He's apparently an experiment. Not a clone, but a malleable housing for the DNA signature for the agent to hook into. I'd have to reread the notes. Ashley was a clone and she turned out okay, Kenzie said. Better than her former self. That's true. I said. The malleable house stuff, Rain said. That was why he was falling apart? He was trying to fix something by creating permanent changes? I hesitated. He lied about that, too? He was apparently doing the exact opposite of what he was saying, trying to weaken the Chris in him to make the changes stick longer, intentionally creating changes to break down his old self. Rain rose to his feet, and in the same motion pushed on the table in front of him, sending scrap, food, and his tools to the ground. The table followed a second later, everything crashing in a sharp, deafening noise with a short yelp from Natalie. Natalie, who had been watching from the sidelines. The bowl rolled around the floor for a second, the only sound. The sound wound down as it lost its momentum. Where the sound faded... I heard another, Kenzie's nervous giggling. Please don't, Rain said. I can't help it. Come, Ashley said. She winced as she picked Kenzie up out of the chair. Slippers off, we're going for a walk, you and me. The giggling stopped and started in the minute or so it took for Ashley to get Kenzie to the door and make her put her boots on. I helped, getting the coat, hat, and gloves with Swansong's stuff in my other arm. Rather than put those things on, Ashley just opened the door, stepping out onto the fire escape without winter clothes. I handed everything over and she shut the door. They'd get dressed for the outdoors outdoors. The door closing mercifully shut out the sound of the nervous giggling. Rain stood with his eyes up toward the ceiling, fingers knit together behind his head, forearms pressed against his ears. I fucked this up, I said. I don't think there was a good way to do it. I was considering one-on-one -on -one once I'd briefed people I thought were safe, I said. I was 75% on Ashley. I thought that if she did have an outburst, it would be okay so long as she was away from Kenzie. She surprised me. She once said her default for every person she meets is to be disappointed in them, Tristan said. There's never any surprises if they live up to that disappointment. 
Rain was only just now relaxing, lowering his arms. He looked down at the table he'd overturned. I'll clean up. I'm sorry. I'll get it, Natalie said. Please, it'll help if I can do something. If you bring the stuff, I'll help, Rain said. I told myself a long time ago I didn't want anyone cleaning up for me. It's a rule. Okay, Natalie said. She was on the other end of the room, so I barely heard her. If you'd done Kenzie last, she would have gotten curious and found out, and she would have been hurt, Sveta told me. If you told her first, we would have realized something was wrong, and I would have had a pretty hard time knowing I was last on your list of people to tell. Is it okay that I told you after... I started. I stopped because she was already nodding. Off to the side, Tristan had pulled Rain into a hug. I looked away. Rain was kneeling by the mess, separating things from the ginger beef and rice. I would have helped, but I had the instinct that he wanted space. Sveta, her arms were folded, her head bowed. Her expression as angry as I'd seen it, and she looked at nothing in particular. I'd known Sveta would take it hard. Rain had caught me by surprise. Kenzie had too, in a way. I'd prepared myself for the mindset that the others would want to grieve, and I hadn't anticipated the abject denial, even though it was one of the classic stages of grief. I didn't trust myself to approach any of them, so I turned toward the screen that Kenzie had left live. The images were there on the monitor, bulletin boards with note cards stuck to them, not so different from what we had in our hideout. I pretty quickly realized what they were. Tattletales notes. Scary notes. They had some starting points on the people who'd attacked us, notes on the portal, and some theorizing on the greater threats in play. Almost casually, figures like the Boogeyman were name-dropped and discarded. Amy and Chris were a footnote. Fucking dangerous information for us to so casually have, and dangerous information to be sending out. Arc 11, Blinding, Chapter 3 I've got it, Natalie told me. She squeezed past me to get to the door, took the keys I had in the flat of my hand and opened it, stepping inside to hold it open. I had Kenzie in my arms. She was skinny, but her clothes for the cold weather were puffy, and it meant my arms had to go around more. My arm still twinged from the gunshot wound in the left bicep, and my right hand had bandages around it inside the glove, though the skin was on its way to healing. Kenzie, meanwhile, was resting her face against my shoulder. When the cold weather had blustered, she had ducked her head down, and she hadn't lifted her head back up. The kettle was already starting to boil in the other room as we kicked off boots and got ourselves sorted in the front hallway. Ashley took her boots off and stalked off into the kitchen with her coat still on. Kenzie and I couldn't take our coats off either, since I was carrying her. Natalie did help me remove her hat and boots, though. Hold on, Ashley said as I entered the living room. She had a sheet in hand. The couch was quickly stripped of the backing cushions and then made up with a bottom sheet. It took Ashley, Natalie, and me to ease Kenzie down to a sitting position on the couch. Kenzie had been shot twice and had undergone three surgeries in a 36-hour span. I'm a bit embarrassed, Kenzie said. You're fine, Ashley told her. It's going to change how you guys all see me. We already know you, Ashley said. Nothing to change. It's one thing if I talk about how I used to be, but if you actually see it, then it's worse. Was that how you used to be? I asked. See? Volume down. Keep it at a two or three on the volume knob, Ashley said. See? 
I'm not saying anything's changed. I'm trying to give you a chance to expand on your thoughts there, I said. I remember feeling like I did tonight, except it was all the time, and it ended up with me going to the hospital because nobody could get me to stop, even me. You stopped, Ashley said. You aren't who you are then. But I feel like I did then. We all backslide. Tomorrow we'll return to business as usual. Some people will say apologies. If it makes you feel better, you can say yours. Apologies are for the other person. We can agree to disagree on that, Ashley told Kenzie. For now, do you want a snack? Yes, please, Kenzie said. Some tea to help you get to sleep? Okay, whatever works. I don't know about that. Get comfortable. I'll bring snacks, then I'll get the rest of your blankets. Ashley stepped into the kitchen, past Natalie, who was warily watching Damsel, and then past Damsel, who loomed at the doorway, shadowy with claws at the frame. From my vantage point, more used to this kind of scene, I could see Kenzie raise a hand to give Damsel a little wave, and I could see Damsel smile. When Damsel turned to go help Ashley, I saw the bedhead, a lick of hair at the back and the side, was pressed down. I was pretty sure Natalie didn't see that, that Natalie saw Damsel reach out for Ashley with knife fingers, touching them to Ashley's back and leaned in close, but didn't see that Ashley was putting away the tea bags that Damsel had taken out of the cupboard, instead of getting out the little jars of loose-leaf teas and the tea infuser. This wasn't what I expected when I thought about having a sleepover, Kenzie admitted. She smiled. I thought it would feel happier. Tomorrow will be brighter, I said. I feel weird not having my tech. You said to leave it behind, but I'm used to falling asleep to the glow of the screen. It'll be good to try and sleep normally, I told her. No late night tinkering. Eat, drink, sleep, enjoy your time with Ashley, recharge. I recharge by plugging in, though. You're human. You're a mammal. As much as any dog, cat, mouse, or elephant, you should be able to enjoy a good nap, warmth, companionship, and treats. They're universal. Kenzie drew in a deep breath, then huffed. Are you staying, Natalie? I don't think so. Even if I was welcome, I think I should really be back at my apartment getting organized for going back to work. I'll stay long enough to make sure you're comfortable, and then I'll be by first thing in the morning to pick you up. Okay. I'll be right back, I said. I checked on the Ashleys in the kitchen, and they seemed to be fine. Ashley had her arms folded while she leaned against the counter and was inaudible as she talked to her sister. Does she need something? Ashley asked as she saw me. Do you? I'm just going to get sheets and blankets to make up her bed. There's a nice throw in the drawer under the coffee table. When you go to the closet for sheets, get the ones from the top shelf. Someone lacerated the nicer sheets. I bought the nicer sheets, was the response. With our shared money. If you refuse to fix your hands, you can get to sleep in rags like a peasant. I rolled my eyes and headed toward the closet door. Natalie was talking to Kenzie in a quiet voice while Kenzie was lying down with her head on a throw pillow. I stopped to watch for a second. In the other room, I heard the continued dialogue. The hands are not changing, my dear whitewashed clone. I'm happy with them. They'll be needed when I go. Go? So you've decided? It's crowded. I've deigned to give you free reign, let you have your guests. Guests you like. Also, this is my apartment, paid for with money they gave me for my help in research. That I contributed to as well. I earned my due, and you'd have nothing without my share of it. I'd have something. I'm disappointed either way. You're better than this. I'm better than this. This is all very cute. Your friends are cute. But they're yours. 
I'm restless, and you know what this restlessness feels like. I know what it is and what it becomes. I have agreed to be good, little clone, because I didn't want to bring trouble down on your head, and I'm willing to play along with the rules. I committed crimes, they got me, they were taking care of me, and I didn't want to spend any more winters hungry. Fine, I'll stay in prison even if I could easily escape. Of course. But there are no rules, there is no prison, and they've forgotten about me. I'll make my mark. I'll carve out a place for myself, and I'll build a citadel that makes this cute little hovel feel paltry. You can't build anything if the energy you're using is pure restlessness, if you want to call it that. You definitely can't if your judgment is so clouded that you think this apartment is anything but great. I stopped eavesdropping and left them to their bickering, relatively confident they'd stop when the tea was done steeping. I might not have listened in at another time, but the two were volatile on their own, and there was that one in a hundred chance that they could be explosively volatile if they clashed. It was better if I could step in before they got heated enough to disturb Kenzie. I gathered up the blankets from the closet, stole a pillow from the bed, then took it all to the couch. Kenzie was already asleep, without blankets or pillow, dozing off to the background noise of Ashley and her clone sniping at each other. "'Are they aware we can hear them?' Natalie asked. She was sitting by the couch, Kenzie's colorful backpack resting against her lap. "'Doesn't matter,' I said. "'Isn't it concerning if the scary version of your teammate is talking about leaving to be a villain?' "'She makes noise about this now and then. "'I've tried to convince her, and she doesn't tend to listen. "'She's gradually working her way up to it, but...' "'I paused to listen to the back and forth. "'I couldn't make out all of the words, "'but I could definitely make out the tension. "'Not tonight. Probably.' "'Okay,' Natalie said, her forehead creased with lines. "'Something to worry about another day, if our Ashley doesn't have input or ideas. "'For today, I think we've worried enough. Give me a hand?' "'Kenzie roused only a bit as we set the sheet and heavier blanket down over top, "'with the folded throw blanket over her feet. "'Her lifting her head up was a chance for me to get the couch pillow out from under her head,' and put a real pillow there instead. Somewhere in the midst of it, the Ashleys noticed that Natalie had turned off some of the lights and went quiet. I said my goodbye to Natalie, collected my tea and crackers, and headed to my room, leaving Ashley watching a television on mute while she had her tea, Kenzie sleeping on the couch behind her, a crossword or something in her lap. Damsel had gone to her room, or their room, Glowing screen after all, I supposed. Kenzie had been too upset to go back to her place, and it wouldn't have been fair to the staff at the institution to put that on their shoulders. Ashley and Kenzie balanced out some of the most troubling aspects of each other, and after some debate and some phone calls, we'd agreed that this made the most sense. I'd spent the last few nights researching, focusing, and thinking about the group, and bracing myself for what I knew would be a tough conversation to have. Now, Kenzie was having her turn at the same things, with a bit less research, but she was figuring things out. In line with that role reversal, I was now taking on the task of building something, putting off sleep and focusing on bigger things. I flicked the row of switches for my computer, monitor, and peripherals to boot up. Kenzie's source had given us some information. Photos of bulletin boards with some more photos of note cards, all with Tattletale as the dubious source. I had the PRT data from Dragon, I had my notes from the patrol, and I had my own notes. Noontide was the one name I had to work off of, and from there I could go to Tattletale's notes to find out a bit more. Noontide Demon Reference to Apathy, Partners with The Orders, Contender, Griff slash Glyph, see 1104.odd. 
1104.odd convo partner Griff could be one of orders. Contender partners with 3rd G post-prison. Romantic? Names to throw around. I checked the orders against everything I had. PRT stuff from before gold morning, patrol notes, and the listings in a Who's Who subscription that had come out in 2008 that had attempted to track every cape and where they were. It had been a phone book of information that required far too much effort to maintain and had commanded a niche market of interested people. At best, it had been the next best thing to an online search to figure out if a cape name or team name was taken. Three issues had come out. I had a tattered copy with pages starting to come free of the spine. No orders under the team names. While I was looking, I didn't find a contender. Noontide, though. There had been one, and the name was both in my Who's Who phone book and available with an online search. The internet being what it was, my search turned up a positive search result, but clicking through returned a page-not-found result. The truncated description and single portrait of a mask that the search engine had coughed up from its servers was enough to tell me that they weren't the same person. Noontide had had brown skin, and her aesthetic had been entirely different from the woman in the picture that I'd found with the search. That, and with a second glance, I realized that there was a termination to the old Noontide's date in the date provided for activity. Born 1985, dead 2008. The old Noontide was almost certainly not the one we'd run into. That was a tidbit of info, because it suggested things about how she'd gone about picking out a name, that she hadn't used our internet because she hadn't been able, or she hadn't cared enough to. Third G was the next thing that caught my eye. My first instinct was to think of third-generation capes, capes with parents that had been the kids of capes. My second instinct was inspired by the mention of the prison goddess. I was left with the niggling feeling that more people had disappeared after goddess had attacked the prison, and very few people had appeared. Who was involved that hadn't wanted to go back to Shin? The third member of goddess's cluster, potentially? If so, the patrol was working with the wardens to keep tabs on a limited suite of parahumans. Because of the danger goddess had posed, and because her cluster was paranoid about being targets and about being weak, her cluster had asked for protection. The wardens hadn't been able to provide a safe house and a round-the-clock bodyguard, but they had provided some guidance. Three members of the cluster were gone, goddess included. Two had joined the wardens, becoming employees. Two more had slipped through the cracks, maintaining a stipend if they would call in or visit on a regular basis. Just to let the wardens check that nothing too ugly was happening. I could search them up, and with the search and the database access I'd been given, I could see some of the notes on the files. Tori Heflin, None, 109C. Classify, Shaker. Power, Telekinetic Reel-In, Push-Out, Straight Lines Only, Max 20 pound weight. Dispo, non, victim. Age, 25. Appearance, aboriginal, west continent, shin, round face, thick black hair, glasses, tattoos, neck, dot work triangles. Notes. 109C sought asylum and refuge status, victimized by goddess. Claimed non-affiliation, no interest in using powers or parahuman activities, but has been contacting other capes. See MER Contender, MER Lion Wing, MER Cretan. See attached files 109C D and 109C E to be monitored further. I checked the profiles for each of the names. The link to Contender gave me the image of the guy who had sealed me in his personal fighting arena. Bingo. The attached images took a minute to come up. 
Tory Heflin was at a venue too dark to be a bar, sitting with a trio of people in civilian clothes. Each had a label highlighting them. The extra metadata and labeling was part of why it had taken a minute. I could click on each to bring up their respective files. Tory was brown-skinned and round-faced, small and of a build that someone might term cute, but she had a mean look on her face in each of the attached files. The others at the table drank, but Tori didn't. Instead, she apparently smoked up a storm, favoring cigarettes with blue paper and a blue glow at the end. I'd seen them before. Blue flames or something. In the time it had taken her buddies to finish several beers, she had downed an equivalent number of cigarettes. Her unlabeled friend was mixing drinks and smoking, coming just shy of her in smoking and a bit shy of his friends in drinking. If I had to judge by the glasses beside him and the butts he'd stubbed out in the ashtray among Tory's blue flames. He was unlabeled, but I knew him. I'd seen him as a civilian in past shoots with the time camera, and I'd fought him. Kingdom Come. The light-haired woman next to her was leaning heavily into her personal space, and Tori didn't seem to either welcome it or hate it. One photo where the blonde sat with her tattooed arm pressed hard into Tori's shoulder, and another photo where the woman had an arm around Tori's shoulders, half leaning into Tori and half onto the table, clearly tipsy. The woman was Lion Wing, and she too had cropped up on the time camera. When we'd first seen the pharmacist, Kingdom Come had been there, and so had a strawberry blonde woman with a tattooed arm and a cat mask. I clicked the label, and I brought up a page. Lion Wing, in varying costumes. She had light armor she wore when in the field, along with a sword and a triangular shield that had decorative arrangements of spikes at each corner. A bit of a gladiator look. The last person sitting at the table was Cretan, muscular, with a shaved head and goatee. Clicking through produced a blurry picture of him standing in the midst of fires. He had a helmet with a bull motif, but didn't even use the bull's horns as part of the aesthetic. The helmet hugged his head pretty close, and the bull arched over the top like a mohawk, its eyes lining up with his. His armor was similar hugging his body pretty close with the design etched in or marked out in white metal. Okay. Making sense of this, the pharmacist had been allied with Teacher. Teacher was connected to the hyper-religious nuts from Earth Chite, with some fallen and kingdom come roped into that. They or Teacher had hired six mercenaries. Contender, the one who had created an arena, Noontide, who had tried to put Sveta and I to sleep, and The Order, a quartet of capes we hadn't seen yet, with only two of them in my picture here. Attention had been drawn to them only because Tori had claimed to be a victim in the goddess debacle, had asked for help as a non-threat, and had then started hanging out with people who hurt others for money. Why come after us or send the mercenaries after us? Because they'd already been caught on camera, and someone had told them they'd need to keep it from happening again? Noontide's lack of research for her name was odd, but it made more sense if I reconsidered things from the angle that she wasn't from Bet. I looked into her file and found a series of jobs she had done. It was stock work for a mercenary, with bodyguard work for a celebrity, theft, and teaming up with another team to rescue a girl that had apparently been kidnapped by some people from the construction workers' riot that hadn't been willing to let things go. She was a mercenary. There hadn't been any lying about that. Was this dry resume a cover? Was she up to something else? Contender, at least, wasn't chite or chite in disguise. He had a history and had gone by another name before. He'd been the Pug, short for pugilist, and had taken bids on sites to pick fights with capes prior to gold morning. 
He'd evolved toward the tail end of that embarrassing debacle, taking more serious money and going after kill orders, all the while refining his skill set. He'd had a break, gold morning had happened, and a few months afterwards he'd emerged as contender. Then, as I turned my focus to the order, I found them to be ghosts. Some jobs, but they hadn't existed a month ago, and they apparently worked together and socialized as a tight-knit team. That didn't happen. Not with people who'd appeared so spontaneously and simultaneously. Chite again? Insidious, if it was the case. Foreign agents operating as mercenaries, maybe picking and choosing the jobs they did, meeting other capes, sounding them out, and manipulating the ones they saw as vulnerable. No, it was worse than that. They'd permanently scarred our horizons, torn up a chunk of our city, and killed a lot of people. People we cared about. Jessica was gone. The cracks that radiated out from that wound and the loss of some of our best wardens and warden staff had laid the groundwork for Goddess to take the prison. They'd done that, and then they'd fucking insinuated themselves into the background of our cape scene, foreign agents acting as mercenaries. I was left to wonder if Tori was among the scared and vulnerable that they'd positioned themselves to snap up. A cluster mate of the lady in blue? I began looking into other jobs they'd done, going back to Noontide's record, then extrapolating to people she'd worked with. The patchy notes meant that even if Contender wasn't listed as being on a job, I could find a note where Cretan was listed as being on that job with Contender helping. I was in the middle of a frustration-induced note that I was planning to send to the wardens about cross-referencing when I heard Ashley using her power. A sound like ripping, a sound like nails on chalkboards, and a sound like thunder all rolled into one. I flew to the living room, narrowly avoiding a collision on the way. Damsel was exiting her bedroom, and she ducked low as I adjusted by flying high. The window to the outside was broken, and cold air blew into the living room. Kenzie was propped up, one hand on her stomach, and Ashley stood in the center of the room. What happened? Ashley was silent, looking around the room. Ashley! Someone grabbed me. Kens? I asked. I don't know. I was sleeping and I got a huge wake-up call. The wind whistled as it blew in through the broken glass door. This wasn't a dream thing? I asked. Ashley shook her head. How sure are you? Seventy. Leaving a thirty percent chance you put a hole in the window for no reason, Damsel said. Scared your little friend and scared Kenzie too. I gave her a roll of my eyes. You got scared, Damsel told Ashley. You've gotten soft. I'm a little scared, Kenzie said. Shh, you're fine. All of us here are watching over you, Damsel replied. We won't let anything happen to you. Ashley's imagined monsters won't hurt you. You've become less funny and more of a bully in the time I've been in the hospital, Ashley observed. She was still turning slowly, checking the room. "'What was it?' I asked. "'A man. He made noise. I woke up, and he grabbed me before I could react. I was prepared to use my power to throw us both into the wall, but I didn't get a chance. He threw me from the chair. I used my power, and I didn't connect.' "'Where did he go?' "'I didn't see.' I looked at Kenzie. She shook her head. "'Powers?' I asked. Possible, Kenzie said, her eyes wide. I drew my phone from my pocket. The contact screen had different icons by different names. Most had ZZZ beside them. Rain was awake, working late on Sveta's arm, as much as was possible when his tinker power was in its wane period. Me. Trouble. 
We might need help. There was a pause. Rain. That not good. Me. Can you make your way to us if we need backup? Rain. No. No, I have no transpo and time is wrong. Thirteen minutes until my power knocks me out automatically. Then I sleep like dead. I looked at the clock. Rain. What is trouble? Me. Ashley was grabbed, thrown from bed. She broke a window. No idea where the attacker is. Rain. Weirdness here, too. Kay's projector box is sweating. Rain says your projector box is sweating? What? Is that dangerous? No. No, it just doesn't make any sense. Talk to our guy, I told her, putting my phone on the coffee table and sliding it to her. I'm going to check the building. Ashley stayed with Kenzie while Damsel came with me. Front hall clear. The door was locked. The kitchen was fine. Bathroom, first bedroom that included my office with the papers strewn everywhere, the second bedroom that belonged to Ashley, the storage room that still had Ashley's furniture in it from where I'd moved it in to make room for my things, all clear. Um, Kenzie said, as Damsel and I returned from the hallway that led to the bedrooms. So, it's not just that my projector box and computer are sitting in a giant puddle. Spit it out, Damsel said. The door was left ajar, so it almost froze. Rain was hogging space heaters, so it took him a while to notice. Didn't you waterproof it? I asked. Because you knew Capricorn would be using his power around it? Kenzie nodded. And proofed it against cold weather? Best as I could, but that has nothing to do with anything, except it means they probably survived the flooding. Why? How? Did it malfunction? It wouldn't ever malfunction like that. That's like saying your barbecue is broken. It keeps making salad. Kenzie, please, simple answers. It's the simplest answer. It's wet because someone put the water there. Kenzie said. Then, according to Rain, this theoretical person left the door partially open on the way out. Why put water on a computer? Attempted sabotage? How did one put water on a computer without alerting the guy who was working late on his tinkering? And if they were active there, and we had strangeness here... Shit, I said. My computer. I took flight cutting a path through the hallways. The door to my room and office was closed when I got there, and it had been open when I'd left it a minute ago. I pushed the door open, and a blast of cold air mingled with choking, blinding fumes to dash my senses. I couldn't see, couldn't smell, and couldn't taste, and the only noise was the wind from the open window. My files! Months and months of effort, of back and forth, five-hour round trips, to scrounge up papers from the remains of our house, to dry papers, separate the mildewy and moldy from that which could be preserved, and typing out new versions of any pages that couldn't be saved, even trying to keep the formatting intact. The smell was gasoline. He was setting fire to everything that was mine, from clothes to computer to files, to the space that was mine, to Ashley's apartment. The others caught up to find me standing there in shock, covering my mouth and trying to avoid the kind of coughing that prompted more coughing. What the hell? He took my feathers. I turned back to look at Kenzie. They're important, and they're not on the coffee table. Important. Priorities. I shook off the shock and took stock. The fumes filled my room to the point that it was hard to enter. Get to safety, I called out to the others. Then I covered my mouth and flew through. If he went after the projector computer, he'd go after my computer, too. I had to rescue it. If he was after fire or torching any and all evidence, then I had to deny him that. 
a contest of parahuman against parahuman, broke down to a game of denial and control, even if the power was strength. When my mom stepped onto the battlefield, her ability to succeed was dependent on getting to where she could hold her weapon near her opponent's vitals, and her opponents couldn't respond or react. That was the end state. For Crystal, it was about getting high, dropping force fields in the right places or using them to protect herself and deny her opponents the ability to hurt her. So long as she held that high vantage point, any place that was in her field of vision was a place her enemies couldn't go. For my dad, a thrown grenade created a radius around it where enemies could do nothing but get away, if they were even afforded the time. Failing to do so meant they were concussed at the very least. He essentially maintained a broader circle around him where he could quickly deposit grenades, and the only way to fight him without facing an endless onslaught of light grenades was to stay out of his range, which extended about as far as a strong man could throw a head-sized rubber ball. For me, especially now, it involved doing a lot of damage, and measuring out how much. Little things could be fixed or handled later. I flew up, grabbed a bookcase, and used a pulse of my strength to haul it over. It crashed down with enough force to create gaps between floorboards where there hadn't been any. There were books and papers on it, but the bookcase was metal, and with any luck, it would interrupt the flow of fire across the accelerant. It might buy time, if the fire came from the hallway, or if the fire was traveling from here to the hallway. I flew to the window, my mouth still covered. No sign of anyone outside, no flame, no lighter being used or match being struck. I flew to the bookcase. I'd be sealing myself inside, but if worst came to worst, flying through a wall wouldn't be making the damage that much worse. A hand seized me by the throat from behind. A sharp blow across the back of the head disabled the wretch before it could even unfold, and I was pulled away from the bookcase. He'd never even left the room. I tumbled head over heels, disoriented. The rush of cold air mingled with the odor of the gasoline vapor. I found down and flew straight to it. We crashed to the hard floorboards, gasoline soaking the papers that had been scattered across the floor. Mine, mine, and you ruined it! In the wrestling match, each of us exchanged places, one of us on top, the other with back to ground. I was getting gasoline on me, but so was my shadowy attacker. I saw the hand reach for a weapon and grabbed his wrist, a taser. As quickly as it had been grabbed, it was dropped. The spark would be a mistake given our current battlefield. The computer's black screens. Hopefully the breaker switch for this room was down or the connection was otherwise a failure, because those computers being on meant any number of infinitesimally small ways to ignite the gas. The computers. I had to remember my goals. Even though our attacker was in my hands, it was better to deny the control of the situation as I'd done before. I forced my way out of his grip, then barreled straight for the desktop tower that was my at-home computer. Cables were all still plugged in, keyboard, mouse, and monitor were plugged or even screwed in. I tore at them, letting the easier ones fall free, forcing the remainder. The aura was affecting my attacker. Where he might have swung a meaty fist at me before, he was holding on tight, as if trying to wait out heavy weather in a bad storm. As I tried to fly away, he clung to me. There were too many things to focus on between the computer tower, the damage to property, the gasoline that could easily see the neighborhood go up in smoke, and my own well-being. I shoved my assailant off me, then flew closer to the ceiling, holding the computer tower with its stray wires dangling down. Winning the fight wasn't important. Coming out ahead was. My notes were everything. 
flying out of reach near the ceiling, I had a view of the entire room. Was it over? Had I won? Well, won insofar as I'd denied him what he wanted. I shut the window. Two bullets to the back of the head. The first will take out your force field. The other will end you. Drop the computer. Fly away. I turned around slowly. A girl in a black leather bodysuit with a black leather jacket and a scarf around her lower face. The face I could see was covered in a gray mask with eyes slanted to match the angle and slant of a woodland animal, each lens an opaque black. That's not flying away, Imp told me. That's standing your ground. She was holding up a lighter. I was very worried the vapor in the air would ignite. Put that out. We can talk, I told her. The lighter flicked closed. I'm not here to talk. We had a good working relationship a couple of days ago. That was then, she said. Put the computer down. You're going to tear out the hard drive. I drew in a deep breath. No games, she said. I've got to protect the kid I'm looking after. Your kid baited him into sharing secrets. In the course of sharing those secrets, he used mundane networks, no encryption. People have seen. Some of those people are mentioned in the pictures. Sounds like a failure on your part. It's a problem for all of us, Glory Girl, but the kids are the most important. My volume raised. It's a failure on your end, and our home has to burn to the ground? Fuck that! The people who were alerted are going to pay more attention to you, Gigi. If they think you got nothing... If you avoid making specific searches about names, and if there's a nice fire to assure them that all the evidence stops here, the buck stops there. It's never as simple as that. This isn't about protecting us. This is about protecting you. Us, not me, Imp said. I'm armed, you're not. Let go of the computer. Let it fall to the floor. If it sparks, just do it, she said. I did. It clunked on landing. There wasn't quite enough accelerant or anything on the floor here to allow for a splash. I've been really nice, Imp said. I could have humiliated you. Instead, I'm sticking to non-lethal weapons and careful use of fire. Uh-huh. Stay where you are, she said, keeping the pistol on me. I could use the wretch, I knew. It had reach, it was invisible, and if it got her, it would pull her in close and tear her to pieces. Except, I didn't want to be that kind of person, and the computer by my feet was in the wretch's reach, too. I could trust an invisible hand to probably seize her outstretched hand, but I couldn't trust anything else. The gender confusion from earlier was resolved as I glanced back and saw how one of her arms was altered. It was hairy, veins running down the back of the arm, and it was a little longer than her usual arm. The bodysuit's fabric didn't roll past the thickest part of the bicep, so she had rigged some other kind of detachable sleeve to pull over and up to the shoulder. Her power hadn't effectively covered it, so it regularly figured into my processing of the scenes, and it lingered in my head even as the rest of her threatened to disappear while my focus was entirely on her. I'm going to need you to move the bookcase, Gigi. I locked eyes with her. She motioned with the gun, tilting her head so the lenses of her mask caught the light in a different way. I used flight and a bit of strength to move the thing. It screeched loudly with the motion. I wasn't even done moving it when Imp pushed the door open. She immediately leapt back. I could hear Ashley's power, almost entirely hidden by the ragged sound of the bookcase moving over hardwood. Ashley or Damsel was approaching, and I could hear the sound of it. The power shredded the door and the surrounding frame as she stalked forward. It was Damsel, and her claws contained a large sphere of destruction, annihilating everything in front of her, 
flickering and storming as power ran through it. Move a hair, Imp whispered in Damsel's ear, and you're going to get a bullet in your throat to match the one your sister got, except yours will be the last body mod you ever get. I wheeled around. Imp had her gun to Damsel's throat, her man hand wrapped in a deathlock around Damsel's front, pulling her off balance. Damsel had her hands out to her sides, no power active. Pick up the computer, glory girl. It's not my name anymore. I don't care. People change names too often. It's better to have one good one that you stick to. Imp was taken, you know, I told her. I don't care. You don't really have it. I don't care. Pick up the computer. Fly it to the ground outside the window. No games. I pushed out with my aura again, but I kept it subtle barely noticeable like Rain's often was. I began feeding it to Imp with Damsel as an incidental target. Now! I picked up the computer, stepped over to the open window and flew down. I planted the computer case on a stack of firewood. If you have any freaky porn that you're embarrassed about, I promise I'll only make a little bit of fun of you for it, Imp said from the window. I'll only share your browser history with a thousand people tops. She beckoned, and I flew over. I was flying, and I had someone in my arms. The nose of the gun jabbed into the soft flesh beneath my jaw, forcing my chin up. I was still tempted to drop her. Instead, aware as I was outputting a bit of my aura... I slowly ramped it up. If I could do the boiling a frog trick... Down by the red cloth. I know it's hard to see in the dark, but do your best. There was a red cloth tied to a post. I flew to it. She hopped down the last ten or so feet to the snow. I chose that opportunity to push out harder with my aura. This was fun, she said. We should never, ever do it again, understand? If someone slips you information that's supposed to be ours, you hand it straight back over, or you'll run into problems like your house burning down and you not being all the way sure why. The feathers. You need to give them back. No, I do not. The feathers were a gift from a member of our team to a member of yours. They don't need to hang out any longer. Normally, I would encourage friendships, but I've read the horror stories, and it'll just get messy when we're all on opposite sides. Trust me, I did that back in Brockton Bay for a bit. Kid Hero and me, bit of romance, got awkward when it ended. Really? Who? Not kissing, not telling. Instead, I am... She drew a flare gun out of her pocket, and with pistol in her right hand and flare gun in her left, kept the former trained on me, and the latter aimed at the window. Delivering my coup de grace, she said, sounding tired. Her flare gun was in her right hand. And I'll do it on my first try like a badass. Damsel is up there. It's not badass to kill people. That's complete and utter failure for anyone civilized. She's not up there, not anymore, Imp said, sounding even more tired. She's at the side, trying to flank me, still... Imp indicated a corner of the building, about forty feet away. I ramped up my aura. Stop, she said. So that was her limit for tolerance. I pushed harder, and I set my jaw. If you think that's going to mess up my aim, you should know I thrive under pressure. I heard Damsel using her power. Stupid, Imp muttered. I heard Ashley using her power. A little more oomph, more of an eruption of power than a jetting out. Unpredictable, uneven, but it gave her momentum. Those forty feet of distance closed fast. Multiple blasts, and each one carried one of the two in a different direction. They zigzagged through the air, 
one pale shape and one dark one, and converged on Imp with the same timing, each set to collide with her in the same instant. The two Ashleys landed, one of them clipping a branch from the overhanging foliage on her way down. They didn't fly so much as they propelled. Are you okay? Ashley asked me. I nodded. My eyes were searching the battlefield. Kenzie was still vulnerable, but as I groped for what the threat was, I drew a blank. Fuck. Put up with this if you can, I said. I increased the push on my aura until it was at its worst. That's nothing, Damsel said, even as her face's micro-expressions betrayed what was going on behind the surface. Let's hope our attacker doesn't think so, I said. I closed my eyes, focusing. I couldn't sense through my aura, but my aura made it hard to deal. Ashley and Damsel had talked about restlessness. I was creating a sort of restlessness in this moment of a very different sort. The snow muffled sound, and with this area of the city being where it was, and with everything being after hours, I could hear noise. I started toward it. We were moving in a direction, and with the weather being what it was and me not having a coat— it was easier to keep moving. When I hit my limit, I would loop back. Just to be sure, I cast a glance backwards and spotted the computer case. Wouldn't do to lose track of that and let our enemy run away with it. The Ashleys were advancing on either side of me, and as we heard a pant, we started forward with more vigor. You're being irritating, Imp whispered in my ear. I blinked. The Ashleys had fanned out a bit more to either side, and Imp had me, gun to my throat again. I'm trying to be nice. I've been avoiding murder. Me too, she whispered. You try anything, I double tap you. And while we're on the subject of doubling, we're doubling back. From the woods behind Ashley's place back toward the rows of buildings. The Ashleys had noticed and were approaching cautiously. For every one pace Imp and I advanced, they advanced too. She called herself a wolf earlier, and I could see it now. Pack hunting, stalking, dead serious, and very dangerous. We found the computer once more. Imp drew her flare gun. She stopped when Kenzie stepped out from behind a tree wearing all-winter clothing, including coat, hat, and earmuffs. You're outnumbered. Doesn't matter when number one is super awesome, Imp retorted. And when she has a hostage. Kenzie drew a gun and pointed it. It looked like a toy weapon. Imp shook her head slowly. No, you don't want to do that. Hostage. Use your common sense, kiddo. I spent it all on figuring out my tinkering. I've got just a big empty loneliness inside me right now with some mad scientist vibes. Kenzie smiled, and then she pulled the trigger on her flash gun, blinding everyone present that wasn't her. Snuff held the door open for Tattletail. The kids climbed out too, but they weren't part of the show of force, not directly. The heartbroken kids ran around and headed toward the mall that was at the far end of the parking lot, the older kids who were apparently in charge of them hurrying after, herding cats. Tattletail remained, and so did the two members of Palanquin who were guarding her. Imp was with her, but Imp was still blind. It had been a few hours. I'd had the presence of mind to fly away before more shots could land, so it had been about twenty-five minutes for me, where I hadn't been able to see anything except hot white spots. Rain and an unhappily awoken Tristan and Sveta were with me. Not bringing backup just hadn't been an option. Chicken Little seemed to want to go with the heartbroken, 
but instead Snuff positioned him at Tattletail's side. He had a hangdog look for someone with a hard, full face mask. A few of the heartbroken lingered. Chicken Little's age. Perrion and Foyle lingered, too. I gave Foyle a nod, and she nodded back. Kenzie was with me, too, in a sense. She didn't get out of the vehicle. She sat in the passenger seat, feet swung out over the side. She had her costume on. Let's try this again, Tattletail said. Are you sure? Because your approach of burning everything we cherish and love to ash to protect your info is a great plan. Works for me, Tattletail said. I shook my head slowly. You gotta scrub it all. You didn't get it fair and square, and some of that is stuff only I and my sources know that the kids don't pay much attention to. When people start blabbing about details that only I'm supposed to know, it makes my sources jittery. Some of them are in very dangerous places. Sounds like you got sloppy, Tristan said. Having a thinker hunting us down and forcing us to relocate regularly is what makes us sloppy, as it would for anyone. Now, you don't want to be casualties of that sloppiness. Work with us, I said. I don't like you, you don't like me, but I could help you figure something out. You're making too many enemies. Profitability... Fuck profit, I interrupted. Fuck that. And simple logic... Tattletail raised her voice. She stabbed a pointed, painted fingernail in my direction. If we spend too much time around you, your enemies become our enemies. If you have a lot of enemies, which you do, then that fucks us. And if you refuse to cooperate with us and play ball, then we let your intel leak, including that information about sources and your allies become your enemies. You're really willing to play hardball? Tattletail asked. Give Kenzie her feathers back. Let the kids talk. You realize what a monster she is, don't you? I glanced back at Kenzie. Nothing resembling a monster, and I'm an expert. Because you spent two years as one, of course. I looked back at Tristan, who held out my bag for me. I put it down, and as I reached for it, Snuff tensed. The palanquin mercenary who looked like an ordinary person tensed as well. Files, I said. I moved slowly as I drew the paperwork from the bag. Tristan was the one who took the files and handed them out, some for Parian, some for Foil, and some for Tattletail. All of the information on the order and the mercenaries I'd picked up, the PRT files. Your files are more up-to-date than mine. Tattletail said as she read. You found a central network server? I was led to one, bargained. The details on Pug? Old collection of paper files, which you guys doused in gasoline but didn't set on fire. Do you have more? There's a bit more in there. We'd have even more if we hadn't been interrupted. Again, your teammate tried to set us on fire. You're building a narrative here. Tattletail observed. It all ties back to teacher, I see. Yeah, I replied. An awful lot of it. Fallen, the baiting of goddess, the portal attacks. I'll provide you with a tidbit of information, then. If we're going to deal... If we're going to deal the feathers first, they're important. Fine, I'll agree to that. But Chicken Little is still grounded. He can't talk to his friends on the phone. Some conversation. I'll cut 20% off his sentence of being grounded forever, Tattletail said. She glanced back at Chicken Little, who ducked his head. Seriously, I said. At limited times per day, or a limited number of messages, I suggested. I heard Kenzie groan behind me. That would be workable, Chicken Little muttered, barely audible. Feathers and chat. Some meetings allowed if they're both on good behavior. I've read her rap sheet, and I want to make sure he's protected. I looked at Tristan, then at Rain. They looked so exhausted I doubted they were processing. I looked at Kenzie, who nodded. Sure. We'll negotiate. 
You want in bed with us? You're in bed with us. Congratulations. We'll share resources. I nodded. Fine, Tattletail said. Let it be known I'm immensely unhappy with this. That's allowed, I said. Behind Tattletail, I saw Chicken Little's leg jiggle slightly. Surreptitiously, after he looked left, looked right, and checked that nobody on his team was looking, he turned his hand to one side, extending the smallest of thumbs up. I looked back at Kenzie, who nodded. Tattletail heaved out a sigh. She waved Imp forward. Imp met Rain halfway. She handed over two feathers, and he took them back to hand to Kenzie. Important to do this. She needed a friend. And I supposed we needed the intel. You're wrong, though, Tattletail said. Wrong? These mercenaries you're looking at? They're chite, your notes are right. The order is a reference to a verse in their texts. The thousand-eyed beasts, front and back. Lion, that's your drunk girl. The ox, your bull guy. You've also got the beast with the face of a man and the eagle. They're tied up in the fours that run through the texts. For apostles, for virtues, for whatevers. I think I know the verse, Rain said. We have it too. Good, Tattletail said. Why is that important? I asked. Because it means they're hardcore chite, which you guessed... You were mostly on the right track, and you might have stumbled on the right answer, if you weren't keeping your eye out for the wrong destination. The wrong destination? Teacher, Tattletail said. He doesn't have control of his group, so he's not pulling their strings. He's happy doing the prison thing, fucking with goddess, tearing up holes in reality like the one across Brockton Bay and the ones in the heart of the city, but his people turned their attention to people caught in time loops, stasis, other fuckery like that, and teacher drew the line there. These guys here? She tapped the paper before continuing. The mercenaries from another world? They split from teacher over it. Are they after Jack? I asked. Worst case scenario. Tattletail shook her head. They're not that reckless, no. One of the names raised was closer to home than Jack, and while the shit with March is going on, the Undersiders can't go home. Arc 11, Blinding, Interlude 1. <laughs> she fake laughed. My sides! Oh, wait. You need new material, piece. If I didn't repeat myself once in a while, I wouldn't get to hear your dulcet tones telling me how unfunny I am. Ha ha. They hiked through the snow and underbrush so thick that it was oftentimes easier to walk on instead of walking through. Sidepiece reached out for DJ's arm, gripping the forearm ducked under a branch and then stepped down to lower ground. Thirty feet away, he was using a stick to prop himself up. He only had the one hand, but he could lean heavily on the stick for added balance. He spared her a glance, withdrew his arm, rotated the forearm, and then flung it out instead of teleporting it. The hand gripped a branch, and the forearm stuck out at a convenient height and angle for her to grip. Masks or no? DJ asked. Sure, can't hurt. We're going to be near people. We'll be lurking in the trees like creeps. We might as well wear masks. Uh-huh. She put on her mask, a new one that had been provided by Love Lost. It was in the shape of a skull, but limited to a cut that only covered the middle third of her face. The mask attached with glue and stayed stuck where it was. A mouth portion covered the portion of her face between lips and chin. The teeth of the mask were modified, as were the shapes of the eye sockets. But it worked. Damsel had fucked up and bailed when it mattered. But she'd had other things on point. Sidepiece had a compact filled with black grease paint. With her thumbs, she applied it to upper and lower lids, with a little curl up at the edges, like exaggerated eyelashes. Nothing so delicate as Damsel had seen, but Sidepiece didn't consider herself delicate. 
DJ had a similar mask, but it was limited to the lower half of his face, broken into two parts, which he exaggerated by breaking his head in two parts, the upper half suspended over the lower. He had his own grease paint, white to contrast with his black skin. He used his one hand to draw horizontal lines and highlight other gaps he created with his power. She gave him a thumbs up, smiling. The lights of civilization glowed beyond the trees, but the footing didn't get any easier to manage. The divide between pain and the taint nature and snow-covered concrete was a harsh one, with bushes and piled-up branches standing high enough that she could stand three feet above solid ground with parking lot two paces in front of her. DJ's hand once again provided a handhold as she navigated the wood underfoot. She settled in, leaning against a tree, and tapped on his wrist with one finger. Let go for me. He let go. She retained her grip on his arm, cradling his arm in hers. I want you to know you're a proper fucking gentleman, Joint. It warms a lady's heart. She punctuated the statement by taking his hand and laying it down flat against her chest, where her coat didn't cover her. That's not your heart, Peace. Is so. I'm not complaining, he said. Not about that. Keeps my hand warm. She laid her hand down over top of his, sandwiching it there, and then pulled her coat around to cover both of their hands. I don't want to tell you to stop, but can you keep it where I can see it? He asked. I might need it. I've got us covered, she said. She used her free hand to move her jacket, which was open, showing off her midsection. There was enough missing that she'd been able to position two holsters so they were strapped around her spine and each other, the guns angled so she could reach down and draw one. Even when her coat was pulled tight around her body, the matched pistols wouldn't show. Come on, he said. If there's trouble, I'll give you back your arm, yeah? Fine. Considering, she shifted the coat, buckling it at the top, still allowing for both of their arms and hands to be inside the coat, and left the lower half unbuckled, her midsection and the two pistols exposed and in reach. The shit is risky, Disjoint said. Aw, buddy, are you scared? Aren't you? he retorted. Nah, I'm mostly worried we hiked this way for nothing. What are the odds that they see us in a car while driving here? If they even show up? It's so fucking stupid. If I'm scared of fucking anything, I'm scared of being set up to do fucking stupid things for no fucking good reason. Love has it wrong just once. She's smart. Isn't smarts, Side Piece said. Smarts is what you learn from a book or teacher. Street smarts from a street teacher. You don't need to lecture me about street smarts. I'm more street than you anyway. I don't think that's what she's about. She used to be law before she was lawless. She's got a good eye for things, and that's where she shines, Joint. A good eye even when she's not looking, which makes me worry. She's looking. She's not telling us about all of it, but she's looking. What we're doing right now, it's so she can look. Or trustworthy eyes. Uh-huh. Trustworthy. Mostly trustworthy. But a week ago, I saw her talk to this skank. Woman was making booze in her bathtub and definitely not using the bathtub for its usual purposes. She was hanging around Love's Turf, trying to pawn off her bathtub booze, scaring off anyone who had a sense of smell. Right? Uh-huh. Most people would tell the skank queen of stank to take a hike. Love turned her into an asset. She still hangs around, she still pawns, but the product's a bit better. The skank showers once a week and she reports in. Things she's heard, things she's seen. That's usually the way it works? Nuh-uh. I've known people who ran a neighborhood, expected people to tell them if there was any news, but didn't care otherwise. My family was like that. I've known people who ran their blocks like a business, with rules like how you take 50% of what you get and reinvest it back into the business. I've even known ones who paid people for information, but the goal was profit, maximizing money in their pockets at the end of the day. She's different? Her goal is information, Joint. If you look for it, you'll see it. But she's willing to break even on the business side of things to buy unreliable information. She'd be willing to send us on a wild goose chase that could go nowhere, and that bothers me. Disjoint shook his head. You're off. I think she would, and if she will, that means we're lower in her eyes. There's a class system here, like castes in India or whatever, and stank skank with the bathtub booze is bottom tier. I don't want to be at the mother-sucking stank skank level. 
If this is a shit job, then it means she's not all that, and it means I'm not all that to her. Not what I'm saying. I don't agree about the information part. Really? You've got to pay attention and look, DJ. See what she's fucking organizing. I'm looking. Not always at the same things you are, but I'm looking. I see the people she's putting in place, and I don't think the point is information. The point is emotional. She knows that information gets her what she wants. Sidepiece considered, then shrugged. She wasn't sure he could see her in the gloom, but his hand was in place to feel the shrug. She smiled at the thought and spoke through the smile. Revenge. Hate and rage. Revenge means there's something that can be done, and once it's done, then that's the end of it. I guarantee you, Peace, she's going to get what she wants, and those emotions she's feeling won't change a bit. Side Peace felt uncomfortable, hearing that and kind of agreeing with it. The playful smile dropped away, and she found herself staring out across the dark parking lot. There were only six cars in a lot that could have held a hundred, and it wasn't because the mall was closed. The lights were on, signs lit, the store interiors illuminated. She's still classy as shit, she decided. She is. And pure sex. If she gave me a clear signal, I'd go to town, and I'm only a bit into women. He drew in a deep breath, then like a robot, recited the practice line. I declined to comment on the grounds that it would self-incriminate. Baby, she cooed. She stumbled along the heaped branches and rocks to get close enough, and he caught her, the hand at her front going rigid and providing some of the leverage to keep her from falling. She leaned hard into the hand and reached up to touch his face. There is no criminating here. No discrimination, no incrimination, no cremation. You're safe from me. She felt his hand at her chest move reflexively at the line. She'd never known a guy like Disjoint, and she had known a lot of guys. When she had been 14, she dated 16-year-olds. They'd wanted one thing. That hadn't changed when she'd been 16 and dating 18-year-olds. It might have continued as a pattern, except shit had gone down when she was 18, and she hadn't come away in one piece. It had taken her a while to try again. When she had, she'd been 20, offering herself to 30-year-olds to see if they'd bite. Some bit. She hadn't realized what she'd been looking for until she stumbled into it. A guy her age who'd been hurt when she'd been hurt. She could offer him the sort of thing that other guys wanted, and he liked it. But it wasn't why he stuck by her. No, it was fucked up, but he stuck by her because he liked it when she was nice to him. It revved his engines and made him happy in a day-to-day -day way. She wasn't good at being nice. Headlights. She saw. Across the parking lot, vehicles were convening. I brought binoculars if you want them. DJ said. I trust you. DJ brought his hand to his face, two fingers at each eye. He pulled his hands away, and his eyes were each between two fingers. His own eye sockets were black pits, rimmed with red flesh in the horizontal blindfold of white grease paint that he'd applied. He stuck that hand out in the direction of the headlights. The eyes fritzed like a bad videotape, then disappeared. Breakthrough, he said. Some of them. No damsel, nobody else. I'm going to have to put my ears over there to catch what they're saying. I've got you. She drew closer to him, supporting him with her body. He reached up to remove his ears, which was a little more involved than simply removing the exterior portion. Then he cast them out as he had the eyeballs. When he did this, he was blind and deaf, but he also lacked balance. Sending eyes or ears one at a time while keeping one close by only served to further disorient him, and the eyeballs didn't come with eyelids, so he couldn't close his eyes to filter what he was seeing. This was the dangerous part. If the heroes realized they were being watched, they could retaliate. If it came to that, DJ would have to bring back his eyes and ears, and they would have to scram. A fighting retreat against people who could fly, do the retractable doll limb thing, and that shit with the silver blades that had killed Snag from Love's Cluster. She told herself a long time ago she would face danger with a smile. As her heart beat faster, she told herself it was excitement. This shit was neat. She rose up on her tiptoes and kissed his mouth. He broke the kiss, muttering, Keep an eye out. I will she said before tracing the letters on his stomach, spelling out what she was saying. There were more headlights. Another car beat from bumper to bumper. 
It parked in an empty spot at the edge of the trees, as far away from the mall's door as was possible. It put the driver fifty or so feet away from Side Piece and Disjoint. An employee of the mall. Side Piece drew DJ in for another kiss. You're distract- he started. Her finger on his lips silenced him. She maintained the kiss while the person walked by, apparently choosing a course where the snow and ice wasn't as pronounced, which meant walking beneath the overhanging branches of trees and walking within ten feet of the pair. Side Piece watched with one eye, hoping that if the person did see, they'd think it was two people having a snog as she'd heard characters in a TV show say. The masks were a drawback when it came to camouflage, but she could hide some of that with her hand up by DJ's face. Hello? the person called out. She sighed into DJ's face and she broke the kiss. She looked at the employee, someone wearing an orange shirt with a big blue button featuring a cartoon computer chip with eyes, mouth, arms, and legs. She'd seen it on television. DJ, too, was looking in the employee's direction. An androgen figure, short-haired and cute, despite having lines around the eyes suggesting they were closer to 30 than 20. And very wide-eyed, seeing a man without eyes and with cavities instead of ears standing at the wood's edge. Side piece turned, giving the employee a view of her midsection. She started to draw her gun, and the person bolted. She reached past the gun and up into her ribs, digging for the liver and digging into the liver. Pointed fingernails helped her to sever the connective tissue, and to get her fingernails in and around just enough that she could get a grip on it. When she tore it out, she felt the damage to nearby parts that were still connected by tatters and webbings of tissue. A second later, the wounds were puckering up, the liver drawing into itself to close up the damage, hardening around where the damage was worst. With a practiced throwing motion, she cast the gallbladder out and over the employee's head. It exploded outward without much noise, but with a visible puff of smoke and a spray of fluid, with a volume far exceeding what the tiny organ should have held within it spreading out over pavement and ice. That DJ didn't seem to notice suggested it was quiet enough that Breakthrough hadn't heard. The person stopped running before she ran into the caustic acid. They looked back to see what was happening, and Sidepiece aimed a pistol at them. Listen carefully, Sidepiece said. That acid's nothing compared to what I can do to you if I hurl something bigger at you. And I will. I'll throw something at you that will make you a greasy smear. The only way you live is if you listen. Not if you understand. The person nodded. Take your phone out. Drop it. The electronics employee did as instructed, pulling the phone from an inner coat pocket. The phone bounced instead of breaking, a protective case. Kick it into the acid there. Please. Now. The person kicked, but the traction of the case was enough that it barely traveled. Don't be fucking stupid, Sidepiece warned. I tried. I'll... It took two more kicks to get it into the puddle. You're going to reach into your car and move very slowly. You're going to drop the keys. You can kick them under your car. I'm being real fucking nice because the alternative is to destroy your keys and leave you without your car. The person obeyed. You're going to sit, all lights and engine off. You put your hands on the dash and you don't move until we give the say-so. Side piece made sure the employee obeyed. If you have to piss, piss yourself. You don't move a muscle. It was another few minutes, and another six cars, the new ones parking much closer to the mall, before any cars joined the cluster that were parked in the corner of the lot. It's the undersiders, DJ reported. Bunch of kids ran off. Going shopping, I guess. Adults stayed to talk. Figured, Sidepiece murmured. It's a meeting about fire. The undersiders set a fire to burn intel. Hmm. Sidepiece waited. Tidletail wants to protect sources, and Terrors is threatening to leak intel. Sounds like Love's thing, Sidepiece murmured. They're sharing info. Love Lost is going to love this. Love Lost screamed. The scream hit Nailbiter and several members of the patrol. That it hit Nailbiter didn't really matter. Nails was filled with piss, vinegar, and rabies, and having the dial set to ten on rage didn't change a lot. It made her more intense, aggressive, and focused, and far less likely to choose any option that wasn't fight more. It did the same to her enemies, but they weren't going to win that fucking fight. When they'd reported the meeting over, Sidepiece had messaged Love Lost. 
The response had been an address. This intersection. No elaboration. If she'd known it would be a fight like this, she would have hurried. Side piece adjusted her coat, pulling it open so the buckles came undone. She ran toward the thickest part of the fighting, raising her voice to a harsh pitch. Give me the word. Get him, Nailbiter shouted. That's two words. Nailbiter's fingers elongated, narrowing into rigid, sharp lengths, which scuffed the road near Sidepiece's feet. Sidepiece cackled. A patrol soldier whipped around, gun raised and kept spinning, as Disjoint's hand gripped him and shoved him. A judo move at long range. The guy stumbled into another soldier's way, nearly getting shot. Sidepiece reached into her coat and reached for another organ, her fingers sliding on thick tissue and the fluids that periodically dripped down from the upper half of her torso to the bottom. Her kidney, not a right kidney, that one was still growing back. Her left kidney was ripe, and the faint, sharp pains told her it was loaded. The sharp pains became something pronounced as she gripped the kidney and set to tearing it away. There was a sound like wet cardboard ripping, audible snapping as the congealed and hardened parts around old injuries broke away. Her right knee trembled with the effort and the pain, to the point she almost fell to the street. But then the last attachments broke, and she had her kidney in hand. She even gave it a brief shake for good measure, feeling the reaction stirring within, like the fluids within the kidney were coming to a boil, the bubbles pushing out through the solid matter. Run! Someone gave the order. A captain, who twisted around and aimed to open fire with their assault rifle. Disjoint fucked with their aim. They were already running, but they were running on a battlefield obstructed by their rage-filled allies, with parked vehicles here and there, and all of the other normal obstacles of a sidewalk, like mailboxes, trash cans, and trees. Those things funneled them. It was a question of waiting until they were caught, the naming for the concentrated mass, favoring the side with Captain that had just tried to shoot her. Aiming wasn't a guarantee, but her throwing arm was well-practiced. She lobbed it, and her timing was perfect, because it went off all over the heads of the crowd. On any ordinary day, the kidneys produced a chemical blast, concussive, congealed, and activated, like napalm with something more noxious instead of fire. That was on an ordinary day. Her kidneys were packed with kidney stones, which would have better been described as sea urchins that chose to dwell in the kidneys. Her power translated that quality into a kind of aggressive shrapnel. Ten people were cut down. Three of them hadn't even been in the radius of the initial detonation. Even on an ordinary day, most of her organs had another effect. The blood they shed and the bits of flesh they carved out were activated, much like her kidney had been. A smattering of smaller explosions followed the first detonation. Where blood had sprayed, it ignited burning like oil that had been touched with a lighter, brief but hot enough to hurt. "'You assholes are a mess!' "'No,' Disjoint said. "'You're hurting us more than them if you say it. "'You need to get organized!' Muscle came away in strips. Pulling out the stomach muscle near the spine made her thigh tremble. She flicked the strip out in distraction of a pair of people who were finding their feet. The explosion was smaller, localized, and put them down. Muscle was clean, too concussive to tear away chunks and cause a chain reaction. Nailbiter swatted at the stragglers, sending them sprawling. Sidepiece quickly pulled away another segment of muscle, nearly losing her footing as nerves got to her, and then flung it out as best as she could, straight into the mass. "'Can't stomach what I'm dishing out?' she asked. "'Stop, please, mercy!' Disjoint cried out from the distant rear of the fraca. She smirked. Three more patrol soldiers remained. They looked like leadership, and two of them had riot shields. Nailbiter was playing with her food now that the rage had subsided. A prod here, a poke, trying to get over, under, and force a continual retreat that put the patrol leaders further from their fallen friends. Nail, fingers and feet that had been sharpened down into singular points, stabbed the ground near the fallen. But by careful positioning or sheer luck, Nailbiter didn't stab anyone who was lying on icy pavement. She tugged out a knob of fat from between organ structures. Fat burned like blood did. With index finger and thumb and a bit of the enhanced strength that her hands and forearms had to help with the tearing and throwing, Sidepiece flicked the glob of fat. The fat made a sharp sound and splatted out into a thin slime, which promptly ignited. One plexiglass riot shield was on fire now. She kept one eye out for DJ's hands. She counted both wrestling with the commander's own hand and foot a targeted attack that was aimed at the one person without the riot shield. 
It served to separate him from the others, which exposed him to Nailbiter. But Distroit was occupied, which meant he couldn't do much as one of the men with the riot shields raised his rifle, aiming it around the shield. Sidepiece had to run for it, hurling herself to the ground. There wasn't much cover there. She was a sitting duck, and she knew she made a better target than some given her proportions. But she was near some of the wounded patrol officers, and the man with the rifle wasn't willing to risk hitting them. She hadn't even seen Love Lost start moving, but she saw the middle and end of the movement. A shape along the wall, hair and dress flapping, claws sparking as they hit stone and brick, and then the plunging descent, feet planted squarely on the captain's shoulders, driving him to the ground. She leaped forward from there, and her claws scraped the plexiglass riot shields as she slipped between them. Without turning around, she reached back to scratch both men. Ragged cuts, one at the side of the leg, the other from thigh to armpit. Lovelost panted as she turned around, surveying the fallen, her mask dangling with one side attached at the right side of her jaw, the other unclasped. The pants weren't normal ones, either. There was a note of something in them. Almost a whimper, or the pained intake of breath between screams. Except the screams had been a minute or two ago, not a second ago. With the attachment of the mask, she composed herself in posture, straightening to her full height. Her claws ran through hair. A stroke of the back of the hand smoothed out the dress. The look in her eyes took longer, wild, almost crazed, then calmer, a perpetual glare. Would it make your evening better to know we got some really fucking good intel? Sidepiece asked. Love Lost pointed a claw at one of the guns that lay on the ground. She held up a finger. That first. Got it. Sidepiece bent down to grab some of the guns off the men, seeing Nailbiter extend an index finger, threading through multiple rifles by the trigger guards. Sidepiece picked up an assault rifle and flung it into the air. Nailbiter stabbed out with two fingers. She caught the gun between them like she was holding it with chopsticks. Don't be a pain, Nailbiter said. Sidepiece winked. Nailbiter's index shortened until it could pass through the trigger guard, and then the two elongated chopstick fingers withdrew. We should call for an ambulance, TJ said. I'm not sure if you all killed any. Love Lost made a motion with one hand, claws glinting where they were mounted on her fingers. Calling, TJ reported, hesitating as he turned to the others. What do you think, three ambulances? More than that, Sidepiece replied. What happened? They came after us. We came back at them harder, Nailbiter said. Good thing DJ and I showed up when we did, Sidepiece said. Nailbiter gave her a look. It wasn't that Nailbiter disliked her or she disliked Nailbiter, but Nailbiter was a veteran, almost a decade under her belt being a villain. That shit hardened a woman. Nailbiter wasn't one to relax, play around, or laugh at jokes until she'd had drinks. By contrast, DJ wasn't hardened enough. He was here because she was here, and if pushed, he sometimes collapsed. He was figuring her out, and she was figuring him out. They made a good team because she could deal with numbers and he could trip up any one enemy. But even this shit with gunfire or shit like the Fallen, it wasn't as big as some of the shit they could end up getting stuck in. She wasn't absolutely sure he was fucked enough in the head to have her back when it counted. She missed Damsel. Damsel had been willing to let the facade crack to fucking smile now and then. Sidepiece had started to think it was all an act, part of the undercover op, but during the interrogation in the shed... She'd still seen those small smiles. Shit like that fueled side piece. It was rare she could meet someone and feel like she could take on the world with them at her side. She kept picking up guns. She wasn't done with Damsel, she decided. If the princess wanted to act proper and heroic, then side piece would find a way to drag her into the muck. There was a kind of romance in the mental picture of the two of them two beat up to move, bloody and dirty and the facades cracking, emotion pouring out. There was a romance to the scene, but a purely platonic intent, she decided. Damsel's ass was far too skinny for Sidepiece's tastes. Speaking of, they had a report to make. How did you know that Tattletail wouldn't pick up on us? Sidepiece asked. Love Lost looked over one shoulder, peering through red hair at Sidepiece. The hair had been dyed at one point, when Love Lost had been doing covert missions and had sought something more subtle, but it lacked its brighter tones as some of the dye was still there. Blood red, if anything. Love Lost Claw moved, tapping out something in the air. She slashed it into one side, 
as if it was a kind of punctuation. Sidepiece's phone blared with the refrain from an angst pop song as the message came in. Follow you, follow you into the rage. Other phones went off simultaneously throughout the group. Surveillance. Her head is bowed and posture stooped if her power is exhausted. Thicker headaches, Nailbiter said. Lovelost nodded, slightly shrugging one shoulder, still walking at the head of the pack, still without looking back. What's that? Sidepiece asked. If a person with brainy powers uses her powers too much, Nailbiter hissed the words, lisping the S's. Suffers for it. Saw it in the birdcage. Thinkers can't get the privacy to hide when they're hurting, and can't not use their powers when they need to hold their own. A weak point, DJ said. Love lost claw moved. Follow you, follow you into the rage, the phones rang. She will fake it to faint when she realizes we know. For now we time our moves. We weren't in that much danger then, surveilling. Love lost made a so so gesture. Her claws tipped at the air, poking at an invisible keyboard. Follow you, follow you into the rage, the phone's ringtone sounded. Put that on vibrate, Disjoint said. Sidepiece snorted. Camera tinker at danger. What is new intel? Camera tinker wasn't moving around much or using much tech, Sidepiece said. Disjoint elaborated. Half of what they were talking about was smoothing things over between some of the kids, either fighting or getting along too well. Chicken Little and look out. Look out, the sky is falling, Sidepiece said. Love Lost's expression had changed. It always did when kids were involved. She even changed her attitude when it came to Colt. They talked about where the major players are and who's involved. They have a good guess about the attacks that took the navigators and some of the advanced globs out, thanks to Tattletail. Love Lost nodded, very cavalier about that fact. Matter of time, huh? Sidepiece asked. Love Lost nodded again. Love Lost didn't like using the phones to communicate, which meant that half the time she was leaving things up for others to infer or guess. If someone could fill in the blanks, then Love Lost allowed it. Screw up too many times or put the wrong words in her mouth, and that someone would get sent to do a shit errand and kept out of the way. The inner circle mostly had it figured out now. Disjoint stayed quiet rather than guess. Nailbiter only guessed in the middle of a fight. She worked well with Love Lost in an all-out fight. They've been working out who's who. Shin's quiet. Teacher overreached and some of his mercs from Chiet are rebelling. Doing their own thing. Apparently, Bitter Pill isn't leading the thinkers from the point, Disjoint said. Love Lost typed in the air. Follow you, follow you into the rage. Nailbiter's fingers extended into points, perilously close to Sidepiece's throat. The scene remained utterly still for a few seconds. The phone started up its ringtone again. Follow you, fo the points of Nailbiter's fingers touched skin. Sidepiece set her phone to vibrate. Yeah, Disjoint said, looking at his phone. That's their best guess. Pill is the face, or a partner in leadership. Sidepiece looked at the phone to see what the guess was. Blue stocking. Lovelost nodded. She drew to a stop, then looked around. Trouble? Disjoint asked. No, not trouble, Nailbiter said. Love Lost pressed a claw to the fanged mouth that was molded to her lower face, covering nose, mouth, and cheeks. A single finger to mime silence. Her other claw went up in a stop position. The group was quiet and still as Love Lost extended a claw point skyward. Love Lost tilted her head. The hand came down, pointing, then motioned again, quick. Hurry, was the intent. The group hurried. Sidepiece's legs hurt from all the walking, especially the uneven walking through the forest, their shortcut to avoid being seen as they made their way to their vantage point at the edge of the mall parking lot. New security measures, extending her sensory ranges, and feeling out for tech. It takes a minute, Nailbiter hissed. They entered the hideout. Love Lost activated the door's locks, both mechanical and mundane. Break through knows you won't deal with them, so they asked the undersiders to. Undersiders know March is prepared for them, so they're asking Breakthrough to alleviate the pressure. Love Lost typed at the air. Sidepiece couldn't look at her phone as she was busy taking off her winter clothes. What are the Undersiders going to say to me? Nothing useful, since we know what they're doing and who they're working with, Sidepiece quipped. Love Lost shrugged slightly, her head moving in acknowledgement of that simple truth. Even distant friends of the fallen kid were off limits for alliances. They're supposed to tell you that Cradle is dangerous, 
He wants to kill you and take your power, and Love Lost moved her hand. I know. They said it before. They'll be more insistent. Try deals. They said the worst case scenario is that Cradle allies with March and then takes you out of commission. Second worst case scenario is you ally with March. Tattletail seemed pretty sure you wouldn't go after Cradle. Love Lost stepped into the living room, claws clicking against the floor, three at the toes, one stepping down from the heel, her feet encased in thermal stockings that extended up her legs. The moisture didn't seem to stick to any of it, wicking off immediately. Colt was lying on the couch and sprung to her feet as Love Lost entered. Love Lost gently pushed her back into her seat. A knife finger pointed at Colt, a warning. Sorry, Colt said. I tried. Disjoint continued. There was other stuff. Chase mercenaries and some follow-up on the portal or something that they're planning, but they didn't talk much about that. Mostly their focus was on teaming up and trading enemies, making sure March doesn't get in contact with any member of your cluster, and making sure Cradle doesn't steal the powers of another member of the cluster, was the response. Cradle stepped out of the kitchen. Sidepiece met Disjoint's eyes. Her hand moved closer to her midsection. Shit, shitty shit, shit, shit. They don't understand the most basic and fundamental truth when it comes to the Mall Stampede Cluster, Cradle said. Love Lost visibly winced at the mention of the Mall. Sorry, LL, but the fact is, if we're going to kill any member of the Cluster, it's going to be the kid, Cradle said. You don't need to worry. Love Lost nodded. Cradle, tousle-haired, wearing tinted goggles and a mask, looked as much like a kid as anyone, Sidepiece observed. But as irreverent as she tried to be in the face of an unjust, grisly world, she could read the tension in the air. She could shut up when absolutely necessary. Her stomach was doing flip-flops. Her pancreas was at that stage in its growth where each tiny growth made it twitch and flip up, then flop down, slapping lightly against the raw meat around it. I'm 90% done our second version, Cradle told Love Lost. I got peckish and decided to use the kitchen. I told your henchman there to sit on the couch and let me tinker together some snacks. So take that claw away from her throat. Love Lost withdrew the claw, her eyes narrowed. She started to type. Ninety percent because I want another scan, Cradle said. You gave me one of... his, I think it was? He was pointing at disjoint. Love Lost nodded. I'll get one of my own. The data you collect is slightly different from what I get. Differences in focus. Love Lost looked at Disjoint. So long as it doesn't hurt me any, Disjoint said. It won't, Cradle said. His smile was thin and hollow. Are we pretending that we're just talking about Cradle hurting Love Lost? He says he won't and we believe him? Sidepiece wondered. They suspect you. I don't know if you heard that part, Disjoint said, hurting the navigators. Okay, Cradle said. All the more reason to get version 2 up and running, and a bit more manpower. Love Lost walked over to the coffee table. Rather than pick up the files there, she speared them with claws, so each file was on a different claw point. She planted them on the counter island that sat in the middle of the kitchen where Cradle could easily see. Kitchen sink and hook line. It's a start. Are they forgiven? They can prove themselves worthy of rejoining us, Nailbiter said. Ah. Love Lost and I talked about it before, Nailbiter clarified. It's a start, Cradle said. The mercenaries we hired before. Money's tied up, Nailbiter said. I'll put some forward, Cradle said. It always bugged me in the cartoons when the villains had a plan that almost worked, and when the next Saturday morning rolled around, they tried something completely new, instead of refining the old idea. Are you a villain, then? Colt asked from the couch. I'm a planner. We'll hire the same people who did the job last time, and we'll use version 2 of the weapon. Love Lost started typing in the air, claw stabbing at an invisible keyboard. Cradle seemed to know what was being typed before any phones rang, because he added Love Lost's line. And if they don't want us getting in contact with March, I think that's exactly what we need to do. Love Lost nodded, claws touching her hair to brush it aside as she stood straighter. Arc 11, Blinding, Chapter 4 The schism remained. 
the shepherds, advance guard, wayfarers, and kings were absent. The room would have felt crowded if everyone was present, and it felt too empty with the more aggressive heroes gone. I wondered if there was ever a group size that would feel natural. We'd wanted to gather information. We'd asked for six hours, admittedly, and it was well past that deadline, but information was why we were here. Here was a room in a library where the lights were off because the grid had failed and power was being conserved, and the morning light from outside was obscured by snow that had piled up against the window, with frost cluttering every inch snow didn't touch. The light that came through was diffuse and mottled, dimmed and slightly blue, because the glass was solar glass that reflected the yellow and gold hues. Relay, Cinerol, Weld, Aleph Wolf from the Lone Wolf Pack, Lark from Auger, and Karyatid from the Malfunctions were all gathered around the room. I had Precipice at my right and Foil to my left. Mayor Jean Wynn was also present. Her presence in the room felt like a shadow when the room was already dark. The yellow of her shirt under her suit jacket was more striking than some of the costumes present. Foyle's hand rested on the table, fingers at the file folder with pictures. My pictures. The gasoline had saturated my office to the point that even the copies of my original files had a lingering smell to them. She turned the file so people could see. A distant image of Cradle, taken by way of flying camera, saved to a computer. I'd printed it out when trials had been happening. Tattletale says she's 70% confident that the attacks on the navigators were Cradle, who slipped custody when the prison was emptied, Foyle said. He had an unknown hireling use the device by proxy, and that hireling worked alongside Lionwing and two Case 53s. Those two aren't ex-irregulars, Weld said. But they're tied into the community. People have seen them. I've put out some feelers, but I can't promise results. Seventy percent certainty that Cradle is responsible isn't a hundred percent, Cinerol said. It isn't, Foyle admitted. Can we trust what she's saying? Relay asked. Are you asking if we can trust Foyle, or are you asking if we can trust Tattletale? Weld asked. I was asking about Foyle, but I'd like to hear your thoughts on both. Relay said. Relay was standing in for foresight after Brio had caught a bullet and while Countenance was leading elsewhere. Brio hadn't gotten back up. I was a little worried that Relay was closer to the leadership, which was about 25% personal bias and 25% that he knew I had my doubts. The rest was a blurrier mixture of my not knowing him and my instinct that Relay was driven more by emotion than logic. If Relay had made the call when the hero teams had split off into two groups, would they have stayed? I could see Relay's eyes move, studying me briefly before looking back to Weld. Foil and Tattletale. Where did we stand, and what answer could we give that didn't cross Relay's crude mind-reading? I was her teammate for a short while, I said. I like her. The nicest, only truly honest thing I could say. I had reservations and questions about someone who had heel-turned like she had. Foyle nodded, dropping her eyes, as if to acknowledge what I was thinking. Thank you. And Taris and Foyle were on my team when I was first leading the wards in Brockton Bay. I hold Foyle in high esteem. Weld said. Thank you, Foyle said, stoic, standing up straight, no longer with a hand at the files. Can I ask you why you're here, Foyle? Relay asked, head tilted so he was looking up at Foyle more than at her, his tone the sort that was best suited for quietly asking someone if they had a gun and if they planned to use it. The undersiders felt that if we were sharing information, we should have a representative here. That's not what I'm asking, Relay said. Foyle frowned. 
Her mask covered most of her face, but the shift in her lips was unmistakable. He wants a read on you, I said. Relay met my eyes without moving his head, then looked back to Foyle. I want to help, Foyle said. You believe Tattletail's information is good? Yes, Foyle said. But you have doubts. Not about the information? Relay asked. About your team. If I was a hundred percent certain, I think that would be more concerning, Foyle said. If you were a hundred percent clear you were on the right side, you'd be a fallen, Relay retorted. Precipice didn't move a muscle at that, but Relay looked at him all the same. But if your head is full of noise and contradiction when it comes to your team, that's almost as bad, Relay finished. I can do the most good where I am with the Undersiders, Foyle said. Relay, head still unmoving, looked down at his hand where it rested on the table. Do we move forward on seventy percent confidence? Relay asked without looking up. Cradle is a danger and he's done nothing to earn trust, Cineral said. He's done nothing wrong that we can say for certain either, Relay pointed out. He likes to bide his time, Precipice said. But there have been hints that he's doing business, I believe it. You're biased, Relay said. I definitely am, Precipice replied. Relay nodded at that, as if it was entirely okay now that the bias was out in front of things. He's cold and focused right now. I won't get into how I know, but I have a sense of him, like he probably has a sense of me and how I'm doing. He's dangerous. I could see a world where he's doing this, using tech to torture people like that. I cleared my throat. I had all eyes on me. The activities of Cradle seem to be only half of it, I said. It's a half I'd like to ask you all to please let us tackle. Us being who? Relay asked. What's the other half? Weld asked before I had a chance to answer. I drew in a deep breath. The Undersiders and Breakthrough will tackle the situation with Cradle. I think we have some sense of his motivations. Love lost, too. We plan to keep them separated if we can. In exchange, we're helping the Undersiders with a related problem. But the mercenaries are up to something else, and we'd like to ask you to focus some attention on that. Cineral still had that dangerous, intimidating thing going. She leaned back, looking very casual and very ominous, and she asked, How bad is this else? We don't know, Foyle said, but Tattletail is pretty certain that their focus is on the time stasis effects in Earth Bet's Brockton Bay. Tamika Shuli, Lee Pemberton, Tom Kahn, Bakuda's test run and one use when she was terrorizing the city. Jean Wynne spoke up for the first time. Alabaster, Jotun, and Dauntless. Leviathan hurled them into a time-stop effect when defenders tried to use one of Bakuda's leftover tinker weapons to stop him. Wanda Fowler, Sarah, and Paddy Martin. Henry Holmes. They tried to break into what locals termed the Scar, an ongoing cataclysm from a bombing run that had been made using more of Bakuda's leftover technology. They entered because someone had told them that the scar had veins of diamond, gold, and other rare materials inside it, where matter had transmuted to different forms. Did it? Aleph Wolf asked. That someone was right? Yes. Rumors got out while barriers to contain the effect were being put up. The workers saw things. Unfortunately... That area also had a lot of active dangers that hadn't gone off, settled, or stopped. The four risk-takers tripped an inactive weapon and were trapped by a fourth time-stop effect. Maybe they're still after that stuff, Aleph Wolf said. Times are tight. A big chunk of precious metals could go to some other dimension and pay for 
a lot of things. Get a whole city or the city through the winter. The Lone Wolf Pack was a band of heroes that were taking an especially Wild West approach, patrolling the periphery of the city and the surrounding worlds. They answered problems where problems came up, they teamed up when absolutely essential, which was mainly if there was a bounty to share, but they were otherwise independent. Aleph Wolf was exemplifying the the stick-to-the-basics mentality, as well as the group's heroic mercenary streak. I think it's more worrying than a cash grab, I said. Teacher and his mercenaries parted ways. If it was a question of cash in a really dangerous area, Teacher would put his thinkers and tinkers to solving the problem. He'd succeed, and he'd be in good shape. I can't see why he'd back off. The wardens were looking into those effects as well as the ongoing gray boy loops, Jean said. They researched it and decided no. The same people who petitioned the wardens then petitioned the government. It crossed my desk, but I already had some faint knowledge of what it was about. I considered, researched, and came to the decision that, yes, I know a way to undo the effect. No, I won't actually do it. Using her power, I thought. She could free people from perpetual torment, and she says no. Why no? I asked. It wasn't Jean who answered. Cineral gave me my reply. Thinkers say no. They're either drawing blanks or they don't like what they see. Nothing specific? No details? No, Cineral said. But if you look at some of the other major thinker blind spots, you're going to find yourself running into topics like Eidolon, Sleeper, the Endbringers, Valkyrie, the Island State, the Pastor Incident. Concentrations of power, I said. Jean shook her head. Complexity of power most often. Whatever thinker powers come into play with these cases, there's often too many variables to fully consider. Thinkers report that their powers are fuzzy, inconsistent, or blacked out. And it's not just the time-stop bubbles in Brockton Bay that are an issue? I asked. Jean shook her head. But Brockton Bay is one of the largest collections. Keep that in mind. And you don't know why? The thinkers can't shed any light on this? I asked. Little. You're saying you checked, you're saying no, risky for reasons you can't disclose. The wardens checked and they're saying no. The thinkers think it's volatile somehow. Yes, Cineral said. Volatile is a good way to put it. It might not explode, it might be devastating. Okay, I said. And for the record, I want to stress that teacher said no. He broke with his mercenaries from Chite because they wanted to go after this. Are the mercenaries after it because so many people are afraid to touch it, or do they know something we don't? I couldn't tell you, Jean said. Can you send me information on the victims? I will. Bakuda's victims, the three heroes. Not all heroes, I said. Alabaster and Jotun were white supremacists. I'll keep that in mind. Files on those two groups and the group in the bubble caught the group that snuck into the scar. I'll send you what others sent to me. Trying to wrap our heads around a problem that apparently even thinker powers couldn't tackle without running into blind spots. Daunting. I turned to the heroes, my eye mainly on Cineral and Relay. This wasn't an easy ask. We can't get directly involved until we've tackled Cradle, Love Lost, or some other peripheral things. If we can make headway in solving any of those issues, we should be able to converge on the mercenary problem from multiple angles. In an ideal world, we'll catch up with them from the flanks while you're approaching from the front. We'll do what we can, Cineral said, but we don't have many resources. More crime and incidents than we had heroes to send to them. The city was still on fire, and we didn't have the means to put every single fire out. 
When you say resources, you mean heroes, Foyle spoke up. Yes, Cinerol said. Do you have money? Are you hiring yourself out? No, Foyle said. But there are a lot of capes out there who are worried about the winter. Most costumed stuff doesn't pay. The guys you're dealing with are hiring mercenaries. This Order of Four, the Case 53s. If you're really pressed for manpower, we can send you a list of people. A mercenary we hire is someone the other guys can't, Lark said. I can look into that. We'll send you the list then. I can send copies to anyone else who asks. You can tell us if you know something about the potential hires that means they can solve a problem we have or if they're going to be a problem. I'll talk things over with countenance, Relay said. My gut feeling is that I'm worried you're getting mired in something personal while we're sticking our necks out with something that thinkers can't vet. If you have any suggestions or alternatives, I started. I'll talk to countenance, Relay stated. Firm. Final. He did with me what he'd done to foil, angling his head so he looked up at me more than he looked at me. The brow and a partial view of his eyes dominated his expression as a result. He took notes on a pad in front of him, as if he was leaning forward to write. But he still studied me. Nobody else was willing to commit with the largest and most influential hero team in our group that wasn't the wardens being unwilling to do more without checking with the boss. The wardens were too caught up in other things to dedicate themselves unless it was something on the scale of the prison or the fallen camp. But I was reserving hope that Cinerol would talk to others about the time bubbles. We'll touch base again soon? Weld asked. If you're approaching the same problem from two directions, you'll want to compare notes. I looked at Relay, who nodded. If we're getting involved in the time bubble issue... Relay said. But we'll meet soon regardless. Capricorn Red will represent us for the next meeting, I said. That was it. For lack of a better word, the room dissolved with everyone shuffling around, splitting up, or leaving the area. Weld signaled for my attention. You good? I asked Precipice. He nodded. Foyle? Foyle glanced at Jean, who was walking toward her. You want backup? No, I know what this is about. Old alliances and favors owned. Tattletale told me to expect her to show up and to expect this. I'm just the middleman. I'll stick around, Precipice said. I had to wonder if Foyle was happy like this, having to go out of her way to even collaborate with the heroes, and then being questioned when she did. I kept an eye on her up until I caught up with Weld who had retreated to a far corner of the room, mostly out of earshot of others. He seemed mindful of the other people in the room, his mouth shut. Relay was already gone, teleporting out. Aleph Wolf was just leaving. The moment Aleph Wolf was out of the room, Weld finally spoke. What do you think? I think if Alabaster is potentially a part of this, it's worth reaching out to the shepherds. Victor and Rune from the Empire are in the Shepherds now, under new names. They knew Alabaster, and they might know something about Jotun. He was small-time. Okay. Can you handle that? I asked. The Wardens are neutral, so you can talk to the other group without issues, right? Weld nodded. I hope the division between the heroes isn't straining things with Sveta. With different bosses it might, he said. We've been together for about three years, depending on how you define together. You were a big part in that. I smiled. I think we're okay there. Nobody's demanding that I make any hard decisions yet. Good, I said. I did want to ask something, though, he said. I don't... He stopped himself there. He stood with his back to the wall, the window beside him, and the texture and material of his skin made for a striking image. What's going on? I don't have a lot of friends that I can talk to about certain things, he said. 
I have my teammates, but few who have spent any amount of time around Case 53s. Is it about the Case 53s who are doing mercenary work? No, no, it, it's not that. It's more awkward. With that, I knew just what he was talking about. Ah, I get it now, I said. He didn't reply, and I didn't press. More of the heroes filtered out. Jean was talking to Foyle, with Precipice standing beside Foyle, not really joining in. She welcomed me home from my mission away with... affection. I'm assuming she talked to you about it? Yeah. She brought it up after? She seemed really happy. I didn't get details. Can I... He started. I don't want to put you in an awkward position, but I don't know who to bring it up with. Ask or share, I said. I get the feeling it'll do more harm if you don't. It wasn't good, Weld said. My heart sank. I love her, don't get me wrong. I was game to experiment and find something that worked, but none of it worked. None of it. Fuck. I said under my breath. My fingers dug into my arms. Damn it. Well put, Weld told me, sounding just as miserable. Can you communicate? Find a way? I saw Weld already shaking his head. I thought I'd play along to make her happy, like I do when she wants to experiment with food. We've had some small, tiny successes there. Maybe there could be a success to be found here. Of course. I spent a while thinking about it. I think I was wrong, thinking I could do that. I think each time I try to play along, it's only pushing me away. It takes what we can't have and pushes it into my face. I snapped my head around, looking at him. His forehead was creased, brow knit. Quicksilver eyes looked back at me. I know it's a fucked thing to say, but I like girls, and part of that is liking girls' bodies. Sorry if that's TMI. I haven't had one of these conversations with anyone. I shook my head. My heart was pounding in my chest, as calm as I was trying to appear. I feel like a traitor even saying it. Saying I've entertained thoughts about breaking up with... I stabbed my finger at his shoulder using the wretch to give that finger the power to push his heavy metal body. I pushed his shoulder into the window's frame, indenting the metal and damaging the wood. Ow, he said. He blinked, metal closing over those liquid silver eyes with etched irises. Actually pretty close to feeling pain there, ow. That registered. Breaking up? I asked him, my voice hard. It crossed my mind after the other night, and the nights since. I know that makes me the scummiest hypocrite, saying I'm not sure I can date a Case 53 when that would disqualify me in a lot of people's eyes. I dropped my finger. No, I said. You're not. You don't have to lie, he said. I'm not. You don't have to date a Case 53 any more than a black person would have to date another black person. That's a screwed-up mentality. It's different, Weld said. Being black is the most normal thing in the world. Being me, being Sveta, being Chantilly or Gentle Giant, it comes with complications. If you were disabled, you would not be obliged to only date disabled people. Weld shrugged. With his broad shoulders decorated with melted fragments of metal, it was a pretty dramatic movement. You can say that, but I still feel like a hypocritical scumbag. I don't think you're a hypocrite. I do think you're a bit of a scumbag talking about dumping my best friend. Weld nodded, with enough fervor that I felt bad for being hard on him. I want to do right by her. I mean it when I say I love her, but that love gets confused. Confused? It's there, but I don't know if it's the love I feel for the woman I'm going to marry, a girlfriend, a best friend, or even a... 
He didn't finish the sentence. He was being really open. Maybe more open than he'd been with anyone except Director Armstrong, at least with this stuff. But he didn't finish the sentence. It's like trying to compose something and skipping out on the vocals or the strings. Percussion would be a better metaphor, I said. I didn't smile as I said it, and Weld didn't smile as he heard it. There's no workable physical aspect, and I want that aspect. I folded my arms. Weld did much the same. Fuck. Fuck, 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 fuck! At the other corner of the long conference room, Jean was leaving. Precipice and Foil hung back, talking with one another. Fuck it all. Fuck. Fucking, why did this have to be so hard? Precipice shot me a curious look. Foyle walked past him, and for a second I thought she was walking around the table to approach us, interrupting the conversation. She was walking to the window, though, still at the far end of the library's conference room, looking down toward the parking lot, then out at the city. Precipice indicated a portal in the distance, cutting into the sky. I'll make you a deal, I told Weld. Please, anything you can offer. If I could feel sick, I think I actually would feel sick over this. You tell me before you do anything. You promise me you will, and you keep that promise. Because if you do something like break up with her on impulse, it's going to be worse. Weld nodded. And I swear, if you tell her the actual reason why, I will tear your arms off. How do I do that? Weld asked. I want to communicate, be honest that it's not all that great, and try more avenues before claiming defeat. Not that there's many more, but she's not stupid. She can connect the dots, if that's the big issue we're wrestling with, and then I break up with her without explanation. He'd talked about feeling sick, but I was the one who felt that way now. Poor fucking Sveta. The deal, I said because I couldn't answer the question that easily if addressing it directly, is that you warn me in advance if you make a decision. I'll be there for her with ice cream and my shoulders ready to cry on. Okay, Weld said. I'm not sure I'm there yet, the decision I mean. Second part of the deal? Figure out a way that explains it, okay? That makes it not about her lack of a body or physical incompatibility, because that will annihilate her. Yeah, Weld said. For that, you need to take time, and you need to give me time. Let me research, let me ask questions. We've looked at a lot of options and possible power interactions, Weld said. Let me research, I said my voice terse to the point that it was almost hostile. Then I will, Weld said. Okay, how long? A month, two, month and a half? I shrugged. Already I felt more like I was buying time to stave off devastation than I felt any hope that I'd stumble on a solution. Victoria, Precipice called out from the other end of the room. We'll be outside. I twisted around, looking down at the parking lot. Trouble? He shook his head. Getting organized. I'm going to load some stuff into the car. I should go, I said. Thanks for being a friend, Weld said. You know, if you break up with Sveta, meet a gorgeous girl, and break Sveta's heart again, I'm obligated to throw you into the center of the Atlantic Ocean. Weld winced. Sveta's dished on my weaknesses, I guess. Hmm? Not really. Fear of mine. Through the stratosphere, then, so long as it's ignorance and not maliciousness, but I don't think you're that kind of guy. Weld shook his head. What you do is your choice. You don't have to stay with her, but you have to be gentle. I don't even know if I will go through with it, Weld said. It's just thinking. The idea of making her genuinely happy makes me happier than anything. 
Even imagining that I might make her sad is making me more miserable than I've been in a long time. I put my hand on his shoulder. Go, he said. I'll go after the shepherds, distract myself by talking to some vaguely familiar and probably hostile faces. Victor and Rune. I slid the window open, then flew through, heading for the lot. I shut the window behind me and floated down. Fuck, 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 fuck. Precipice and Foil were just now reaching the ground floor. I waited for them. Rain indicated the dumpster at the edge of the street. Metal for roofs, fencing and power tools that had been thrown out because they'd been made cheap in a time of need and they hadn't been made to last. He'd spotted all of it when we'd pulled up to the library. We loaded as much as we could fit into the trunk. Foyle used her power to slice some pieces of corrugated metal into smaller chunks. We climbed into the car. The driver turned on the engine, but he didn't pull out of the parking spot. "'What's going on?' I asked. He held up a note. There was still tape at the top. I didn't even get a chance to read it when the passenger door opened. "'Scoot!' I turned to look. Rain was shifting to the middle seat. At the open door, Imp was climbing into the car. "'What were you doing?' I asked, trying to sound more casual than suspicious and unsure if I was succeeding. I was usually better at that, but... conversation with Weld. "'Went with Mrs. Wynne. When she was done talking to us, she got on her phone to talk to her hubby and some guy called Balminder. "'And?' This Balmander guy has cauldron vials. We talked about how Tats said there were Case 53s at the attacks. Mercenaries, right? Yes, Tattletail said. Both groups were assembled in the hideout, with only Rachel absent. They'd decided it was time to call her. Sveta sat beside me, very still as she watched Imp. They were talking out loud about whether their vials could be responsible for the new cases. And? Sveta asked, her voice tight. And they think no. Both teams and a collection of the heartbroken were assembled at our headquarters. I'd thought earlier about how the conference room had felt too empty, but how it would feel too full if everyone was present. This was that weird middle ground, I decided. Not a middle ground where the porridge was just right, but one where it was both too hot and too cold. Fucking uncomfortable. Chicken Little had a pigeon in his hands, and Kenzie was fitting something around its neck and chest. One of the heartbroken, Candy, I was pretty sure, was sitting on the edge of Kenzie's desk, feet propped up on the back and front edge of Chicken Little's chair. Dark hair braided close to the scalp at one side, the rest left as a tumble. Darlene knelt on the floor by Chicken Little, holding the cage with more birds inside. Others were scattered around the room. Some boys were in Chris's old corner, having found and started up some of his old games. One had been given to Kenzie. It wasn't a video game player, but a scanner. She would dismantle it later. Older Heartbroken were scattered in with a trio of mercenaries and were managing some of the remaining Heartbroken. A 17 or 18 year old with really long wavy hair was stepping on a leather whip she'd wound around one girl's hands, keeping the hands pressed to the floor. Eerie to think about where they came from and how very dangerous they were. A hell of a lot of emotional firepower. On the topic of firepower, Ashley was present, sitting on the floor with her legs tucked under her. When we hadn't been sharing info as a group, she had been talking quietly to the little girl that was Kenzie's age who had her hands bound by the whip. Perrion and Foyle sat on plastic cases with perishable foods inside. Tattletail stood off to one side, a healthy distance from the dangerous little ones, looking at various screens. New cauldron, same as the old cauldron, Sveta said. They have less resources and they rule Gimmel, Tattletail said. 
different mission statement now, from getting through the end of the world to surviving the aftermath. When you put it that way, you make it sound like they're on our side, Precipice said. New cauldron, same as the old cauldron, Tattletail said, indicating Sveta, who she'd borrowed the line from. Doing things that everyone should be unambiguously on board for, and making every enemy possible along the way. Great, I said. Countenance and I exchanged a few texts while we drove back. Relay gave him a quick recap and he reached out. He sounds... Undecided? Byron as Capricorn asked. On the positive side of undecided, agreeable but yet to say he's sure he'll do it. They'll try to look after and stall any plans for the mercenaries and what they're planning with the time bubbles. If we catch up or figure out why while we're dealing with the mercenaries' allies, we use that info to help them wrap up. We can't focus on the mercenaries and stop whatever it is they're doing? Foyle asked. We don't have leads on them. We do have some loose leads on Cradle's business dealings. Places Love Lost's people have been seen, people they've hurt, and some last known whereabouts of March. We go after them, then, Byron as Capricorn said. All at once, after one target? Coordinated strikes, Ashley said. I don't know, I said. I like the focused attack better. Our goal is to keep them from achieving their goals or our worst-case scenario. A focused attack guarantees we take the most problematic person out of the picture. March, Foyle said definitively. I drew in a slight breath. You don't think so, she said. Again, a statement, firm. We're supposed to be cooperating, I said. The best order to remove threats would be to remove one of ours, one of yours, another one of ours. It gives the best odds that we see this through. Or we coordinate, Ashley said. The kid on the ground was inching closer to her while she focused on us, wriggling and twisting until her arms threatened to dislocate, just to get closer, gnashing teeth. No need to worry about order if we're going after all of them at once. Capricorn shifted from Byron to Tristan. I think coordinated, he said. It's faster and it means we can support the other groups. Even if we fail on one front, we have better odds of keeping them from uniting. Doing what you say, Victoria, and keeping them from achieving any goals and meeting up. I glanced at Tattletail. Don't look at me, she said. I'm here to collect information, because it's warm, and we needed another place to go while March is hunting us. You have some of my mercenaries. You can ask me one favor. I may refuse it, but I'm not getting involved personally. I need to conserve strength. You can be... Foyle started. Parian pulled her back down to her seat. I can be such a bitch sometimes, Tattletail asked. At least I'm up front about it. I think we should split up, Imp said. Coordinate. I had my reservations. Still, sometimes with groups, a mediocre plan that everyone was on board with was much better than a fantastic plan with disgruntled people and people who had no idea what they were doing or why. I nodded. Let's get organized to hit them all at once then, I said. Three groups, three raids on March, and the two members of the cluster. Arc 11, Blinding, Chapter 5 The joints of the spider limbs were higher off the ground than I was, the body headless and featureless, an uneven, almost potato-like form in the center. It was all black, and it moved with a fluidness that stood in stark contrast to the jerky, twitchy way that spiders normally moved. It flowed more than it walked as it moved to the base of a building, found purchase on windowsills and gutter, 
As it carried itself off the ground, Foyle skipped up, stepping onto one of the eight limbs, walking up to the next. She had no handholds, not even the ones another person might have if they were there, because both of her hands were full carrying her crossbow, an entirely different make and model than the one I'd known her to use once upon a time. Bigger, heavier, and it would have to be mounted on a surface to be set up and then fired. Spider legs appeared and disappeared beneath her feet in what should have been something a third of the way to being stairs and a third of the way to being a ladder, not all of the way to being anything. The distance between Foyle and the ground grew. You're hesitating, Foyle called out. If you pause, I'm going to miss a step and fall. You're making me nervous, Parian called back. Talking about you falling makes it worse, not better. Trust me, Foyle replied. I trust you. I don't trust powers. Not mine, not yours, Parian answered. But the third utterance wasn't at a volume meant to reach Foyle. Foyle ascended to the roof of a three-story building, ducking as the cloth and knots spider passed over her head. Parian visibly relaxed as soon as Foyle was on solid ground again. Past the eye hole of the cracked doll mask, Parian's eye focused on the spider as it restricted its movements to the visible edge of the building. What little focus wasn't for the spider was for Foyle. The funny thing is, you guys got off easy, Candy said, for trustable powers. None of us got off easy, Parian said. Powers are meant to hurt, cause harm, and foment chaos, according to Tattletale. The things that handed out the powers wanted to put us in situations where we'd have to use them on each other. Even the tamer sets, like foils. Shots that could penetrate anything, enhanced accuracy, and enhanced timing. Foyle's powers did come with a march attached, I remarked. Parian nodded, pausing to look around before returning her focus to the rooftop. It's never easy. There's always complications. Some got off easier than others, though, Precipice said. True, undeniably true, Parian said. But easier still isn't easy. I like that distinction, I said. If you want easy, you don't have to look any further than my sister, Candy said. I mean it in the most affectionate way possible. So long as it's coming from a place of sisterly love, Chastity said, reaching out for Candy's cheek to pinch it. Candy fended her off. We were walking at a brisk pace. We'd broken up the groups, and the reasoning for why we'd broken it up had me thinking about my early thoughts in the days of breakthrough. Wolves, corn, and chickens. A man who needed to take all three things across the river, but the wolves couldn't be let alone with the chickens, and the chickens couldn't be left with the corn. We'd had concerns that the undersiders would act in good faith. Having some of our team in each group meant we could keep an eye on everything. Breakthrough was a six-member team and we had three bases to cover. Two Breakthrough members were assigned to each team. The Heartbroken were more volatile as more of them were gathered into a single unit. Heartbroken were thus split into three groups and family dynamics seemed to factor in there. Siblings were separated and kept together, depending. From there, it was a series of rules and complicating factors. Tattletail was insistent that Chicken Little was grounded and shouldn't be allowed to enjoy hanging out with his new friend Lookout. That meant Lookout was assigned to another team. Swansong went with Lookout by apparent default, and the feral child Florence went with Swansong. Imp went with Florence, because she was the best at handling her, and initial attempts at negotiating this had met with stubbornness. It was a team with far too many wolves, but those wolves seemed content with the status quo. That was despite the fact that Swansong was on a team with Imp, and pretty goddamn resentful of the fact that her nice home now smelled like gasoline— a smell had soaked into the floorboards and furniture.
They'd wanted to go after Love Lost, working on the assumption that Love Lost didn't like hurting kids and it was a squad with a lot of kids in it. Swansong knew the people Love Lost liked to associate with, and Imp had the ability to resolve problems before they started. The problem was that when things went wrong, they stood to go very wrong. A single rage scream that hit Swansong was too much of a problem. Cradle was too much of an unknown, and the Undersiders had wanted Tattletale on that particular unknown for her limited involvement. I had a projector disc with me. I brought it up, tapping on the side. A group of small, holographic figures appeared above the disc, tinted yellow from head to toe. An arrow at the disc's edge indicated the direction to them with a number showing distance. They were gathered in vehicles, but the vehicles weren't drawn as thoroughly as the people who sat in them, much like the mercenaries that accompanied them. Three heartbroken, Chicken Little, Sveta, and Capricorn, with Tattletail along to gather some intel and make sure the kids were all right. They were tracking down Cradle. They were mostly silhouettes, but I could make out details like how one of the heartbroken was resting a head on Chicken Little's shoulder, apparently asleep. Chicken Little was moving his hands like there was something in them. A bird, I assumed. I ran my finger along the disc's edge. The image shifted, and the group of people were tinted red. Many of them were small. Imp, Florence, Too Heartbroken, Lookout, and Swansong. They'd watch March, gather surveillance, and maybe have Imp take action, but they wouldn't take any direct moves until Hellhound caught up with them. They okay? Perrion asked. Looks like it, I said. The images were stable. Different groups were talking. Calm, no fighting. If you're talking about my cousins, they're never okay, Chastity said. She was seventeen or so, with wavy black hair and makeup fully on point. I'd noticed Precipice noticing her cleavage. It seemed wholly intentional with her wardrobe choices, a low-cut top worn with a scarf and coat, unzipped enough that a strategic triangle was visible. Had to be cold, but she endured with an unwavering, teasing smile that made me uncomfortable. Relatively, Perrion said, still watching Foyle and the spider. Relatively? It's because they're relatives that I know they aren't okay, Chastity said. Such a dork. Candy said, before switching to French to better articulate that lameness. Candy was a smaller version of her older sister. She had a similar teasing demeanor, from what I could tell, but without the flirting aspect. Chastity retorted with something else, so rapid-fire that I couldn't even tell where the words started or stopped. The Kenzie-aged Candy's response was sharp, and sounded weirdly religious. I wasn't sure if my mind was seeing faces in clouds, putting meanings to foreign words that weren't there. There was enough violence in the words and enough of a glittering look in the young girl's eye that I felt the need to say something. Do we need to step in? Don't even try, Perrion muttered under her breath. No, Chastity said. Not unless you want to wash my sister's mouth out with soap. Please do, Aroa said from the sidelines. She was similar in appearance to the others, but her hair was straight, and there was no smile on her face, no particular frowning or coldness either. Her eyes were animated, her glances always sidelong, never direct. It would be funny. You can help, Candy said. My dork of a sister needs to get laid. Can't help you there, I said, trying not to sound as uncomfortable as I felt. Your teammate can. Precipice! Candy raised her voice. Ah. Uh, Please. She gets more annoying and immature every minute she doesn't have anyone, and I'm the one who has to deal with it. Ah, uh, Precipice said again. He looked at Chastity. Sorry. 
No need to say sorry, Chastity said, touching his arm. My sister put you on the spot. But if you did want to say yes, you could count on my discretion and a complete lack of any strings. Just don't fall in love with her, Candy said. Yeah, don't fall in love with me, Chastity said. It's weird getting this offer, Precipice said, knowing who you guys are. Heartbroken. Heartbreakers. I would have thought you were sympathetic coming from a bad place, Candy said. I looked down at Candy. Tattletail told you? Uh-huh. That's not great, I said. We don't mingle with society or have a lot of civilian friends, Aroa said. We aren't going to leak your secrets because we stick to our own. You haven't even seen my face, Precipice was telling Chastity. Back out, Precipice. Parian said. Drop the topic, walk away. If she has advice, it's good to take it, I advised him, giving him an elbow to the arm. I bumped the metal under his sleeve. Precipice nodded. I get a sense of people around me, Chastity told him. It's clear enough for me to know proportions, and I like your proportions. I sighed, loud enough to be sure he heard it. My breath fogged in front of my face. Now it's weirder. I'm flattered, I think, but also very weirded out, Precipice said. Okay, Chastity said, sounding like she was having fun, even while being turned down. I can tell how flattered you are, same way. It even makes me stronger. So this teasing, it's good battle strategy, you know. Maybe, but just so you know, I have someone I like, Precipice said. Precipice, Parian said, warning. She started to turn around, then her spider slipped. She twisted around and caught it at the building's edge. Someone you like? Chastity asked, edging in closer, her arm touching his. They were wearing jackets, but still. Love, I think. Precipice, I said. Don't tell them that. Don't share that information, especially when Parian is warning you. Trying to keep my partner from falling off a building, Parian said absently. You might be in more danger, Precipice. Uh, noted. What if I said that made me more interested? Chastity asked Precipice, nudging him. What if I said I was intrigued now that you already have someone you like? Sorry, he said, in a vain attempt to disengage. Does that mean sorry, no, or does it mean something completely different? Chastity asked. Can you leave him alone? I asked her. I could, but I'm going to wonder what he meant, and I'm going to end up assuming the worst. Safest bet, Aroa said. Men. Precipice, against all sense and sanity, opened his mouth to explain. I'm flattered, but even if it wasn't really weird, even though she and I aren't together and might never be, stop sharing information about your love life with people who call themselves heartbroken, I said. I turned to the younger heartbroken. No offense. No, no, you're totally right, Candy said. Yeah. Precipice said. He managed to stay silent for two fucking seconds before telling Chastity, I can't mess around, at least for now. I'm not doing anything in that neighborhood. Oh. Chastity squared her shoulders, eyes forward, in the direction we were walking. Sorry. If you'd given me another answer, saying you were willing to betray her or betray those feelings you have for her, then I would have found a way for you to be hurt in any of the upcoming fights, Chastity said, her tone still light. Really badly hurt. I looked at Parian. She shrugged and nodded. Great. Good to know, Precipice said awkwardly. I fucking told you not to engage. Now I'm disappointed, Aroa said. 
Chastity is one of the last family members on my bucket list to see go all out. Candy poked her cousin. You're such a Juliet, wanting our mouths washed out with soap, wanting poor Precipice to get all four arms and both legs mangled, or whatever it is Chastity has in mind. Juliet wouldn't want anyone's mouth washed out with soap. She'd want your mouth washed out with bleach, Aroa said. I don't think that's as big a difference as you're pretending. It's the biggest difference, Aroa said, with maximum condescension. On and off. What's the fun in kicking someone in the tits, pushing them down, or setting them on fire if they're cold and dead? Or if you kill them and that's the end of it with no potential for the future? True, Candy responded. I've got your back. Chastity was telling Precipice. Whatever happens, I'm going to protect you and protect those feelings now. We'll get you back to this girl you like. I don't know if anything's going to happen there. It's complicated. I rolled my eyes. Maybe he needed to get stuff off his chest, and for some reason was deciding on this venue. Unrequited or complicated sorts of love are still love, and love is the most important thing, Chastity said. Without it, there's no point to anything. It was dawning on me just why Tattletail had looked so damn exhausted when I'd seen her the last few times. Above us, Foil whistled. Parian was making the spider form a bridge. Foil was halfway across that bridge. Very deliberately, she put the folded-up crossbow down on top of the spider. She pointed at it. The crossbow disappeared as cloth wrapped around it, attaching it to the spider. Foil bowed, flourishing, before skipping up the spider bridge to the next rooftop. She's such a ham sometimes, Parian said. Ham can be nice, I said. I was glad to get away from the other discussion. Ham can work. I think she's happy, hanging around with heroes again, old teammates. Good, I said. We need to do this more often. Why not always? What keeps you with the undersiders? Resources. I still have family who need medical attention, Parian said, quieter. Ah, I remember. I'm sorry. Sometimes you make deals with the devil because the alternative is not dealing at all, Parian said. You've been with them for how many years now? Four and a half. And you still refer to them as the devil, huh? I asked. Parian snorted or sniffed behind her mask. The material distorted the sound and I couldn't see her face to know which it was. Don't try to convert me, she said. Life's too complicated as it is. Okay, no conversion. We walked in silence for a minute. Chastity was still engaging with Precipice, but it seemed a bit safer than before now. More normal than I'd seen her act, now that she wasn't aggressively teasing and flirting. I like your costume, Parian said. High praise, considering who it's coming from. I'm nobody special. Who made it? she asked. Me, teammates. Weld did the metal decorations. There was a pause. Her head turned, caught between watching out for foil on the rooftops, managing her spider, and looking at the metalwork. Do you think he'd do work for pay? I can always pass on a message if you want to ask. I might. It would be nice to stay in touch. Look how much fun she's having. I couldn't quite read into body language or see what Parian meant. Maybe if I'd known Foyle for longer, I could have seen a difference. As it was, Foyle crouched on the corner of a rooftop. She held her hand out. Stop, Parian said, quiet. We collectively stopped. Foyle moved her hand, sweeping motions, directing us to one side of the street until we were at the base of one building, Foil one building ahead of us and five stories up, barely visible in the gloom. We weren't that far from Lyme. In the midst of a crisscrossing of new roads and multiple buildings in progress, 
there was an area that wasn't accessible by car. This was the result of putting together the reports we had from other heroes and Tattletail's knowledge to hone in on the area Love Lost was working from. I'm going to talk to Foyle, I said. When Perrion nodded, I flew up to the roof. Are the heartbroken behaving? Foyle asked me. Precipice is getting a lot of attention, I said. He can't keep his mouth shut. Is that a power one of them is using? Yeah, Foyle said. Fuck, I said. Chastity's pretty, Foyle said. He's red-blooded. That's the power I mean. Seemed like more than that, I said. When that didn't get me much of a response from Foyle, who was scanning the area with her eyes, I asked, Why did we stop? No man's land, Foyle indicated. See what I mean? I did. We were inside the perimeter where ongoing construction, parked vehicles, and unfinished roads were limiting our access, and within that vague territory, there was a swath where the buildings were girder and beam surrounded by fenced-in lots. It's all open space, I said. There wasn't much in the way of cover. No way to get from A to B without being seen from a block away. Even the scant lighting to illuminate the road seemed more like it was meant to help highlight any incoming cars or catch people trying to sneak across the road in one of the five to ten times they'd need to do so to get to the center. Three, maybe four buildings that they could be camping out in, Foyle indicated, a dart in hand the gleaming point serving to point. Do any of the heartbroken here have the ability to sense emotions? No. Chastity senses bodies, but not at a distance that helps us. Aroa has to engage. Candy doesn't get anything. Keep an eye out. I'll be right back. Foyle nodded. I had a glimpse of her face in profile as she surveyed the area and I could see an enviable kind of focus and calm there. Jaw set, eyes slightly narrowed and alert as she looked for hints in a collection of half-built neighborhoods. I dropped to the ground. The others were very still and somber, except for Aroa, who looked pleased, and Chastity, who had a hand firmly on Aroa's shoulder. What happened? Aroa happened, Chastity said. I told the truth. It's not fair if you're getting only half the picture. Love is the most important thing. I looked at Precipice, then at Perian. It was Perian who supplied the details. She said the reason love lost is so upset is because Precipice killed someone she loved. Fuck me. These girls were such nightmares to wrangle. I was now in full agreement that having all of the heartbroken in one place would have been too much. It eats me up inside, Precipice said. I didn't kill them by acting. I killed them by not acting. Growing up with the fallen, Chastity asked, do you think that absolves you? No. Good, she said. It doesn't. I've killed someone by not acting, too, I think. A lot of people, probably, Candy said. The one I'm thinking about is when you were young, too young to remember, Chastity said. Mom? Chastity nodded. Daddy was tired of her, and he thought I was old enough to look after you and revere. He pushed feelings into her head. He didn't want her sharing evidence, so he made her scared of people, any people at all. She wouldn't be able to speak because she was so freaked out. He said he made it so she'd be happy, so long as she was totally alone and there was no civilization nearby. I'm not sure if Daddy was saying it to get us to stop crying. Probably, Aroa said. Yeah, and you wouldn't just say that, right? Chastity asked Aroa. I've told you, if you want to nettle people, you have to give them hope once in a while. He probably wasn't lying, Candy said. He didn't need to go that far to make us stop crying. He'd just make us stop. 
Yeah, Chastity said. To Precipice, she said, I could have said something or stopped it, I think. To save my mom from being sent away like some dog in the movies that's driven out to the wilderness and then left behind while the car speeds off. I remember that day, Candy said. It wasn't like that. It's a simile, little sister. Candy shrugged. My thing was different, Precipice said. I was older, and it was a lot of... Don't, I interrupt him. Don't work to convince them to hate you. He folded all four of his arms, two flesh and two mechanical. Was he so reflexive in trying to own up for his mistakes that he'd make enemies by admitting to them? I wasn't even sure what the right decision to make there was. We've got a wide area out there that we won't be able to cross without being spotted. Not if we go across. Over? Precipice guessed. Or under, I said. If you look, you can see where the piping is being laid out, where the road doesn't cover it all yet. I see it, Precipice said. I'll make a hole then. Silver blades appeared in his hands. Wait, we should coordinate, I said. Call first. Precipice checked his phone. I checked the disc with representations of each team. Tattletail's team was hunkered down, apparently working on tracking down Cradle. Tattletail was also supposed to be able to keep an eye out for any pointed dangers or incoming attacks, which meant Capricorn and Sveta should be safe or safer for as long as that activity took. I really wished I knew the particulars of her power. A glint caught my eye. Foil's dart, embedded on a piece of paper. There wasn't anything on the side of the paper I could see, but it was yellow. Danger, Perrion said. Aroa, Candy, Chastity said. Get back. Be good until you absolutely need to step in. Another dart, another slip of paper. This one was red, so close to the first dart that the two squares of paper that were embedded on the dart seemed to line up. No need to clarify. I flew up. The others dashed to where there was cover nearby. We were only at the fringes of the no-man's land, and the buildings here had fences, backyards, and piles of broken-down crating tied together with twine. The crates had packaged food from off-world. Below, headlights illuminated the street. The noise the car's tires made changed as it shifted from squeaking on contact with snow to grinding against salt and gravel, then near silence as it touched ice, moving smoothly over the surface the winter tires gripped. They paused in the street and people inside the car shone flashlights out the windows. Here we were, the patrol. On the rooftop, ten feet from where I floated, Foil was at the spider's side, setting up the large crossbow so it was mounted on the spider's back. Did they spot us? she asked. Looks like a routine patrol. Foil was silent, leaving the crossbow where it was and heading to the edge of the rooftop to look down. Below, the car went on its way. I drew my phone from my pocket. I'm going to have them go underground. Approach the buildings you pointed. Give me a minute to text them. Wait, Foyle said. I waited. The car that had passed returned. It stopped somewhere close to where it had the first time. Again, flashlights shone out the windows. I could see someone leaning out. That's not a patrol, Foyle said. Most people who are doing a perimeter check don't check and recheck themselves. They do the bare minimum, and then they get on with their nights. Applies to some heroes that patrol. Learned that when I overheard some villains a year back. Doing a single loop so as soon as the hero has come and gone, the criminals can come out of the woodwork? That's really dumb, I said. It really is, Foyle said. Back when I was with the New York wards, we'd mix it up every night, doubling back, doing loops. 
It helped that we had the bikes, and it was an excuse to ride down subway tunnels and around any place without cars. I smiled. I fly, so same idea. It's easy to cover the same ground if you move fast. Gonna give my spider a pet so Perian knows I'm all right, Foyle said, backing away from the rooftop's edge. I kept an eye out. Keeping my arm and the glowing projections out of sight of the ground, I checked the others. Both of the other teams were staying put and doing things, but it didn't look like they were fighting. Below, a shift in the light's movement caught my eye. I let my fingers drop away from the projection disc and focused on what was happening, or, in this case, what wasn't happening. One beam had stopped moving. I heard raised voices. Fuck, they got caught. What's going on? Foyle whispered. I mimed for silence. A car door opened. A man stood on the seat of the car to better look over the top of the vehicle and came into the avenue between two buildings, one of which was the building Foyle and I were standing on. He added the light of his own flashlight. A woman, the driver, was saying something. I tried to hear, and I couldn't make it out. I could have flown down, but I didn't want to risk being spotted. I tapped one ear while glancing at Foyle. She shook her head. Below, the car drove away. The man who was standing on the seat swung back inside. I could see the gun he held as he did. The door shut as the car rounded a corner. The spider helped Foyle drop to the street level. I watched to ensure the coast was clear while she started, then dropped down, getting to the group's hiding spot at the same time she did. He saw Candy. Precipice said. I thought the coast was clear. Why did they come back? Candy asked. They had some sense that we were here already. It could be a device or power, I said. Love Lost can detect emotions, but it's not that long a range, I don't think. And if he saw me, why didn't he do something about it then? I don't know, I said. He could have decided to play it safe. For now, let's do the same. We didn't plan to pick a fight this soon. The other teams need intel and time to get where they're going. We run, Precipice said. We can stick to the same plan. I make a hole, we use the drains and sewers. Ew, Candy said. Once we're down there, we can decide if we want to go to one of those houses to investigate and see if we can't spy on Love Lost, Precipice said. Hurry, I said. Precipice created silver blades and drew out a five-sided hole in the ground. I flew up to make sure there weren't any more cars full of armed men and women, then flew down, slamming into the Pentagon. Water splashed below. Ew, Candy said. In the distance, I heard a thud, then a laugh. Hurry, I told them. I had a sense of who that thud belonged to. They were willing to pass the buck because they have enforcers. They're coming after us with powers. They hopped down into the tunnel, chastity and precipice helping. Another thud. A jovial bellow. That's not Love Lost's group, I said, keeping my voice quiet as I talked to the others in the hole. I moved aside so the spider could slip down beneath. Mercenaries, precipice said. Villains banding together because the heroes are. High above us, a shape moved through the air with enough force that it made the air shudder and cheap windows rattle in their frames. Lord of Loss, I said. I ducked down into the hole. The heartbroken already had their phones out, screens glowing and flashes on. Foyle and Perrion had flashlights they could clip to their costumes. Precipice's mask glowed, the red illuminating to become pink. That does not work nearly as well as I hoped it would, he said, and he sounded pissed. The glow died and he pulled out his phone, doing what the heartbroken were doing. Behind us, Perrion's cloth snake slipped into the hole. Come on, I urged, toward the houses. 
To find us, Lord of Loss would have to spot the hole in between two house lots. Not impossible, not easy either, given the lighting and the glare of snow contrasted with dark pavement everywhere. Then he would have to find which way we'd gone. I was betting he would assume we'd headed away, not deeper into the territory in question, toward Love Lost. The cloth spider and my flight kept the group from having to wade in freezing ankle-deep drain water. We covered good ground, too. There were surprising amounts of materials and piece of construction material to trip up anyone who moved fast enough that they couldn't react to the fleeting glimpses of whatever the flashlight illuminated. There weren't many things that got in our way or that the spider had to slow down for. A wheelbarrow with a broken handle a collection of what looked like curtain rods or wooden poles. I checked the disc. No whole figures, body parts everywhere, scattered into the air, into terrain, all tinted yellow, Tattletail, Sveta, Tristan, Chicken Little. What? I breathed the word. I checked the other team. More scattered parts, suspended in air, unmoving, flickering like the hologram couldn't track them. Imp, Ashley, look out. No, it wasn't possible like that. Not two teams at once, not so easily or instantaneously. I checked my phone. The display was flickering slightly. I thumbed for a message to Precipice, the alarming picture on the disc still hanging off of the disc at my forearm, mounted like a buckler. Check your phone, I told Precipice. A text? he asked. From me, I said. He shook his head. I tried two more times. I heard the one go through. He held it up for me. Gibberish. We're being scrambled. Shit, he muttered. Even with the word being scarcely a whisper, the drain carried the sound. Could be Tinker Tech defenses keeping Lookout's cameras out of it. Maybe, I said. Candy's phone flickered, and then both screen and flash went dark. The other two phones died simultaneously, plunging us into the darkness. It was only because of that darkness that we could see the faint hue of pink. A glow, like light through a curtain, and the sides of the drains were curtains. In the silence, as none of us spoke, I could hear a dull sound, a hum with no source, and I could hear chiming, discordant, struggling to find its rhythm. Nursery. The images on the disc were getting scattered further, blinking in and out, each reiteration putting body parts further and further from the source. The mode switched, and I could see that there were symbols, large and blunt, that Lookout was trying to transmit. The noises of Nursery's power effect were getting louder, and they reverberated down the drain. The effect was taking hold too, distorting the tunnel. No slurps and wet noises yet. On the disc, there was one last projected image I could make out. Three large arrows pointing at a single dot. Three forces converging on one? I had the impression that it wasn't the signal to mount our coordinated attack. No, this was too emergency alert with the big bold symbols. The humming and chiming swelled, the chiming finding its stride with more coordination, less discordant, now more disconcerting because the off notes were spaced far enough away to catch the ear off guard. One of our teams was being attacked, and we were stuck against a brute strong enough he wouldn't go down unless he was permanently put down, and a shaker master nightmare I most definitely did not want to fight on her turf. The disc was flickering to the point that it was off nine seconds out of every ten, and nonsense the last second. Even with that, the broken-up models that put heads seventy feet from the associated bodies were an ominous warning of what was at stake. 
I had to assume the worst hadn't happened, because the distorted images I was getting from the disc put body parts in mid-air and had a computer glitch kind of logic or arrangement to them. They knew we were here. They had prepared with stalling tactics and organized assault against one of our groups. They had the device responsible for the navigator's incident, and they had the willingness to use it. Arc 11, Blinding, Chapter 6 It had been a long, long time since I'd fought with any musical accompaniment. Glory Girl had worn headphones for a little while to fill the silence while she patrolled, and because she hadn't been one to have a back and forth with the small fries she was taking down. Mom had put a stop to that. Situational awareness was too important, she'd said. Now, the music box chiming came from nowhere, and the dull heartbeat thud was a percussive element overlapping that. Other sounds creeped in, but it sounded like they were mostly above ground. It didn't quite come together as a complete musical piece, but that gave it more effect, not less. Situational awareness was in full effect now. Don't touch the walls. I said, as we hurried down the storm drain's tunnel. About two hundred feet ahead of us, there was a section that was open to the air, where the upper half of the drain hadn't been laid in yet. The mist that Nursery's power generated was coming in hard, rose-tinted and distorting the surroundings. Where it was heaviest, especially around that open air, it was rewriting things. Curved walls became hallways with straight walls perpendicular to the floor. Water with a paper-thin sheet of ice atop it simply terminated, not flowing into the lower ground where there was no water, just stopping. It's not an illusion? Perrion asked. No. Localized reality overwrite. Reality works differently in her nursery space. Don't touch the walls. Don't touch the floor where it's fully changed. And if we run into her, remember that area effect powers don't tend to work in the rewritten area. I don't know if my powers are area effect, Precipice said. Mine either, Candy said. Let's not fight her on her turf and hope we don't have to test it. Parian, can your snake be a bridge where the effect is most intense? Yeah, I can handle that. But I'm really wondering what happens if we touch the walls or floor? Perrion asked. Hopefully nothing. But I've read reports of bad things happening when people got stuck in her shaker effect when it's most intense. Like? I looked back at Candy and Aroa. I don't want to scare you guys. Our daddy gave us fear for breakfast, Candy said. I was so young, I'm not sure I would have even been in school then. You would have, definitely, Chastity cut in. Okay, but I don't remember much from those days, and I remember getting chocolate-frosted fear bombs for breakfast. What the hell are you talking about? Aroa cut in. Stop interrupting! Sacrament! It's metaphor! It's dumb, Aroa said. What are you saying, and is it important? I asked. Daddy made me scared when he wanted me to stay out of his room. He made me happy as a little girl getting a puppy on Christmas morning when he needed me to clean up some baby barf to de sweep. My skin crawled. I don't remember much, but I remember those moments. Don't look down on me, the girl finished. She was still jogging along the side of the column periodically slipping where the sloped wall on either side of the water was icier or slimy. Chastity was fully in the water, and whatever contention the sisters had, Chastity was there to support her younger sister and keep her from outright falling into the damp. Fine. 
As the power saturates a place, containers will fill with her power. If containers don't exist, they'll appear on their own. One thing that can happen is that you touch a wall and your hand goes through it like it would go through wet paper, and there's something living on the other side. Or the floor. You said we have to watch the floor, Parian said. Yeah, but there isn't much we can do about that, I said. The way powers tend to prioritize things, walls will be a problem before floors are. How do you know that? Parian asked. Studies, I said. PRT research, classes. There's a whole mess of research into why people like Shadowstalker from our hometown didn't fall through the floor to the planet's core. Precipice was typing on his phone while using it for light. He aimed it at the floor, nearly tripping as he kicked a bit of ice crust on the top of the water the others hadn't already broken up. Chastity caught him. Before straightening, he aimed his phone at the ground. I could see that he'd modified it, with a chunk of what looked like battery with wire wrapped around it mounted on the top. Scanning? I asked, quiet. Trying. I used Lookout's numbers as a model. Our... that other Tinker's scanner we found earlier, I looked at that, too. But it's mostly noise. I don't know how to use it yet. Okay, I said. You're right, he said. Walls are more intense than floor. Good to know, I said, my expression serious. I put a hand on Parian's shoulder as I passed her. It's probably going to be a little while before we need to worry about stepping into a hole. Let's get out of here before it's a real problem. Good plan, she said. I nodded. I flew ahead. As tense and borderline sick as I felt, my gorge not in my throat but definitely ready to go there, I felt a bit happy that my little bit of cape knowledge from a paper I'd skimmed years ago had been relevant and validated here. Feeling sick with mixed feelings did provoke another thought. Candy talking about emotions is reminding me, I said, fibbing about the source. Precipice, we need to figure out how you're handling your power in a fight. Friendly fire. Ah, shit. Last few times, it's been a problem. Nothing big enough, it's changed the outcome, but it came close. Sorry to bring it up here, but... But if you didn't, you might forget, or it might change things now. It's fine. Sorry, I said. I can take my lumps. It's about all I'm good for a lot of the time. You've got a lot of good points, I said. Don't undersell yourself. What's the power? Chastity asked. Shame and regret thing. I've been meaning to figure it out, so I've been trying to use it more often. The music box sounds were fading, but the thudding was heavier. I wasn't sure how to interpret it, but there was enough of a distinction in play that I was pretty sure there was a pattern to be deciphered. You used it at the hospital, Candy said. Yeah, on its lowest setting. I thought it might help make you guys go away, he said. He was holding his phone up to the wall as he jogged by it the top and bottom thirds of the screen filled with numbers, the middle section showing a graph. Sorry. Apologize when your power actually does something. You used that emotion power on us. I'm trying to figure it out, he said. Let's stay focused, I said. We're close to the hole, so keep your voices down. Right, Precipice said. We'll figure your thing out, I told Precipice when things are calmer. I'm happy to help, Chastity said. Oh, uh, sure. Thank you, he replied. We edged closer to the place where the drain was empty. The mist was flowing down from the street above, and the entire area had changed. No ice, no water, just walls with peeling wallpaper, floor that might have been hardwood and scattered children's blocks. Parian's snake slithered past us, the knotted material sloshing through water and ice on its way to the area, then scraping against the floor, depositing moisture on the surface. As we drew nearer, ready to move across it, the walls pressed in. 
They were wallpapered, but there wasn't any wall behind the wallpaper. Something fat and wet like a tongue pressed in, moisture blotting out to color the surface as it bulged. The thudding from behind the walls was evident in how the fleshy bulge throbbed. All with one singular heartbeat. Foyle had her rapier out, pointed at it but not penetrating, while the others hurried forward. Precipice was one of the last to cross. He held up his scanner, aimed at the bulge, then passed his hand between scanner and bulge. He startled a bit. Go! I hissed the word. He wasted no time. The thudding from behind was mixed up with added impacts as Lord of Loss touched down somewhere not too far away. We hurried down the drain tunnel, putting the effect behind us. Lord of Loss is close, I whispered. As I floated to catch up with the group, I saw Foyle and Chastity look back at me. Familiar with him? Shapeshifting breaker, Foyle said. Big, brutish. Repeated motions are more effective, I said. That's always the case, Chastity said. Find what works and keep doing that. It's more the case for him, I assume, Precipice said. He's got size on his side, too, Chastity said. Precipice turned his head, giving her a long look. Chastity's face was barely visible, with none of the flashlights aimed directly at it, but I could see the smile. We're close to the first building that we thought might be theirs, Precipice said. If we're going above ground, we should do it further down the street here. There might be a side tunnel. Good, I said. Nice work keeping an eye on that. Lookout stuff, not mine, he said. You did figure something out with your stuff, didn't you? I asked. Your scanner picked something up. He turned to look at me. He nearly tripped a second later, but Chastity put a hand to his shoulder. Yeah, he said. He raised his phone and tapped the screen with his thumb. The feed of numbers and movement of the graph changed, changing from red on a black background to yellow instead. He scrolled, and the readings went backward in time, flowing the opposite way, tinting green as they did. Means nothing to me, I said. There's something haptic in there. Sense-sharing, binding biology, not all that different from what I do with the tactile feedback pads. Yeah, parasites. The tongue in the wall infects you? He asked, with a note of alarm in his voice. Oh my god, Parian said. Yuck, Candy said. Basically infection. I said, trying to sound as casual as infection warranted. Sure. She's lying, Candy said. Fucking fucker emotion readers. The ones who weren't Dean sucked. I shot Candy a look and Precipice noticed. What the hell, Antares? Precipice asked. I need accurate info for my scans. Fine, we'll talk about it later. Your scans don't matter until we get back to your workshop anyway, right? It's not like you're calibrating anything in the field. He was a grim kind of silent as he jogged along. The tinkling music box chimes had come to an outright stop. The thudding persisted, but it was more general and dull than it had been. Less of a sound like someone banging against the walls, less of a heartbeat, and more of a distant pounding. Not that we had walls here, per se. The storm drain was a concrete tube with iced over water in the bottom tenth of it, and a whole lot of dirt and pavement in the area immediately around it. Assimilation? Precipice asked. No, I said. Can we drop it? Let's hide out, figure out what we're doing, figure out which of the teams is being targeted, and then mobilize. Hopefully without ever having to deal with nursery again. Is it a lotophage thing? Pulling people into a specific themed dream state? Fuck me, Precipice, I said. You can't let it go? I'm stubborn. It's the only thing I really have going for me. Knowing would help me interpret my scans. 
I can potentially use this. Then, again, I'll explain when we're back at your workshop. Foyle cleared her throat. I'd like to know. It would help to counter it, Perrion said. I didn't want to talk about it because it bothered me. I didn't want to picture what it involved. That gorge was closer to being in my throat now, to the point that it hurt to swallow. Not assimilate, not exactly infect, not whatever you just said. Lodophage? Lotus Eaters? The Odyssey? Precipice suggested. I never read the Odyssey. Only got what came up in adaptations, I said. I paused. Impregnate. Uh, what the fuck? Precipice asked. That's the theme, I said. Close to infect, really, but... What the fuck? he asked. I'm not good with the ick, Foyle said. The Dalltown victims were almost too much for me, Perrion knows. I'd always prefer riding Perrion's dolls instead of bitch's dogs. Wouldn't anyone? I asked. Not bitch. Not a few other people, believe it or not. You asked, now you know, I said. We won't let it get that far. How far does it get, worst case? Precipice asked. Surgery, I said, to stop the cycle. Get everything out of your system. But she doesn't like taking things that far, so she holds back, I think. Authorities came after her in her apartment at one point, and one guy got it bad. She got away because people were trying to help him. Fuck me, Precipice said. Absolument, Chastity added. I'm a little scared now, not gonna lie, Candy said. We'll stay clear, I said. We're close to the house, Precipice said. He pointed. He paused after pointing, then created a blade of silvery light. Problem? No, he said. Just realizing I'm an idiot. Just realized my blades shed more light than my phone. Not idiotic, I said. There's always a learning curve, and you've got more powers to figure out than most. Precipice led the way, venturing down a side tunnel with a much steeper incline. There was no water or ice on the underside of the tunnel, which was a nice upside, but I did have to position myself to keep others from sliding or falling. Precipice checked his phone, then looked back at me, his blade a hair away from the wall. Quiet, I asked. Chastity, can your body sense detect people? Not much further away from arm's reach, Chastity whispered. Okay, I said. Candy, the lie sense, that doesn't have any application here. Figuring out if anyone's above us? Candy snorted. She doesn't have a lie sense, Chastity said. She has a hallucination power. We went over our powers. I just called you a liar, Candy said gleefully. You seemed a bit hesitant, so I tried it, and it totally worked. Aroa put out a hand, and Candy slapped it in a little high five. I clenched a fist. Roll with it, Foyle said. You won't win. It's not worth the fight. You can't discipline them. You just guide. Chastity was nodding, even though she was one of them. You got me, I said. Yep, Candy said. Emotion powers usually have some feedback aspect to them, or emotion reading. Often, she said. Not me. Okay. Because you said yours was emotionally charged hallucinations, if I remember right. I have a certain amount of juice that refills over time. I can push it into people. Can't dodge it, can't stop it. Makes you see, hear, feel, taste what you like most in the world— Except it maps to everything. Makes you sick of it really fast. If I push in a lot of juice, then it's a lot of seeing things and hearing things, tasting things and feeling things, and it takes forever to go away. By the time it does, you'll never go back to liking that thing. Or person, Aroa said, 
or food or experience. Nathan wouldn't let me play with his game consoles, said they weren't for girls and girls should stick to fucking, having babies, cooking, and cleaning. I hit him with a full tank of juice because... For five days, he was living his video games, and now, after, he can't even look at a screen or touch a control, even for TV and TV remotes. He can't do much now, Aroa said. That's his own fault, and it's not all me. But I don't get to see whatever it is. I just know they're juiced, and I can tell where they are because I can feel the juice while it's stirring in someone else. Which isn't actually juice, Chastity said. Energy. Yeah, Candy said. Alien, too much happy stuff. Don't use a full tank on anyone here, okay? No matter how dire the situation is, no permanent effects, I said. Can't anyway. If I'm full up, then I start brimming over and affecting people around me. I wouldn't do that to my cousins or anyone like Chicken Little or Lookout, Candy said. I find people to dose. Okay, I said. I didn't want to think too much about what that would look like. You couldn't push some juice up into the space above us and see if it hits anyone? Good idea, but no. I pulled up the disc, then turned it on. The distortion wasn't what it had been, less bad. People were intact and moving. Both groups were in a hurry. The image distorted here and there, fluctuating. My phone had no service. We checked with Precipice sending me a text. Again, there was too much distortion. Nursery's effect is still here. I think that's why we're having trouble connecting to the rest of the world. Precipice said. She was here earlier then, Foyle said. Or close by, I drew in a breath. I can't imagine them staying put here while the others are on the move. Three active teams converging on one point. Let's get up there and see if there's anything. It could be an empty house. The occupants could be out there looking for us. Let's go. Let's make a hole and be ready for a fight. Got it. Precipice said. The blade touched the wall. A square of silver light was marked out. I punched it, wretch active, then flew to the side. It came down in pieces, the concrete pipe wall, then the gravel and compacted dirt above it. I could see the wood and plastic covered insulation where the exterior wall of the house was. I signaled, made sure the other heroes were with me, then flew forward, busting through. I moved quickly, as soon as I was through. Two wall, then another wall, floor, hallway, another room. The place was occupied. I saw sleeping bags. I saw food. A pile of construction supplies had been made into a makeshift desk. Footsteps behind me. Foil. Precipice was right by her, heading another direction, blades glowing in his hands. We fanned out throughout the house. Empty. Precipice, Foil, and I found ourselves in an upstairs room that had most likely intended to be an office. We chose it not because it was central, but because it was undeniably Love Lost space. On one of the desks, a series of bars, rods, and blades were arranged, laid out on paper with lines scratching out in something that looked halfway between an engineering blueprint and calligraphy. The layout made it clear what the assembled package would be, one of Love Lost's claws. It looked like the claws were meant to extend into whips, which would go from razor-thin to being fifty or a hundred ring-shaped razor segments compacted together into a covering over each finger. There were computers, I noted. There were planners. I paged through one planner. Careful, Foyle said, as Precipice opened one laptop. Tinker means traps. It's true, I said. I can scan, he said. No guarantees, but it might turn up something. I nodded. He slid the laptop closer to me, pulling out his phone. He attached the bulky scanner over the open socket where the camera had been torn out. He swept it over the computer. 
I watched as he went over the entire room, periodically going back to Love Lost's gauntlet. He typed something out, then held out the phone. It beeped as it swept over the gauntlet. How do you distinguish a trap from regular tech? I asked. She's working from a similar starting place to me, Precipice said. If I see something like what she makes, it should stand out like... A word in English in a jumble of random characters. Traps can be mundane, Foyle said. She used a dart to penetrate a locked cabinet that was part of the desk, then stood as far away as possible using her sword to open it. Empty. She approached the area with the laptop. Precipice put out a hand. He brought his phone to the computer. As he did, it beeped. He rummaged for a bit before finding an attachment at the side, a fake side panel. When he pulled it away, needles spilled out. I wasn't sure exactly how it was supposed to work, but it looked ominous. They were barbed. Oh, Foyle said. Seems like the kind of thing she would protect, he said. He gave the room a once-over. Foyle fidgeted. Let us work here. Precipice said. You focus on downstairs. Take my phone. Check for traps. If it beeps, call me. Foyle nodded. I let the laptop Precipice had opened boot up. It showed a login screen. Password protected, I said. Do you have a hacking thing like Lookout does? No, Precipice said. Try father's daughter two zero closing parentheses number sign. Chevron instead of space, no apostrophe, capital F, capital D, capitalize all vowels. I typed it out. I showed him. He nodded. I hit enter, and nothing. A checkered scarf forever. Capitalize each word, all vowels. No spaces this time. Are you sure you don't want to do this? Well, let me finish the sweep. Try in the meantime, if that's okay. Or leave it, and I'll get to the computer. I think this OS sends an alert to your phone if you get a certain number wrong. She sets it to alert her phone if someone gets one wrong. It's fine. If we pull her away from whatever she's doing and get lost before she turns up, that's good, right? I nodded. He walked me through the next password. A checkered scarf forever. The computer hung. The OS came up. Immediately I set to work. I brought up the wheel menu, went to the browser, and opened it up. There's a password vault, I said. I need a single password to get things to autofill. Rain took over. I saw her on this computer in some of the dreams, before our trigger. She still has it. She doesn't look at her hands while typing, but I can feel what she types. After a couple of days of doing research with Aaron and getting practice typing myself, it started clicking, he said. Muscle memory. Her muscles, kind of. I could figure out what she was typing. The characters came into my head. She likes the long ones for things she wants to keep secure. The checkered scarf one is long, so this might be even longer. We could bring it with us instead of stumbling through. I pointed at the bottom layer wheel. There was an icon. Location tracker. That can be worked around, Precipice said. Flip some switches, wrap it in tinfoil. I'd feel better just not worrying about it, I told him. Can you? I can try. He tried four variants, using no spaces, then chevrons instead of spaces, then moving on to another phrase. While he worked, I checked the disc. The scenes were distorted, but it wasn't as bad as before. I could make out figures reasonably well, enough to tell something from body language. Yellow Team was scrambling, but they didn't look like they were running for their lives. Nobody limped, nobody was shouting, and when they came to a stop, they did so collectively. They would be the ones closest to Cradle, if things weren't more mixed up than I was assuming. Tattletail was talking, and Chicken Little was nodding, hanging on her every word. They set to running again. Red Team was looking more stressed out, but they were doing less. They weren't running. If anything, 
I imagined them hunkered down in a fortified area. Swansong turned her head to shout something. The issue was that it was a thirty-minute trip to get to either of the other groups, assuming my team drove. I could fly there in a shorter time. The question was what I could do to help in the now that might help them enough that they could last another thirty minutes. The password manager lit up. There was a list of everything the password manager had unlocked, except Love Lost used code or a shorthand only she understood. Leather, leash, quartz, cat claw, pitch, pigeon. Quartz drew my attention because it looked like there were six quartzes running from quartz zero zero to quartz zero five. I right-clicked it and found a go to location option. I hid it. The folder it took me to had a read first file describing the program it was meant to be used with. The six quartz files were six halves of encryption keys for six drives that were supposed to be plugged in. I rummaged and I found them, a case beneath a set of screwdrivers. Opening it up, I saw a set of small storage drives, each in a brushed aluminum case with a single cord laid out in the middle of the package for connecting the drives to a computer. That wasn't what was especially important right now. I put it aside. Leather, family albums, photos. I didn't want to browse. This wasn't a priority either. But I saw one photo highlighted because there was a preview in the sidebar: a red-haired woman with a red-haired daughter, an Asian man with a shaved head and a cigarette perched in his mouth. There were others of her with friends or family members, of her on a beach, of her in a uniform receiving an award. A real person, a person with a past. I shivered. It bothered me more than it should have. I didn't want to betray secret identities quite like this, but lives were at risk. People were crossing lines, chopping human beings to pieces, and letting them suffer. Leash was the location tracker. Having the admin password let me open it. While it was on, I could see where Love Lost's other tech was. Her phone was on her person, and her person was very close to Ashley's group. I sent a warning. We could pack up, Precipice said. Disable it. It looks like disabling the location tracker means neither device knows where the other is. There's no way to control it, so we're off, but we can watch her. Still. Let me work a second more. There has to be something we can do to alleviate the pressure on the others. I said. I trust you, he said. Cat claw, tinker notes, scans, files, images, villain stuff. There were communiques there. Nothing we could use for the current situation. Pitch, an online wallet. Thirteen thousand dollars sat in the account. A transaction list showed a long list of transactions with nothing identifying the recipients or reasons, only amounts. Just a matter of hours ago, sixty thousand had been moved from her account elsewhere, twelve thousand to one account, twenty-eight thousand to another, ten thousand to one account, ten thousand to the same account the twenty-eight had gone to. Each entry had a set of options by them. I moused over, looked over my shoulder, and saw that Foil and Precipice were behind me, looking over my shoulder. Yes, I asked. Any objection? I don't know if it's going to do what you think it will, Foil said. But sure. I hit contest. A bubble came up with a list of options around the radial. Service not rendered," I said as I selected the option. "You think it's the mercenaries she paid for?" Precipice asked. "And I'm guessing escrow," I said, "to go through when the job is confirmed done." "That makes sense," he said. He looked at the numbers. "Being a villain pays." "Considering it," I asked, trying to sound casual, as tense as the overall situation was. 
as not casual as the possibility of him turning to the wrong side might be. No, he said. It costs, too. I nodded. I went down the page and contested everything. I was twelve options down before I was redirected to another page. Account suspended. That might tie up her ability to act for a bit, I said, and maybe it'll give mercenaries out there in the field second thoughts. Scary, Foyle said. I'm going to go check on Parian and the Heartbroken. I came up to tell you we already found cash and weapons. Good, I said, but she was already leaving. I looked at Precipice. I have a guess what Pigeon is. I opened it up. An encrypted email client. There were already three warnings in the inbox about the online wallet. I looked at the most recent exchanges. Ryan, I said. I opened it. A back and forth about mercenaries apportioning cash. Who paid what ratio? Love Lost had done the fundraising. Ryan was doing other things behind the scenes. A Jonathan was mentioned in passing. A lot of talk of knights, whose knight it was, a room, precipice. I looked over at precipice. Yeah, he said. Communiques with Lord of Loss. I am happy to do this level of work because I trust you. A job done is reputation. <laughs> get the job done, get the pay, build rapport. Woohoo, lol. My thinker has a good feeling about this. <laughs> wow, I whispered. That's more horrifying than nursery's power. No kidding, Precipice said. Nursery was at least somewhat sane. I sent Lord of Loss and Nursery messages. I had to check Love Lost's typing style before crafting it. Job complete. Pay withheld for now. We'll discuss. Vacate Lime as wardens are investigating villain presence. There was a pause. If they called, demanding answers, then there wasn't much we could do. But if they didn't, it was a potential chance to take two capes out of the equation. There were already two angry emails from mercenaries. One was Lion Wing. The other was an encrypted handle. Apparently, their accounts had been frozen by my interference with Love Losts. That seemed like an oversight to me, but the economy was fragile and nascent, and what they were working with looked like a system built upon layers of trust. A third angry email contender. My enemy with his personalized no-powers arena. I paged through quickly. I had to go back a week to find it, the anti-parahuman group. Love Lost had correspondence with them, setting up a meeting. Twice she asked them to meet in person, and she was rebuffed. They didn't want to meet a dangerous parahuman, even if they were armed which meant the Lime Center, the anti-parahumans having weapons, and a few other terms. It meant Love Lost told them her objectives. I have two enemies who need to die, both parahumans, then I go. Border world. We are at your disposal in time of need, but we do not interfere. I rest. You know my story. When the flame of my revenge burns out, I rest. She can't. Precipice said. I don't see it. I can't envision her if she isn't brimming with rage. Who's the second parahuman who needs to die? I asked. Precipice shook his head, but he didn't respond. Cradle? It's possible. I scrolled down. From Drisky Winker at Gimmelnet. A simple question. How can we trust you will go? There is nothing I can say to convince you. You know me and my face. The city is lost already. If you want it, you can have it. If you want help, I will grant it at any time. Give me arms to hold and claim my corner, to secure my rest. I will give and will grant in exchange arms, ammunition, I slit two throats. 
then you are rid of the worst of us. The city is lost, I said. She said this four days ago? Another message from Drisky. Why do you think the city is lost? You sound mad. Mad and maddened, yes. But my partner Snag tries to communicate. I listen. He is far away and he is close, dead and alive. He shouts at me from the bottom of a well filled with the power of a destroyed alien world and I hear echoes of whispers. He says the city is doomed and he tries to explain why and I know it is true. Is this mad you can work with? We meet and we talk. You bring all the soldiers you want. I will give you no trouble. This is guarantee. Phone me. That was all there was. Fuck me, Precipice said. You're saying that a lot. Fuck a lot of this. I nodded. Nothing I could use. No sign the anti-parahuman groups were in play. If they were, we'd have to deal with them. But it was something. I looked around and I found paper. I scribbled down a note. What are you doing? Precipice asked. A note. We have her family photos on this computer. I know you and her are at odds. I know she's threatened your life, but I don't want to play it that way. Take illicit money? Screw up her deals with murderous mercenaries? Fine. But if she wants the photos, I'll send them to her. They aren't hostage. They aren't part of a deal. There was a pause while I scribbled it out. Precipice was silent. I underlined not hostage on my note. Is that okay? I asked. Precipice nodded. I penned out a final line. I said it out loud as I wrote it. We want to talk. Breakthrough. I underlined it. The willingness to talk, to communicate. If we couldn't get there, then there was a very real possibility that Love Lost was on our short list of people to trap in an alternate world, not disclosing to anyone what we'd done with her. Just too angry, too violent. Even in talking about rest, she talked about guns and claiming her corner. She talked about being mad. She thought she could take thugs like Sidepiece and Kitchen Sink and drag them off to a corner world where they wouldn't bother anyone, and she could wrangle them there? I just didn't see it. We'd have to talk it over with others. Try talking to her first to see if any middle ground was possible. I closed the laptop and took the cords. There was a messenger bag that we could slide it into along with the other things, including the storage drives. Precipice took the claw whip framework that was meant to fit over a hand. It's not set up with location detection? Nothing my scanner sensed. Maybe there's a ping it responds to, but for right now I think we're okay to bring it. It'll be useful. I nodded. I'd trust him in this. This thing with love lost, the cluster, and the dynamic, I knew he was well versed in it. Are we good to go? I asked as we headed down the stairs. I paused as I saw the cash that was gathered in bags. The pile covered a countertop that could have had three medium-sized microwaves set side by side, a mix of currencies. There were, I noted, three traps— Two had the barbed needles. The other had something like a spring-coiled version of the claw lash that Precipice had stolen. All three had been demolished. Foil's power, it looked like, stabbed through and fusing it to the internal components before the shelf or drawer was removed. Fuck me, being a villain pays, Precipice said. It really does, Chastity said, winking at him. There are villains who build rep by doing something big, I said. Go after a big hero and win, pull off a major job. They have ups and downs, but the ups are big. The undersiders are an example. Fair, Parian said. She was in the kitchen, rooting through the cabinets. There were bricks of drugs wrapped in plastic, most no bigger than a clenched fist. Heartbreaker would be one of those, Chastity said. She packed up the cash, filling bags. 
precipice went to help her. He had some low lows. Yeah, I answered. The other kind of rep is the kind that comes with the record, having done fifty jobs and not having any losses under your belt. Lord of Loss is one of those. He doesn't take big jobs, but he doesn't have anything he's done that counts as a fuck-up. Why not make him fuck up? Aroa asked. Because not everyone can make people do things, hon, Chastity said. We're kind of unique because most of us can do that. Some heroes specialize in that, I told Aroa. Mouse Protector was an early one that I think stuck in people's memories. Ruining perfect records, humiliating villains, knocking them down a peg, making their reputation the thing that gets hurt. She was a good one. Dead? Candy asked. I couldn't even see where she was. Disappeared for a good while. Turned out the Slaughterhouse Nine got her. Love Lost has that reputation. She's good, Precipice said. Commands more pay, I'm guessing. Yeah. Are we taking all of this? Free money, Candy said, peering over the pile of cash to look at me. And I finally get to try... Cocaine? Something opiate, Chastity said. The plastic isn't like our plastic either. I get to try opium! I looked at Parian, who shook her head. Don't take the bait, she said. She was using a roll of cloth at her back as an overlarge arm, raising herself up, moving around, and checking cabinets. She was finding a good quantity of stuff that had been stored on top shelves all the way at the back. Taking the cash and taking the drugs was a way of gutting Love Lost's revenue stream. I backed off, pulling up the disc to check the status of the other groups. Bodies in pieces. It still made my heart skip a beat. It was oddly intense as far as distortion went. Why? As the others worked, I held out my arm. The disc mounted on it like a buckler. The projected image of Team Yellow was visible over top, everyone drawn in miniature. I floated back, and the distortion eased up a fraction. I could see where disparate pieces were drawing together into something more coherent between flickers. I tried to find the place where the signal strength was best. The others seemed okay, at least. I heard a beep. Foyle moved Precipice's phone in front of cabinets, trying to figure out where the trap was. Careful, Precipice said. Foyle raised her rapier, then pointed it at the cabinet. She let Precipice take his phone and move it around. When he'd confirmed her target was in the right location, she thrust her sword through. Five spikes punched through the wood of the cabinet, each a foot long. Foyle's sword shimmered slightly as she tugged it free. With a few short swipes up and down, left and right, she demolished the trap. Spikes that were four feet long tumbled to the counter, then the ground. The cabinet was open. There was a miniature filing cabinet inside, partially damaged by the rapier's swipes. While Chastity helped Foyle take it down, Parian took the phone and started sweeping over the fridge. I don't think I'd be comfortable stealing food, I thought. I was even less comfortable with the distortion. Is the distortion in this image not nursery? I asked. I indicated the projected image. I thought it was, Precipice said. I shook my head. I moved the disc around more. This time, my aim was on finding the area with the most distortion. A triangular closet beneath the stairs. Quiet! I hissed. All of the rustling and packing up stopped. There it was. A dull thud. Like the heartbeat of someone catatonic, as large as the house. Precipice raised a hand, touching his ear. I nodded. He heard it too. Didn't realize there was a closet there, Foyle said. Suddenly glad I didn't, because I might have opened it. Is she here? Candy whispered. 
No mist, no rose color, no changes to the environment I could see. Can't be, I said, whispering so I wouldn't disturb what was inside. No, as near as I can figure, the chiming means she's doing her work, setting her power into an area. The dull thuds mean the power's there, active. I backed away from the closet. So long after she's left? Foyle asked. The door was shut. Nothing leaked out, no gas, no fluids. It's sealed tight. The seal is keeping the power inside the containing space, I said. Don't... The fridge door, ajar, opened with enough force that it banged into the wall. What lunged out was far larger than the space that contained it. A tongue, but with elbows segmenting it. A length was covered in transparent skin, and the contents looked like a collection of babies, visible as shadows through a translucent skin. Perrion fended it off with cloth. It grabbed the cloth, then surged, not moving forward, but by growing new segments in a strategic way, it caught her around the face. No! Foyle shrieked. She leaped over the counter, rapier in hand. She was slower than Chastity. Chastity's hand glowed as she slapped the base of the tongue, close to the fridge. Nothing. It doesn't feel anything! Then get back! I flew in, keeping to the ceiling so I didn't get in anyone's way. Perrion was pressed against the wall, her legs kicking, heels skidding against the painted surface. Her cloth and hands found no purchase, pulling away loose tissues like layers of placental sack. Foyle's weapon severed the creature. I caught Perrion, one arm around her body, the other hand seizing her jaw, hard, because there had to be three hundred pounds of mass latched on, and if that fell to the ground in the wrong way, it would have snapped her neck. Either way, the landing was violent enough that a trap in a cabinet we hadn't yet reached snapped to life, punching spikes through a door. My grip shifted to a two-handed grip on Perrion's head, fighting as the nursery beast flopped around violently, like a snake with its head cut off. It maintained its grip, and Perrion's body was arcing under me, fighting violently. I could have thrown up, just being near this, knowing what was happening. The fact I couldn't bring myself to inhale or exhale, or to do anything except strain, was maybe the only thing that kept me from vomiting. Foyle slashed the thing that was flopping around, cutting it in half, meaning I no longer had to worry about one wrong flop snapping Perrion's neck or tearing her head off. I allowed myself to look. What had Foyle been doing? dealing with the stump that had been trying to crawl from the fridge. Rain had that now. The task at hand changed. I made room for Rain as we gathered around Parian. It took two of us to pry it from her face, three to heave it back, to pull out the strings and knots of flesh that filled Parian's nose and mouth. At her ear, a tiny umbilical cord threaded to a calloused, quarter-sized lump of flesh with a nascent leg attached. At her nose, a hand was extended from a nostril, fingers twitching. Perrion's fingers went to her throat, gesturing. I couldn't even see her eyes because her mask had been pulled ajar. I couldn't use a hand to move because I barely had a grip on the fleshy growth as it was. Braided and branching umbilical cords, Perrion gagged as Foyle and I pulled. I can cut it, Foyle said. Don't. What's left inside will set root, I told her. The gagging got worse. Perrion's fingers at her own throat curled into claws, and the efforts to pull were getting harder. There was blood. We were tearing her throat. The grub we pulled out had to be four pounds, proportioned like a baby. The others came easier, a string seemingly endless. The children apparently set to grow to size in turn, to emerge in a steady cycle. Once we had the three largest free, Perrion could breathe again. 
there was a heavy thud outside. Lord of loss. The tiny hand at Perrion's nostril tried to maintain a grip before it was pulled backward inside, down through sinuses to the back of her mouth and out the mouth, one of the last parts to come out. Perrion flopped over so her face was aimed at the ground. Foyle held her, fumbling for a short bit of bandage from her belt that Perrion could hold to her nose. Blood was streaming out. Every breath came with gags. She was breathing, but I could barely bring myself to. We'd better leave, Aroa said, weirdly casual and disconnected. I can carry her, I said. Foyle shook her head. She got in position and, with me giving her a helping hand, lifted up Perrion, holding her in both hands. Around us, the area was filling with the dusky rose gas. Intense now. More than I'd seen it before. She'd sensed us cutting it up. Chastity and precipice hefted bags. Money and drugs. Drop them if they slow us down, I said. Precipice nodded. We hurried to the back door. We stopped as Lord of Loss touched a limb of overlapping white strips down by the surface. Other door. An impact marked him touching down there, too. It was followed by him clawing at the door, pulling it free of the frame. We backed away, past the closet door, toward the center of the house. She's not paying you, you know, I said. Matter of principle for a mercenary not to work for free? He smiled, not giving me a response. Nothing in him faltered or showed any sign he was second-guessing things. There was only resolve, professionalism. His parahuman allies that were standing in the background, from Earth N, they would follow him. Nothing there would hesitate. Nor Nursery, who stood in the background with the other soldiers. She stared at us from behind the holes in her cloth mask, and the music box plinked the most intense tune I'd heard of it, the dusky rose gas filling our neighborhood. Arc 11, Blinding, Chapter 7 Make you a deal, I said. Lord of Loss shook his head, his face a smiling collection of metal strips. It was overlarge, looming as much as the rest of him. We've got a big, big bag of money, I said. We want to buy your services. You'll get more than you will working for Love Lost. You get to keep your hands clean and you can steer clear of the clusterfuck surrounding that group. No, Lord of Loss said. That's not how we operate. You're mercenaries, Chastity said. We are. That's the number one thing about mercenaries. You'll do anything for money. We work for money. Rules are necessary. Being able to switch sides and do the crazy betrayal thing while getting paid for it has got to be the best part of being a mercenary, and you're giving that up? Chastity asked, aghast, the tension of the small army that was lined up against us adding to the extremes and modulation of her voice. All around us the landscape was changing. Snow was melting, heaps of it by the sides of the road that had been cleared for construction toppling and folding into itself. The wind continued to whip around us, and the air that carried that air to us made me aware of how stale it was, with something mixed into it, like an oppressive haze of baby powder or shampoos. We get hired, we do the job, we do it well, rinse, repeat. Lord of Loss intoned the words, his voice low in the way only brutes could manage. We keep up the rules of the game. We don't make enemies we don't have to. 
others in that mob were looking ready to throw themselves at us. Nursery, in particular, looked ready to draw blood. To stall, I decided to try something. I'll make you another deal. Talk with us. Let's make sure we're on the same page. If you still think that this is okay when we're done, then we pick up where we left off, in... No, Lord of Loss said. In exchange, I said, we pay you for your time. We pass you money, hand over fist, to buy you time. Nursery gets more control over her area. We get nothing except your consideration. Not your money to give away, Aroa said under her breath. I'm guessing it's not yours either, Lord of Loss said, talking past me to address Aroa. He chuckled as much as anything as he uttered, No. Did you hear what happened to the navigators? I asked Lord of Loss. To nursery, I said, Are you aware they're putting kids in the line of fire? If we talk, it's going to be after we've captured you, Lord of Loss said. He shifted position, which prompted me to look back. Past the ground floor of the house, past kitchen, living room, and back stairwell, I could see the rear door, and I could see his bodily mass planted down there. Whatever form he wore, it was extended enough that he could cover two exits at once, and his oversized head was mobile, free to move where he needed it. Foyle, quiet up until this point, started shooting the crossbow, launching her augmented bolts. I'd known her as Flechette back in the days when I'd thought my boyfriend, Eric, and Uncle Neil dying at the hands of an unstoppable giant lizard was the worst life was going to get. Back then, she had something elegant. Now, she had something big. The skewers were about as long as my arm was from elbow to fingertip, tapered at both sides. They punched through Lord of Loss's digits, where a hand or clawed foot had just touched ground to give him leverage. He didn't react to the pain. He did try to lift his hand up, only to jerk to a halt. Our cue to go. I covered the rear flank as the others charged for the door. The headless spider with the crossbow strapped to its body was Foyle's mount. Parian slumped between Foyle and the crossbow, leaning hard into Foyle. She was at least managing the spider, despite her condition. Cut through the buildings, I told them. Lord of Loss never seems to go indoors at any point. I heard crumbling and looked back. Through the narrow aperture of the front door, I could see Lord raising an oversized clawed extremity, shedding debris. He hadn't managed to unimpale himself or pull the needles from the stones, but he had managed to pull up the pavement. Someone ducked underneath the hand, skidding on the ground. A cape, dressed in an all-covering orange bodysuit, who ran fast enough that they clipped the edge of the doorframe in their crazed run. I raised my force field as I saw them fix their attention on me. I could fly backward without worrying too much about bumping into anything, so I kept the majority of my focus on them. I saw them glance to one side. They aimed to go around me. Half right, they leaped, power activating, to throw themselves at the wall. They collided in a shower of orange and amber lights and sparks and rebounded, no longer human, a swirling mass of energy. The impact when he hit the wretch was violent, the impact carrying through the air to scatter papers, money we hadn't grabbed, and the washed and dried silverware that had been laid at the edge of the kitchen's counter. He recovered, momentum lost, clearly startled that what he'd planned hadn't worked. Reminded me of Mom, just bigger and spikier, aggressive instead of defensive. My focus was on him, so I didn't get to see what was happening at the exit here. Precipice was stepping in at the least. I stared down my opponent. They were dressed like a hero from one of the old Japanese super teams, covered head to toe, hard helmet with full face coverage, a bodysuit with stretchy material with light decoration. They did have some padding, though. Elbow and knee pads. Need help, Antares? Candy interrupted my observations. Save your juice, 
I said. Elbow and knee pads and some chest protection that made it ambiguous if they were flat or if they had pronounced pecs. Whatever the case, armor could indicate vulnerability, either to bait, as was my case, or by accident. Theirs was too light, too built for things other than deflecting bullets or stopping knives. They acted again. Again, a sharp, high-speed lunge, not aimed at me or at the others, but at a wall. Again, the impact, sparks and light. Post-impact, as they rebounded off, they'd become a large, whirling death ball formed of hard energy. A stray arm of the wretch blocked the way, deflecting them. They landed hard, sliding on the floor and bumping into a table. They wasted no time in using their power again, holding to the pattern, but glancing off to the ceiling instead. Blocking it meant flying back to get myself thoroughly in the way, putting me perilously close to the heartbroken. They were an air hockey puck, not well suited for the direct strike, always bouncing off of something sufficiently hard and flat. I was ten invisible people superimposed over one another, each wildly swinging sledgehammers around. The thought, as casual as it was, threw me off. The natural hazard. It had made taking care of me at the asylum that much harder, and I hadn't made it easier. I drew in a deep breath, throwing myself to one side to intercept again. The pit of despair was there, waiting for me to get too close before I had that stomach-sinking feeling that anyone felt if standing on a ledge, provided they were unable to fly. It was easier to deal with and wholly recontextualized now that I didn't feel like someone was lurking nearby, ready to give me a shove or hem me in but easier was different from easy. The others hadn't slipped through. "'What's the hold-up?' I called back. "'Spiders too big for the door. Moving over to Snake, dealing with the big guy.' I would have provided some assistance, but I couldn't take my attention off of the air hockey puck. The puck leaped forward, but dropped like they were tripping over their own feet, The goal, though, was to make as straight a shot as he was capable of, lunging while close to the ground, striking the floor at a shallow angle and then going directly for our team. I'd kind of expected it, though. My mom had done that a few times in sparring, trying to roll between my feet. Pads meant vulnerability. The hard bit of plastic or metal at the wrist was meant to help him when post-power, skidding to a stop. I blocked the impact, mindful that I wasn't too close to the heartbroken, then followed up, chasing. They weren't fully recovered when I crashed into them. I wrapped my arm around them, gathering them up into a full Nelson. They stomped the ground, propelling us both into a lunge straight for the ceiling. I used my flight to reorient us in the air, denying them the follow-up contact. Then I used my aura, my chest pressed hard against their back, the feeling emanating from me and into them point-blank. I wanted to break them, to make their efforts less strategic and more flailing. I could feel it in how they jerked and kicked now. They grazed furniture with a kicking toe, and again we were propelled away, hard. I twisted us in the air so it was my back that slid across the ceiling. The paint and the ceiling's surface cracked badly with the contact, and something on the other side pushed back. It was meaty, broader across than my back was, and it slurped. I didn't break through that thin layer of ceiling, and neither did the thing on the other side. Not until my enemy reached up to hit it. Paint broke, cracks spread out, and we were boosted away from it, the boost, no doubt, being the original intent. I was glad it wasn't a death ball boost, at least. Their power had two components. The dash, the boost, the kickoff, where they moved four or five times as fast. If they could bounce off of a solid surface as they did it, then they went full death ball, becoming a whirring sphere as tall as I was. 
My goal in the now was to pump them full of emotion without saturating my own team, and to keep them from achieving their move. I kept us away from the spreading break in the ceiling, with red membrane-covered flesh pressing down against the hole, too wide to penetrate. Bring him here, Chastity called out. Him, then. I'd assume the girl from the villain family who worked with villains knew who the villainous mercenary was. Bringing him closer to the ground came with a danger, though. If he touched the ground, he could kick off of it. I tangled my legs with his, moving us in the air so those tangled feet weren't anywhere near the floor. Chastity stalked closer. She raised her right hand up over her left shoulder as she advanced, and it glowed nebulously with a dark blue energy. She had to make a small hop to give herself the height to make contact, a backhand swing that caught the air hockey puck across the face of the helmet. He was torn from my arms, slapped down against the ground. He didn't bounce or rebound. The floor cracked beneath him, far more fragile than it should have been. My foe groaned as he slumped down to the ground, hands going to his helmet so he could hold his head up. The sound he made was a long groan like every single involuntary utterance I'd made while cringing about middle school me, except with the duration and volume dialed to the maximum. Chastity raised her hand up near her face, covering the smile she wore. One of her fingernails was glowing, and a ring at one of her other fingers was catching that light in a way more intense than normal. Bitch slap delivered. Not the reaction I expected, I said, as I floated away from the air hockey puck. Distilled defeat, you said? It looks different for everyone, but everyone reaches a point where their body can't take any more and shuts down whatever the mind thinks it wants. I hurry things along, she said. She gave the ceiling a dubious look. Let's get outside. Outside has to be better. I nodded. "'You're going to need to protect me,' she said, waggling her hand in my general direction, the glowing fingernail in focus. Then, like she was just now remembering, "'And I'm going to need to protect Precipice.' She hurried back toward Precipice with a kind of urgency. The bitch-slap target was ignored, assuming out of commission." She had a body sense, too, which apparently mapped out to anyone she'd used her power on, while also helping her aim her attacks by keeping her aware of where her potential slap targets were. Her bitch slap was a dangerous weapon, but a fragile one. One shot, and if the target wasn't immune or resistant to emotion powers, then they were out of the fight. If she was more confident or powerful in her target's eyes, It hit harder and lasted longer. The fragility, though, was that the second she was taken down a peg, the effects all broke. Everyone she'd slapped down was back in play, and she ate some of the backlash. It wouldn't be too bad so long as she only had one foe she'd slapped down. The others were outside, with only Candy at the door, watching and waiting for her sister's return. I flew outside and up to a point where I still had the house to my back, but I could see over the others' heads. We were surrounded, but they were managing. Perrion had threads going out in every direction, hampering the potential attackers. Lord of Loss was having to pull a clawed extremity from the side of the house where it had been nailed down, and it looked like he was reconfiguring into a form... Three giant heads and multiple arms were drawing back into a central mass. I wasted juice, Candy was telling Chastity. Lord of Loss doesn't feel it. I could have told you that, I thought. That was a shame. Nursery. If you can hit nursery, do it. Just nothing permanent. Candy looked up at me, then nodded. As horrifying as that woman is, I thought. Foil was still assisting Parian, who was hunched over atop the spider. Her being there made using the large crossbow difficult, but Foil did her best. The heartbroken hurried toward Parian and Foil. 
Aroa got tangled in threads that Perrion was manipulating, and Perrion had to devote attention to maneuvering the spider, rotating it so she could see Aroa, then disentangling her. With the damage to her throat, it was apparently easier to use cosmic power to telekinetically fill a spider made of fabric, then manipulate that spider to turn around, than it was to twist herself around. Lord of Loss reached out with a clawed extremity, spikes still embedded in it. Closer to his main body, that limb was unfurling, but there was still enough anchoring for it to move and manipulate things. The claw reached, and I flew to put myself between the others and the hand. I'd block and fend it off. The length of the arm hid a lance within it. It passed through a gap in the palm of the claw, thrusting toward me and toward the others. I used the wretch to grab it, but the banding of white stone-like or metal-like strips ran along the length from tip to base, twisting it to give it a kind of rifling, not something I or the wretch could get a hold on. Instead, while it skidded past me, scraping by the wretch and numerous invisible, super-strong hands— I pushed it off course. The lance dissolved. I had to maneuver to keep the strips from catching or slicing at me as they withdrew. I couldn't get in close, because that put me in reach of another three claws. Five claws if I was considering the dissolving ones. He'd been a mass of large faces, thin arms, and large claws. Everything about reach and perception. Or... I was assuming the extra faces were for perception. It was possible it was the equivalent of a man in the jungle wearing a mask on the back of his head to confuse the tigers that wanted to pounce on him from behind. He'd improved over the last little while. I could remember him being limited to forms. He'd spent time with Marquis, hadn't he? And Marquis was a top-tier changer with inventive by-the-moment adaptations. Lord of Loss seemed intent on taking a few lessons from that playbook. I kept a wary eye out. This was brute against brute, standard playbook, unfortunately. I raised my voice. They tore people to pieces and those pieces are still alive. They took pieces so those people can't even be put back together. You pulverized Valefor's jaw, Lord of Loss said. If you don't see the distinction between Vale Four and a plucky band of heroes who made it their life's mission to stop human trafficking, then something's really fucking wrong with you, Lord of Loss. I think there are lines, Lord of Loss said, as he dissolved into more narrow lengths, two claws with morasses of white strips joining them to his main body gripped the house to hold him aloft. Between Valefor and those heroes, yes. But playing fair and destroying others? That's a clear line, too. He's a monster, Loss. And if that's what you think, why the fuck are you helping people who butchered heroes? They crossed your line. My line gets drawn when I'm hired, he said. I can't quit a job part way through. I'll consider things after. The damage is being done now. They'll use that weapon or power again. You think, he said. I grit my teeth. I saw the silver blades appear, Precipice's power slicing through the air to cut at the thickest portion of Lord of Loss's supports. I flew, maximum speed, to capitalize on it before the opportunity was lost. Precipice had to have decided to do it to capitalize on Lord of Loss being distracted with conversation. Lengths of Lord of Loss's mummy wrapped in iron bandages form extended out, encasing the parts that had been marked out with silver lines. External support. A clawed extremity reached my way. I slammed into the palm, hoping to throw him off enough that the silver would snap and the limbs would give way. No effect. He didn't topple. Clawed digits of a hand larger than I was closed in around me. I spun, 
relying on the spinning force combined with the reach of the wretch to ensure I had enough of a gap to get out. He laughed. The music box tune was plinking all around us, and as Precipice and the Heartbroken hurried to stay in rough formation with the spider, I could see tracks of footprints where the snow had been pressed down, and the thin red of bodily fluids was leaching up into the compacted snow through the slats in the road-turned flooring. Crimson footprints in white snow. Snowbanks were moving, not just because they were crumpling to become misty building interior, but because they acted as suitable containers and Nursery's power worked by filling up containers. That included filling up living, people containers, throats, sinuses, ear canals. Chastity had her whip out and was using it to repel soldiers. The cracks were audible and distracting as she cleared a path for the spider to move forward. The soldiers that weren't powered were dealing with being tugged and limited in their movements by a thousand fine pieces of thread. The ones that were powered were the focus of Foil's crossbow and darts. One shot aimed at a man wearing armor bands that hugged his muscular physique, with each band connected to the next with short chains. The bolt passed through armor by the penetrate-anything effect, grazed the skin, then came back into reality through the use of foil's enhanced timing. The bolt was effectively fused to the armor it had been passing through, it retained its momentum, and it threw the man off balance. His hand touched the road, and another bolt passed through armor to secure the armor of the forearm and the armor of the gauntlet to the floorboards below. Lord of Loss shifted position on his perch. He was making himself into the heavy-hitting centaur form, but for now the four legs and one arm were spindly, drawn over long, to the point it didn't look like he could support himself. The arm that wasn't formed was expanding into a shield to protect him. At the top of his head, strips were hardening into a position where they formed a crown of braided antlers. Where one spindle leg punched through the roof, I could see the red mist rising. Meaty squelches and growths reached up and wound around his leg, only to break away as he shifted his footing. Umbilical cord growths reached out, groping for potential targets. I considered striking at someone else while Lord of Loss was finishing. How long did I have? Ten seconds? Twenty? How much time to get to another point on the battlefield, eliminate the biggest problem, and still be here if I was needed to protect the others? He might have read my mind, because he proved why I couldn't just leave him to his own devices. He reached out with a hand, as if to point. Again, the lance emerged from within, stabbing out, rotating as it emerged this time. A hundred feet long, and the tapering point closest to me was still thick enough I could have wrapped my arms around it, if I didn't have the wretch to do it for me. Again, to much less effect than the last time, I deflected the point. With the wretch doing the heavy lifting, I was free to look back, seeing what he was aiming for. The cloth snake flanked our group and kept a good five or six of Lord of Loss's soldiers from approaching. It was winding through and among cars. If I were him, I would have speared the snake and flicked the cars to put them in the other's way. For now, I could keep it from being accurate. It struck ground close to the snake, then swiped to one side. Cloth tangled around the lance's point and the snake tore, losing a quarter of its total length. The thing started to deflate, and then the tail section twisted itself together, tight enough to offer a seal. In the movies or comics, sparks would have flown as the wretch fought the rotation and force of the lance. Here, it was only movements of cold air, some collected ice and snow shedding and falling as a deceptively gentle rain to the street below. He drew back, his entire body pulling away to help bring his lance far enough away that I wasn't embracing its length anymore. He laughed. 
my expression behind my mask could have been stone. I couldn't stop it. The next one would strike home. Every time he repeated himself, he was more forceful, more consistent. Fuck, fuck, fuck. That he was being such a gloating asshole about it made me feel worse. Options, what are my options? If I couldn't deflect, catch, or otherwise influence the hit, predict the target and move them, or something else. Just thinking about my options helped matters, my confidence surging back, and in the wake of that, I was aware that my emotions were jumping all over the place. Precipice. Fucking rain. He'd hit me with his power after being explicitly asked not to. Why? To signal. There was no visual indicator he was using his power. He wanted me to act, and I had an idea what he wanted me to do. I flew at Lord of Loss, another hit, like the one I'd delivered before, only the silver blades weren't in place. Even if this didn't work, it might delay the next telescoping lance from coming out. I slammed into Lord of Loss, and this time there was an effect. Far below, two forelegs of his centaur form were breaking. I was slower than the thrown silver blades, so Precipice had signaled me, then timed the throws to connect just before I did. Lord of Loss lurched forward, his forward tilt and the falling legs damaging the house as they toppled. His shield came forward, the end slamming into the ground, which allowed him to avoid a faceplant. Already his legs were reforming. Silver blades hit the shield, and I hit Lord of Loss. The shield broke, and the broken end skidded on the ground. Where it skidded, floorboards broke and shattered and masses beneath the floorboards began to move, disturbing them further. It was taking two of us just to keep an endbringer-sized breaker from getting fully put together and building up his momentum. Our team wasn't getting away because forward progress was a slog, hampered by nursery's power and the soldiers that had to be dealt with one by one. My ears rang in the wake of a blast somewhere down on the battlefield. It was one of three shots, lasers that hurt to listen to. The cape was one of Lord of Loss's underlings, it seemed, and they were slinging blasts like nobody's business. A flaming lob high overhead that forced our guys to scatter, then a volley of green and black spheres that cracked like eggs and leaked out acid. Foyle turned the spider-mounted crossbow around to fire, and the blaster threw something to their feet. Crystal encased them, freezing them immobile within for less than a second. It was less than a second because Foyle's shot hit the crystal and both the bolt and the crystal shattered. The cape was free to fire off some more artillery-like lobs. Foyle was running out of ammunition. Lord of Loss advanced, two of his legs unsteady, forcing him to use the end of the lance or the shield to support his weight. I circled over his head like a vulture, ready to act, and he was keeping an eye out for me. The lance moved, swiping out. The movement of the lance produced a shock wave that threw my flying off course. Have to be careful, I told myself. Can't... can't repeat the crawler situation... With the force that Lance was swinging around with, a good hit could destroy the wretch and produce a residual flurry of wind that would slam me into a hard surface. Mood, I thought. Self-doubt and regret was precipice, another signal. I took the signal for what it was and engaged Lord of Loss. Again the Lance swiped past me. The aftermath was worse than it had been, pulling me into the eddy of air that followed after the lance. I closed the distance, and I landed a solid blow. Lord of Loss began to crumble. One, two punches. I wasn't even sure it was possible to take Lord of Loss out of commission, but if we could slow him down enough... The crumbling continued. Did we kill him? 
With each piece that hit the ground, more of the floor broke, where the floor was just something interdimensional, a landscape rewrite that produced floorboards about as durable as popsicle sticks, with a whole lot of fertile meat things beneath that surface. He emerged, a phoenix from its egg. Bird form, built like a hawk, but with elaborate extensive wings, and streamers of metal strips that were more rigid than not with sharp edges. Each pump of the wings was slow, barely matching the downward pull of gravity. Each pump was stronger than the last. He turned human, shedding his breaker exterior, then went breaker again. I flew to intercept, while it was still largely immobile. He didn't try to dodge, and he didn't fight me. With the wretch active, I punched in, and I broke through the exterior. I saw Lord of Loss himself. A figure, not that tall for someone who made such chronically large breaker forms. He wasn't human, but existed instead as a nimbus of glowing strips that formed a vaguely human silhouette where they intersected most and were brightest. Where they pulled away, they became solid. The loose strips and broken ends began to close in around me, like I was now standing in the midst of a giant's open mouth, fangs on either side of me, fingers curling in to keep me from escaping. It was still flying, if lopsided, but that wasn't my immediate concern. I had to pull away. He got to keep flying. Aroa and Chastity were dealing with the blaster of infinite variety. Aroa's power was a blast of her own, but not the kind that was easily dodged. It was as instantaneous as lightning, and it left after images more than actual images, and those after images curled instead of zigzagging, peeled off instead of forking. She wasn't one of the strongest heartbroken, based on what I'd been told, not in this kind of situation, not with relatively short range. Her power stung people, whole body, and it adjusted the pain response to make them like pain, whether it was from her or another source. In another circumstance, I imagined she could be like Regent, insidious and very dangerous. Here, it was a way to distract, unnerve, and even condition an unwary foe to not want to get out of the way of danger. Lord of Loss's bird form took evasive action to avoid Precipice's power. One good hit could buy me the chance to get in and take him down, since he would be unable to flap his wings, but he wasn't inclined to allow that. As I closed on him, I saw his head turn, noting me. He veered to one side, crashing through the skeleton of a building that was only beams and girders dusted with snow and covered in sheets of ice. As pieces toppled, I was forced to back off. We were getting bogged down. The blaster had been doing something strategic in lobbing that fire and spreading that acid. The ground had been broken, and one mass had sprouted, less of a tongue and more like a woman stretched out to ten feet in length, hairless and skinny and wrapped in a layered straitjacket of her own flesh and translucent, veiny flesh. Her toothless mouth yawned open as she jerked one way and the other, her attention on candy. Escape routes were lost to mist and nursery's power. The enemy's soldiers that were still in the fight were putting up a good fight. One had a foil bolt through the barrel of his gun, but he was holding the gun by the barrel with the bolt used as a spear. I changed direction, swooping in to go after the problem elements. Broken legs would have to do. As I veered off, so did Lord of Loss. One could have seen it as us flying in formation, but it was the opposite. I made a sharp right turn, Lord of Loss made a sharp left. I knew what he'd do. There were only so many destinations for him. I was faster, but he could hit harder and bigger. He'd flown through the construction sites that littered Love Lost's neighborhood. I did the same. Come on, wretch, don't fuck with me. If you go from grabbing shit to refusing to grab anything here, I'm going to be pissed.
The first attempt failed as I skimmed past a stack of what looked like solar glass panels rigged up with chains so the crane could lift them up. The wretch didn't touch any of it. On the second attempt, I veered too close to the mist. The tarp I grabbed with both my real hands and the wretch broke away. Nursery's power had turned some of it to curtain or some shit like that, and the connection between the two halves wasn't strong. I could see something writhing beneath the curtain that fell aside now that the tarp was no longer attached. My teeth grit. I circled around. The others were winning their fights but losing the war. Candy wasn't using her power. Aroa wasn't a game-changer. Chastity had a tightrope to walk, and Foyle was doing a damn good job considering she was preoccupied with the injured Parian, but she was still running out of ammunition. And then there was precipice. Rain. I looked at him, and he turned from looking at Lord of Loss, who was tracing a loose U-turn, to look up at me. To be sure he could see me, I used my arm to point at the nearby crane. He fired, striking at the neck of the crane itself. Again, still flying toward my target, I indicated. Come on, I thought. Get this right, and please... Don't let the wind jar the crane and make the neck split, because that's not what I need. The silver blade cut into the cable this time. I flew into the hook, grabbing it, activated my strength, and tore it free. Multiple cables thinner than my wrist trailed behind me. Lord of Loss was diving. He skimmed damaged buildings on his way down, and the ones touched by nursery's power broke apart. More holes in the ground, more meat rising up. But he was drawing nearer and nearer to the ground now. He wasn't going to crush anyone in the group, slamming into them with a bird form the size of a large truck. He was going to destroy the landscape and let nursery's things out. A loop in the air let me catch the midpoint of the cabling. From there, it was a question of catching up. I'd turned right hit the construction site, and was now charging in. Lord of Loss was bigger, more ungainly, but powerful, and he'd needed more time and room to turn around. Now we were roughly the same distance from the group, both flying in like jousting knights, and my teammate and allies were hunkered down near the point where Lord of Loss and I were likely to clash. Perion was knitting her snake and spider together, forming something else, Chastity and Aroa fended off the soldiers nearby with whip-cracks and blasts. Precipice hit Lord of Loss across the wing, and Lord of Loss froze. He glided, not flapping, not moving, and continued his steady, inexorable descent. With his course being what it was, he would hit the edge of the road and slide alongside the group, carving out a trench. That trench would mean no escape. Precipice's silver line wore off. Fresh silver blades hit, one at the head, another at the body. By virtue of being faster, I passed over the group, veering to one side so I didn't brain or slash any of them with the trailing ends of the cabling, and flew straight at Lord of Loss. The giant bird made of calcified metal strips laughed, a booming sound, like he was having fucking fun. I crashed into him, the loops and cabling catching him at the neck, but he wasn't rigid. I tried to steer his whole body up, but he angled his wings to force the dive. Futile. Leaving the loops where they were, I grabbed the hook. I had a split second to decide what to do with it, and there wasn't a building or landscape feature in reach that I could latch onto. Given scale and momentum, I doubted it would have mattered. Instead, using my strength, I impaled the one wing and hauled on it. He fought me, and it was an arm-wrestling contest, with the distinction that neither of us were using our own strength. I almost faltered, feeling the doubt creep in, knowing that a particularly violent crash with steel cabling whipping around everywhere would be worse. Then the feeling disappeared. 
It wasn't enough to steer Lord of Loss far enough away to matter. But Perian had her combined animal, almost shaped like a hand planted on the ground with the arm extending up and out, akin to a spear planted in the ground to stop a charging horse. Lord of Loss rammed into it, and the vibration that ran through him rattled my brain, shaking my senses to the point that I momentarily lost touch with everything. We spiraled out, and a combination of jarring impact and cable looped around my arm kept me from flying up and away from the crash site. I lay where I was, cold and hurting from head to toe, a steel cable draped behind me and too uncomfortably beneath me, and I thought about how I'd need to kick Precipice's ass after this. I knew he was trying to make Lord of Loss hesitate, that I'd caught only the edge of the effect, but he needed to put one and one together. If the Heartbroken's power wouldn't work, why would his? Lord of Loss was pulling himself together. I was just about as fast as he was, which wasn't fast at all. A silver blade hit Lord of Loss in one wing. He'd been leaning on it for support and balance, and it broke with the pressure. I backed up, skirting the hole that Perian's stuffed spider snake had made as the impact had driven it into the ground. Mass was rising up, but it was enough competing parts that they were getting jammed up in the hole. How's Perian? I asked. Not good. We've been trying to get out, stick to shaker protocols. Don't fight them on their turf, I said but she covers so much ground with that power. I nodded, my jaw set. Fuck, I heard all over. There weren't any good escape routes on foot, and I didn't trust carrying a whole team by air. It was one thing if I carried Kenzie's projection cube with straps, another thing if it was a team of people, some injured. Aroa had a bloody nose, but her eyes glittered. Chastity had three glowing fingernails. Candy... I still have a shot. I'm saving it for nursery, right? I nodded. Might not end the effect. You could let us be taken prisoner, Foyle said. Fly away. Get help. I shook my head. Keep it in mind as a last resort. Last we saw, nursery was pissed. If I leave you, you all get the nursery treatment. Chastity's voice was low, dangerous. I told myself I'd never have a baby. I've changed too many diapers, given too many baths, fed smelly food to smellier cousins and whatever. I'd sooner die. Let's not let it come to that, I said. And while we're assessing what to do and what not to do, precipice. Sorry, he said. Panic. If it was a gun or a toy, I'd take it away from you, I said. It almost fucked me up when I tried to lasso him. Sorry, he said. The bulge where the stuffed idol had been driven into the floorboards was opening up now. The bits of flesh that had been competing for space at the edge of the hole were now rising tall. One reached out to start pumping seeds into the ear of one of Lord of Loss's soldiers. Another started trying to feed on the stuffed animal. Futile. The stuffed creation fought and smashed until it was pulled down. Others were creeping out, trying to seize on fallen soldiers. Altogether, they stopped, leaving those soldiers alone. She's here, I said. They'll be controlled instead of acting animal. She's there, Aroa said. She grabbed Candy by the shoulders, spinning her around. Candy blew a kiss. I couldn't see a result, aside from a stagger on the distant nursery's part where she stood by a building, but I felt a general change in the movements of nursery's creations. Some started groping for unconscious and injured soldiers again. Two out of ten, Aroa said. I don't trust your reviews, Candy said. If you want to pose while using your ability, you have to do way better than that. You'd lie just to make me feel bad because you get your... Focus, Chastity said. Okay, but I'm out of power, just so you know. I hit her with a quarter tank of happiness oversaturation. 
The battlefield was nurseries, even if she wasn't in control. She was keeping one hand on her head and looking around in alarm, but she was still creating mist. Any hard impacts broke the ground and released monsters. Lord of Loss, immune to those monsters, was stomping around, tearing everything up. Some of his soldiers were still there at the edges. I had to digest the flow of events, scouring my brain to think of how we were supposed to get out of this. I surveyed the battlefield where Lord of Loss was near the center, standing tall again, not any worse for wear. The ground was room temperature with stale air, the air above cold, and the two combined to make something that was the worst of both worlds, reeking of blood and bile. Tentacles, tongues, and skin straitjacket women were standing out from the ruined landscape. Others were moving beneath the cracked floorboards to the point that those floorboards bulged or oozed with meat the stuffed animal that was losing its fight against the meat. I think I get how your power is really supposed to work, I said. Mine? Rain asked. Who else? I asked. Listen carefully, because whether I'm right or wrong, this is going to suck. <laughs>